This is audiobook. Our Violent Ends, Part 2. By Chloe Gong. Narrated by Aria. This recording is a production of the Booktube copyright 2021 Booktube. Roma decided to sit too. He shuffled beside his sister like they were awaiting a bedtime story, not hiding out in an alley stained with blood. Well, two generations ago, her grandfather killed ours. Elisa wasn't buying it. Leave the blood feud out of this. You were collaborating with her, and then suddenly you're not. I've heard the rumors, the ones that seem logical and the ones that are so preposterous to be laughable. What is the truth? Roma pushed his hair out of his eyes. His pulse was still raging, his palms slightly damp. It is, it's complicated. Nothing in this world is complicated, only misunderstood. Roma peered at Elisa, his nose scrunching. Elisa scrunched the exact same button nose back, and the siblings suddenly seemed like mirror images of the other. You are entirely too wise for your young age. You are nineteen. It is not far by much. Elisa tapped her knee. Does Papa know? It was his idea, Roma muttered. Seeing that he could not keep his sister in the dark anymore, he started at the beginning, from the moment Lord Montagov called him into his office to discuss the plan and then the snide, knowing glance Roma had caught from Dmitri in the living room. The last of it was in Zhou Zhuang, he finished. Then the Scarlets blew up our safe house, and I figured the alliance was called off. Elisa was staring at the wall of the alley, clearly mulling through the events. The gears in her head were turning, her frown deepening. She wouldn't be able to make sense of anything. It was a waste of energy to try. I almost wanted to stay. Elisa's frown disappeared quickly, surprised by his sudden pivot. In Zhou Zhuang? She snorted. It's so quiet. We need a little quiet. This city is always so loud. Roma tipped his head up, staring at the flurrying clouds. The desire to run had been pulling at the edge of his mind for years, a constant whisper surrounding the idea of escape. He remembered one late night leaning on his windowsill, his cheek still smarting from Lord Montagov's discipline, wishing he could pick himself up and fade into a life somewhere outside these city boundaries. He wanted air that didn't smell like factory smoke. He wanted to sit under the cover of a large tree, lean upon the trunk and see nothing but green for miles. Mostly, that night in 1923, he wanted Juliet back, and he wanted to take her and run, far from the clutches of their families. Only he also knew exactly what that meant, leaving the white flowers without an air, carving open a space that any hateful soul could fill. It is loud because you listen, Elisa said. It is loud because everybody's always talking at me. Roma sighed, pressing the heel of his bloody palm into his eyes. Constant demands from the white flowers. Constant demands from his father. Constant demands from the city itself. I entertain that it must be nicer to live simply instead. To catch fish and sell it on the fresh market every day for livable wages, instead of trading mounds of opium for amounts of cash we'll never need. Elisa thought on it. She pulled her legs up to her chest and leaned her arms on her knees. I think, she said, that is something you say because we have been rich all our lives. Roma smiled tightly. Indeed. They had never been born for a simple life, and so they did not deserve it either. It had taken generations to climb to where they were now, and who was Roma to throw it away? All the same, that part of him never seemed to go away. The part that wanted to run, the part that wanted a different life. If only he could erase every memory of his earlier years, maybe he could erase these thoughts too, but he would always remember lying in a park with Juliet, fifteen and carefree, his head in her lap and her lips pressing a soft kiss to his cheek, the grass under his fingers and the birds fluttering in song on the branches above him. He would always remember that little nook where nothing could disturb them, a world of their own, and thinking this, this is the only complete happiness I have ever felt. It was that part of him he could never kill, and when Juliet was stitched into those memories like a finished hem, how could he ever kill her? A sound came from the other end of the alley then, a pebble skittering across the pavement. 
Seconds later Benedict came into view, frowning at the sight of his two cousins on the ground. What are you doing? We need to go. Roma got to his feet without argument, nudging the first aid box out of sight and reaching a hand out to Elisa. Come on. He ruffled her blonde hair as she stood, the two of them trailing after Benedict as they made their way home. It wasn't until they were trekking back into white flower territory and Elisa started dragging her feet upon the gravel that Roma suddenly blinked, his eyes coming to the back of Benedict's head. He hadn't thought much about how his cousin had found them. But now, as Benedict chided Elisa to walk properly and stop ruining her shoes, he realized that he had heard no footsteps before Benedict's approach. So how long had Benedict been lingering outside the alley, listening to their conversation? 24. In a factory in the east of the city, on a dreary Thursday afternoon, the machines go quiet at once. The foreman lifts his head from his desk, dazed and sleep-fogged, a thin trail of drool smeared across his chin. He wipes at his face and looks around, finding no workers before him, only their crowded tables and their materials laid out in a mess, strewn onto the floor. What is this? he mutters under his breath. Their deadline is tight. Don't the workers know? If they cannot deliver their materials within the week, the big bosses at the top will be angry. Oh, but the workers care not about such matters. The foreman turns around, and with a start, finds them standing behind him, armed and at the ready. One slash, that's all it takes. A knife over his throat, and he's twitching on the floor, hands clasped around the wound in a futile attempt at holding the blood in. The red seeps regardless. It does not stop until he is not but a body lying in a scarlet pool. It soaks the shoes of his workers, his killers. It is carried from street to street, the faintest red print pressed upon crumbling pavement and into the roads of the concessions, marring stains upon the clean white sidewalks. This is what revolution is, after all. The trailing of blood from door to door, loud and violent until the rich cannot look away. But the revolution is not quite there, not yet. The people are trying again, but they are still scared after the last uprising was quashed, and no matter how loud they rage, their numbers are small. They cannot be heard in Chenghuangmyo, where two girls sit at a tea house and plan a heist, sketching charcoal upon paper while the cold breeze blows through the window. There is a momentary shout, and the one in the glittery western dress stiffens, leaning out the tea house body half dangling out the second floor in search of trouble. Relax, the other says, brushing a crumb off her chipao. I heard the police stop the riots before they got very far. Focus on finishing your outrageous plan for stealing our own vaccine. A sigh. Have they stopped the riots? It looks as if another is starting here. The air of the scarlet gang tips her chin toward the scene outside, where a small group is holding signs, calling for unions, for the ousting of gangsters and imperialists. They make their plea, speaking as though it is a matter of connection, of garnering enough sympathy until the tide turns the other way. But the city does not know their names. The city does not care. A group of white flowers comes along then, an ordinary bunch, nothing more than muscle and eyes for the gang, keepers of the territory. The shoppers nearby hurry away, certain that they should not witness this, and they are correct. A thick cloud blows over the sun. The lapping pond water underneath the Juku Bridge darkens by a shade. The white flowers peruse the scene, whisper among themselves, and then, quick as only a practiced maneuver can achieve, they raise their weapons and shoot half the group dead. Up in the tea house, the girls flinch, but there is nothing to do. The remaining protesters scatter, only police officers are already waiting, ordered in by the white flowers. The surviving rioters kick and hiss and spit, but what good will it do? For now, all their fury can do is burn holes in their chests. I used to think this city I am to inherit was descending into one ruled by hatred, the girl says into the cold wind. I used to think that it was our doing, that the blood feud ruined all that was good. She looks at her cousin but it has been hateful for a long time. Hatred has been lurking in the waters before the first bullet was fired from scarlet to white flower, 
it's been there since the British brought opium into the city and took what wasn't theirs, since the foreigners stomped in and the city split into factions, divided by rights and wrongs that foreign law put into being. These things do not fade away with time. They can only grow and fester and ooze like a slow, slow cancer. And any day now, the city will turn inside out, corrupted by the poison in its own seams. It was concerning how many messengers Benedict had paid in the last hour, but Marshall tried not to jump to any conclusions. He was already having a hard time finding a good hiding spot, staying far enough that Benedict would not feel watched but close enough to pick out what was going on. Are you planning a takeover? Marshall muttered. What could you possibly need this many white flowers for? As if hearing him, Benedict looked up suddenly, and Marshall ducked fast, pressing along the roof wall. They were near headquarters, in the busier part of the city, where the street corners were loud and the alleys were crisscrossed with hundreds of bamboo poles hanging laundry to the wind. Even if Benedict thought he caught movement from afar, Marshall was confident that his best friend would merely think it to be a trick of the eye, triggered by a large frock waving with the breeze. Marshall had grown so pale from being indoors all the time that he probably resembled a white frock. That's all, then, he heard Benedict say, waving the messenger off. If it weren't some task Benedict was having the messenger do, then Marshall imagined the only other possibility was collecting information. When Marshall poked his head out farther, trying to get a better look, Benedict turned just right, giving Marshall a glimpse of the red ribbon in his hands. Marshall scratched his head. Don't tell me you went and got a lover, he grumbled. I've only been dead for five months and you're already buying women presents? Then Benedict brought out a lighter and started to burn the ribbon. Marshall's eyes bugged. Oh. Oh, never mind. His confusion only grew as Benedict dropped the ribbon and let it burn, leaving the alley for the direction of home. Marshall didn't follow, that would be too risky, but he did sit there for a while longer, watching the last of the ribbon turn to ash his brow furrowed. The answer for what was going on with Benedict didn't seem to be emerging any time soon, so he dusted himself off and climbed down the roof, making his way back to the safe house. He had plenty to help his disguise, a coat, a hat, even a covering over his face, feigning sickness. Marshall had almost reached the building when a host of shouting echoed from the end of the street, and his head jerked up, searching for the sound. It was the very edges of a protest, and he would have thought little of it if it weren't for the group of nationalist soldiers who were running in from the other road, coming upon the workers with their batons ready. Quickly Marshall turned away, but one of the soldiers had made eye contact with him, trying to gauge if he was part of the protest. He can't recognize you, Marshall told himself, heart thudding. Nothing of his face was visible. There was no possibility. All the same, when Marshall opened the door to the safe house and pulled the lock behind him, when the protest had been pushed away from the street and dispersed elsewhere so it wasn't so close to foreign territory, he still felt as though someone was watching. Juliet had found her way back to Cheng Wangmio early. After splitting from the tea house to run their separate errands, she and Kathleen had set to meet again at nine in the evening, once the sun had descended and the night was dark, but here she stood almost a quarter of an hour ahead of time. Her nose twitched, picking up the smell of blood that remained from the workers who had been gunned down in the daytime. I heard there was a riot here. Juliet almost jumped. She turned to face Roma, who approached by the dim glow of the shops, half his face illuminated with sharp angles and the other half cast in shadows. He was wearing a hat, and when he came to a stop beside her and knocked it low, enough of his features were hidden that only Juliet staring directly at him from two paces away, would be able to identify him. It was hardly a riot, she replied. Your men worked fast. Yes, well, Roma sniffed the air. Despite the cold that numbed their noses, despite the smells of roasted meat that wafted from the restaurants nearby, he sensed the blood too, could feel what had spilled on the ground here. They can be a little heavy-handed sometimes. Juliet pursed her lips, but otherwise did not respond. She waited for a group of elderly to pass by, then tilted her chin ever so slightly to the right, to the base of the building beside them. 
This is our lab, she said. But we must wait for Kathleen to arrive. She will help you go in while I distract Tyler. Roma arched a brow. Tyler is here. He's been living here. Juliet pointed up, to the windows that were above ground. We have apartments. He's paranoid that white flowers will steal our research. And yet here you are, aiding a white flower to steal your research. He is short-sighted, Juliet said simply. Have a look, Roma. At the lab? Juliet nodded. Roma seemed suspicious as he inched closer to the small windows, to the few inches of glass that jutted up from the concrete ground. Though the workers had gone home, the lights were bright inside, showing only Tyler at the foreman's desk, flipping through a book next to what looked like a very large blue mountain. Roma shuffled back quickly lest he be spotted. What is that? he demanded. The vaccine, Juliet answered. We created it in solid form instead. It's easily dissolvable for distribution through the water system but intensely flammable while solid. At least that was what Juliet had understood from her father's quick briefing after the meeting that day. They would drop it into the water supply throughout all Scarlet territory, immunizing the civilians within range and protecting their own people. Roma nodded once, indicating that he understood what she was implying. It is clever, he said. White flowers do not live in your territories, and those who sneak into some household or another to drink the water will surely risk getting caught and having their lives forfeit. Communists are far from your territories too, likely in the poorer areas or the outer peripheries. And so it is only a scarlet solution, through and through, Juliet finished. Those who seek immunity must pledge allegiance to the scarlets and physically come under our protection, pay rent under our roofs, add more numbers to those of scarlet loyalty. I cannot take any credit for it, alas. It was all Tyler's doing. And was this Tyler's doing too? Juliet swiveled around, alarmed by the unfamiliar voice. For the briefest second, her heart seized, her hand twitching for a knife with half a mind to kill the potential threat. Then her eyes adjusted to the dark, and she recognized the speaker to be Rosalind, following beside Kathleen, who came to a stop with a huff. I did not invite her, Kathleen reported, adjusting her sleeve and giving Roma a polite nod. She thought I was hiding something and came on her own insistence. Roma nodded back. Juliet, Rosalind emphasized when she didn't get an answer. Didn't your collaboration with the White Flower Air end? Juliet had neither the time nor the energy for this. She pressed at her hair, choking back a deep exhale. The chiming of bells sounded nearby, signaling nine o'clock. I'm working with him willingly. Willingly, Rosalind's echo trailed off, the confusion and absolute disbelief in her expression deepening. Her eyes flicked from Juliet to Roma and then back again, and Juliet resisted the urge to flinch, knowing that her cousin could not possibly see what Juliet was afraid she might see. You're openly colluding with the enemy. You have a straight shot, right now, through his head. Rosalind spoke as if Roma weren't standing right there, listening to her plot his death. Just trust me on this. Juliet tried to sound reasonable. There is an incredible amount of difference between killing an enemy too soon and killing them when the time is right. This isn't a good time. Rosalind took a step back. It always comes to this, she said softly. You decide when the blood feud does and does not matter. The Kais decide when they are enemies and when they are not, and the rest of us must fall in line. Rosalind, Kathleen said sharply. Juliet blinked, surprised by the accusation. She wanted to guess that Rosalind was just being spiteful, that Rosalind thought it unfair Juliet could collaborate with Roma without consequence while she had to sneak around with her lover. Only that didn't quite align with the resentment in Rosalind's voice. It felt larger than that. It felt older, not a burst of anger from the heart, but something that had been building up from the sludge of the gut. Rosalind shook her head. Whatever, she said softly. I need to go to my shift at the burlesque club. She turned and walked off, heels clicking quickly into the crowd of Cheng Wangmio, leaving a pocket of silence in her wake. 
Juliet's eyes, flitted to Roma. He did not give any indication that this had shaken him in any way. All he appeared was bored, and it was too dark for Juliet to check for his other tells. We're wasting time, Juliet said, her voice raspy when she spoke up again. I'm going to pull the electric panel at the back of the restaurant and then lure Tyler up to his apartment upstairs. On my cue, Kathleen, you can accompany Roma into the lab. Between the two of you, I'm sure you can figure out which papers are relevant. Are we ready? Kathleen nodded. Roma, too, offered an affirmative shrug. Juliet sighed. All right, then. She plunged into the restaurant. I suppose we should have clarified what exactly Juliet's cue will be, Kathleen remarked when the restaurant fell dark. A few of the patrons inside gave a shout of surprise. Otherwise, they merely continued eating. Yes, well, Roma Montagov said, given that it is Juliet, I am sure it will be loud and obvious. An unbidden sound of amusement escaped from Kathleen, and though she clamped down on it immediately, Roma's expression twitched too, not entirely enough to qualify as amused, but certainly not stoic either. Kathleen's inappropriate levity turned to scrutiny. As they fell into a taut, waiting silence, she bit her lip, fighting the urge to speak further. This was far from the first time she had observed Roma Montagov and Juliet working together despite their multiple attempts to kill the other. And if Juliet would not say anything about why. I hope, Kathleen said, unable to resist the temptation, you understand that Juliet is doing you a great favor. Roma immediately scoffed. There are no favors in this city. Only calculation. You heard what she said to your sister, did you not? Kathleen had. There is an incredible amount of difference between killing an enemy too soon and killing them when the time is right. And it seemed she was the only one who had heard the hitch in her cousin's voice that indicated she was lying. How strange it was. Both that Roma Montagov seemed angered by Juliet's intent to destroy him and that Kathleen could see Juliet didn't intend to at all. She is saying what she thinks Rosalind wants to hear. Roma frowned. I do doubt that. Kathleen tilted her head. Why? This time Roma really did laugh. It was a disbelieving sound, like Kathleen had asked him if it were possible to breathe without air. Miss Lang, he said, his voice still soaked with incredulity, in case you forgot, Juliet and I are bloodsworn enemies. You and I, too are bloodsworn enemies. Kathleen looked at her shoes. They were getting dusty, picking up the weird bits and pieces always littered about the sidewalks. I do not forget, she said quietly. She bent down to wipe at the strap across her heel. I used to think this feud could be stopped if both gangs would just understand each other. I used to draw so many plans to send to Juliet when she was in America. So many things we could say, we could propose, we could put into effect so the white flowers would see that we were people who didn't deserve to die. She straightened up. There was still no cue from Juliet. Only a dark, foreboding building, rumbling with confusion as some of the restaurant patrons wandered outside. Roma lowered his hat to avoid recognition, but he was listening. Only it's not that, is it? It was never the problem of alienation. It doesn't matter how deeply we tell the white flowers of our pain. You know. You have always known, because you tell us of your pain too. Roma cleared his throat. Isn't that the whole point of a blood feud, he finally asked in response. We are equals. We do not try to colonize the other, as the foreigners have done. We do not try to control the other. It is only a game of power. And isn't that mightily tiring? Kathleen demanded. We destroy each other because we wish to be the only ones in this city, and we care little how much the other will hurt. How do we live like that? Silence. Roma's expression was tight, like he suddenly couldn't remember how he got pulled into this conversation. Above them, the clouds were blowing in, gathering with thickness to prepare for what would be a storm. I am sorry. Now it was Kathleen's turn to blink. Whatever for. For not having a solution, I suppose. 
Was he really, though? How could any of them truly be sorry when they did nothing to stop it? It is no good to be sorry, Kathleen said plainly. She knew clear as day that Juliet had realized this a long time ago. That was why her cousin had never put into effect any of her plans. Why her cousin had always brushed the topic away, had resisted from engaging directly, speaking of her parties and speakeasies, instead in her letter replies. So long as the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers have hope for a future where they are the only mighty power, the blood feud lives on. Roma Montagoff shrugged. Then there is a solution. Destroy the gangs. Kathleen lurched, almost colliding with the wall that they stood alongside. No, she said, horrified. That might be worse than having a blood feud. That would be unending grappling, rulers ousted at every turn or politicians who lied at every moment. No one would be as loyal to this city as gangsters were to it. No one. It was then that the sound of smashing glass interrupted Kathleen's train of thought, and her gaze whipped up to find a book falling through one of the third-floor windows. There was a shout from inside the building, then a whole series of footsteps thundering up, a voice that sounded like Tyler calling for backup. There is our cue, Roma Montagov said, already striding for the entrance. Heart pounding, Kathleen made to follow, goosebumps rising at the back of her neck. She was always on edge when she had to perform tasks that could get her in trouble, and breaking into their own scarlet labs was certainly more troublesome than going undercover at communist meetings. Best to hurry, Kathleen warned. There's no telling how long Juliet can hold Tyler's attention away for. They descended into the lab quickly. It was pitch dark. Kathleen squinted in haste to avoid colliding with a work table, her hands groping about to find her way. Roma did not seem to have the same problem, pulling a small burlap sack from his coat and using the thinnest stream of moonlight coming from the windows to light his way. He made fast work of taking samples from the mountain in the center of the lab. The texture was as malleable as clay, as light as dust. Miss Lang, where are the papers? Kathleen wrinkled her nose, still squinting without much success. They made almost a dozen copies so they're all around us. Just make sure you find a complete set, not duplicates of the same page. Roma set down the burlap sack and dug into his pocket again, coming out with a small box in his hand. Kathleen didn't register what he was doing until there was a whoosh. Sound and a flame burst to life between his fingers, eating up the matchstick. Are you mad? Kathleen hissed. Put that out. The vaccine is flammable. With a grimace, Roma pinched the match out. No fuss, he said. He reached for a stack of papers right beside him. I think I've got it. Kathleen huffed, wiping a thin sheen of sweat from her forehead. She had had one job, to watch him, and this place had almost gone up in flames. Above them, there came the rumbling of more footsteps. The sound of glass shattering again echoed inside the building, and then, almost scaring the life out of Kathleen, a fast tapping came on the windows to the lab. When her gaze whipped to the moonlight, she found Juliet gesturing frantically for them to hurry. You have everything? Kathleen asked Roma. Roma gestured to the materials in his hand. Thank you for aiding a white flower break-in, Miss Lang. Juliet waited outside impatiently, half thinking that it would be Tyler emerging before Kathleen and Roma did. The timing could ruin this whole scheme. All it would take was Tyler freeing himself from the bonds that she had secured over him, bonds that she had secured rather hastily after attacking him from behind with a bag over his head. Time had been of the essence, it was more important for her to get out than it was to keep him tied down all night. At last Kathleen and Roma emerged from the restaurant, stepping back into the busyness of Cheng Huangmio. At the same moment, there was a shout from above, loud because of the broken window. A few late-night strollers glanced up but did not pause, paying no heed to the strange events that occurred in these places. A bang. Tyler had freed himself. I'll try to keep him distracted, Kathleen said, already moving back in the direction of the restaurant. Both of you, go. They didn't need more prompting. Side by side, 
Roma and Juliet, kept a steady, non-suspicious pace until Tyler burst out from the building, bellowing into the night and asking for the intruder to show himself. By then enough time had passed that they had faded into the crowd and could pick up speed. Though there weren't as many people here in the night as in the day, it was enough cover to blend in and step into an alleyway out of Tyler's sight utterly. Come on, Juliet whispered, forging ahead. The alley walls loomed alongside them, tall and foreboding. Remember your bargain, Roma find me the Frenchman. I will work as fast as I can, Roma said from behind her. I promise that woomph. Juliet whirled around with a gasp, alarmed by Roma's muffled shout. For a startling moment, she did not even think to draw a weapon. She could only wonder how Tyler had found them when she thought she'd lost him. She thought that he wouldn't have been able to move through the crowds at such speed. Then her vision focused, and she realized Roma was not being attacked, whoever had a hold of him was pressing a cloth to his face, and when Roma dropped to the ground, falling unconscious, the figure set him down without malice. It was not Tyler who had found them. It was Benedict Montagov, who stood to his full height, pushing back the hood of his coat and walking toward her. Ta Madi. I didn't gauge you to be the type to murder your own cousin, Juliet snarked, slowly inching back. If she bolted now, chances were that she could make a run for it. There was another alley across from this one, leading into a busier street that might give her shelter. He is only knocked out, Benedict replied coldly. Because he could not do what needs to be done. The gun came out in an instant. He had not been holding it before, but then it was in his hand, the stark, sleek weapon glinting under the moonlight and only three paces away from being pressed directly to Juliet's forehead. There was no way out of this. There was no way Juliet could run fast enough without a bullet entering one body part or the other, and then she would bleed out here, like another one of the workers rioting for life. Benedict was not like Roma. He had no hesitation with her life. Listen to me, Juliet said very carefully, holding her hands up. She imagined her brains blown upon the wall, pink and red smeared with the tiles. She would accept her death when it came someday, but not now, not under a false revenge that this Montagoff cousin had taken upon himself. Benedict's finger tightened on the trigger. Don't waste yourself on last words. I will not have it. Benedict Montagov, it's not what you. For Marshall, he whispered. Juliet squeezed her eyes shut. He's alive. He's alive. The bullet did not come. Slowly, Juliet eased her eyes open again and found Benedict with his arm slackened, staring at her in a gasp disbelief. I beg your pardon? You fool, Juliet said, the insult coming softly. Do you not remember Lawrence's serum? In all this time, I have half expected one of you to realize the truth. Marshal Seo is alive. 25. Benedict didn't put away his weapon as he followed Juliet through the city. He didn't trust her. He couldn't guess how she might sidle out of this, couldn't pick out the clear sign of a lie when she had winced at Roma's unconscious form in that alleyway and waved for Benedict to walk alongside her but there was plenty of time between now and wherever they were going for Juliet to run, or God forbid, retrieve her own weapon and shoot. She didn't pull out any weapon. She only continued walking forward, her step certain, like she had walked this route a thousand times before. Benedict was developing a tick in his cheek. He could hardly think long on what Juliet had said lest he lose his mind before he saw the truth for himself. He had the urge to smack his palm against something, to stamp his feet down until his shoes were in pieces. He did nothing. He only followed, obedient and blank-faced. Juliet stopped outside a nondescript building, its exterior small and faded enough that it blended right into all the walls and windows nearby. There were three steps that went up into the building, and through the open entranceway, there was a single door pressed right by the entrance two or three paces away from a staircase that continued winding up. Benedict listened. Past the howl of the wind, there was very little to be heard. The upper levels of this building were likely vacant. Benedict jumped, the gun in his hand twitching, 
when Juliet plopped herself down upon a crate outside the apartment door. I'll wait out here, she said. Doors unlocked around these times. Benedict blinked. If this is a trick. Oh, spare me. Just go in. His hand came down on the handle. For whatever reason, or for every reason, he supposed, his heartbeat was raging like a war drum in his chest. The door eased open, and he stepped into the dim apartment, eyes adjusting while the door clicked behind him on its own. For a moment he did not know what to look for, a stovetop, papers scattered on a table, a shelf, and then. There. Like a goddamn specter raised from the dead, Marshal Seo was lounging on a shabby mattress. Hearing the intrusion in the room, Marshal casually glanced up from the wood carving he was working on, then did a rapid double take, bolting to his feet. Ben, he exclaimed. He was paler. His hair was shorter, but uneven, as if he had taken a pair of scissors with his own hands and hacked away, doing a piss-poor job at the back. Benedict could not move, could not say anything. He gaped like a fish, all wide eyes and loose hanging mouth, staring and staring because this was Marshall, alive and walking and right in front of him. Benedict, Marshall said again, nervously now. Say something. Benedict finally jolted to action. He picked up the nearest object he could find, an apple, and threw it at Marshall with all his strength. Hey! Marshall yelped, jumping out of the way. What gives? You didn't think to contact me? Benedict shouted. He picked up an orange next. It bounced off Marshall's shoulder. I thought you were dead. I mourned you for months. I slaughtered scarlets in your name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Marshall kept darting around, trying to avoid being target practice. It had to be this way. It was too dangerous to tell you. Juliet's reputation is on the line if this gets out. I don't care about Juliet. I care about you. Suddenly Benedict and Marshall both froze, the former remembering that Juliet was still within hearing range and the latter realizing that she must be outside if Benedict was here. There came a shuffling sound on the other side of the door and then Juliet, clearing her throat. You know what, she called. I think I might go take a walk. Her heels clicked off, fading into the distance. Benedict felt like a hole had been punctured in his lungs as he leaned up against the table, all that fury and anger he had been carrying inside him finding nowhere to go and opting to deflate and deflate and deflate instead. He had expected to explode outward, to at last rid the darkness in his chest by seeking revenge and directing a very sharp object at Juliet. Instead, the darkness had turned to light, and now he was an overwrought light bulb, close to implosion when the vacuum space inside shattered. She didn't have to save me, Marshall said softly, when it looked like Benedict was at a loss. Benedict remained staring at the table, both his hands pressed to the flat surface. Slowly, Marshall crept nearer until he was right beside Benedict. He opted to lean against the table, the two of them facing different directions. She could have killed me and secured complete power, but she didn't. She has been hiding you? Benedict asked his head lurching up. Here? All this time? Marshall nodded. If Tyler Kai finds out, it is not merely a fight that will result. It is Juliet's entire position. She will be ousted. She could have avoided pretending to kill you in the first place, Benedict muttered. And have us all die at the Scarlet's hand in that hospital? Marshall asked. Come on, Ben. I already had a bullet in my stomach. If she hadn't sent them running in those few minutes, I would have bled out. Benedict scrubbed at his face. Try as he might to be resentful, he had no alternative to offer. Fine, he grumbled. Perhaps Juliet Kai knew what she was doing. Marshall reached out and punched Benedict's shoulder. It was something he had done thousands of times before. Benedict's pulse picked up regardless like the weight of his newfound knowledge added to the weight of the hit. I owed it to her to lie low, Marshall said, not noticing the turmoil unraveling right beside him. Well, 
when people on the streets weren't trying any funny business, at least. Otherwise, I was lying low. Funny business? Benedict echoed. Marshall picked up a cloth on the table and mimed tying it to his face. In a flash, Benedict saw that dark figure on the rooftop again, the one who had shot all those scarlets when he had been badly outnumbered. That was you. Of course it was, Marshall replied, his dimples deepening. Who else would keep such a close eye on you? Benedict's breath left him in a whoosh. The air in the room grew still, or maybe that was just him, his lungs reaching critical deflation. I love you, he thought. Do you know? Have you always known? Have I always known? A notch in Marshall's brow formed, accompanying his hesitant smile. Marshall was confused. Benedict was staring, and he could not stop. All the terror and devastation that had wrecked him these past few months lodged right in his throat like a physical block. You could reach for him. Ask if he loves you back. Ben? Marshall asked. Are you okay? If he loved me too, wouldn't he have told me? Wouldn't he have come to me, come hell or high water? Benedict reached over suddenly, but only to hug his friend close, only to do as he had always done in all these years they had known each other. Marshall jolted but was quick to return the embrace, laughing as Benedict pressed his chin hard into Marshall's shoulder, like the physical sensation was enough to confirm that this was real, this was all real. Don't ever do that to me again, he muttered. Don't ever do something like that again. Marshall's arms tightened. Once is plenty, Ben. He's alive, Benedict thought pulling back with a thin smile. That's all that matters. Roma awoke with a deep cough, rolling onto his side and wheezing for breath. By the time he came to, the moon was directly above him, shining into his bleary eyes. His neck was in pain. His back was in pain. Even his ankles were in pain. But the vaccine still lay beside him, the bag untouched. So too did the papers, tucked inside. What the hell? Over his head, the birds perched on the electric lines flew off at once, startled by Roma's shout. He hadn't seen who had knocked him out. Juliet was gone too, but there was no sign of a struggle, no blood in the alley or even a sequin fallen from her dress. Roma got to his feet. He could only assume that it had been a scarlet, and Juliet had either dealt with the situation or was off elsewhere leading them away. There was nothing he could do now except take the vaccine to Lawrence as he had planned. Roma trudged off. In that alley, the birds did not come back in his absence. They knew to flee as something else stirred in Cheng Wangmio, lumbering in on two upright feet. If the people in the market had paid attention, they might have known to go too. Instead, not a soul in Cheng Wangmio thought to move until the screaming started and they looked up finding five monstrous creatures tearing a path into the clearing. Juliet came in through the front door of her house, shrugging her coat off when one of the maids gestured to take it. There was still activity in the kitchen, some aunt making a late-night snack, the warm glow of light crossing into the otherwise dark living room. Go to bed, Juliet told the maid after she hung up the coat. It's late. I'll fetch you some slippers first, the maid said. She was on the older side, likely a mother by the way she was frowning disapprovingly as Juliet rolled off her sharp and impractical heels. Juliet sighed and collapsed sideways into the couch. Sia Sia. Aya, the maid chided, already marching out of the living room. Bu Yao Sha. The maid disappeared into the hallway. If only the people of the vast and expansive Scarlet Empire could see Juliet now. She looked like a paper doll more than she looked an heiress with blades for teeth. Then the front door burst open, and Juliet jolted to her bare feet immediately, braced for war. A gust of cold came blowing in, then Tyler, dragging someone behind him. When Tyler came closer, he pulled his hostage forward too, and it was Kathleen who came into the light, stumbling to a stop in front of Juliet. What is the meaning of this? Juliet demanded. She reached for Kathleen's shoulders, giving her a cursory pat. Are you hurt? No. I'm fine, Kathleen said, 
shooting Tyler a deathly glare. She rubbed her arm harshly. Your cousin just has barnacles for brains. I know you did it, Juliet, Tyler spat. I could smell your perfume everywhere. What was in it for you? Power? Money? Juliet exchanged a glance with Kathleen, who shrugged, seeming flabbergasted as well. What are you talking about? Juliet asked. Tyler's expression turned livid. Why are you feigning ignorance? I am ignorant, what are you accusing me of? The monsters, Juliet. Monsters stormed the lab and took every bit of the vaccine. Horrified, Juliet staggered a step back, her legs hitting the couch. She tried to school her expression, but she doubted it worked, not when a cold sweat had broken out from head to toe. Monsters? Right after Juliet's heist? On the same night? How could this possibly be a coincidence? The maid returned with Juliet's slippers then, but she took one look at the scene before her and set the slippers down by the kitchen, making a quick exit. A click echoed through the living room, the hallway door closing. Above, the chandelier gave a single chime, picking up that faint whisper of the wind. Did you see anything? Juliet asked. Was it all of them? All five of them, Kathleen answered. We caught the last glimpse of the monsters disappearing, and yet Tyler still thinks I had a hand in it, despite catching up to me from three streets away before the monsters attacked. Kathleen must have done as she said, distracting Tyler so Roma and Juliet could get away without being caught. But who was to know that monsters would suddenly add themselves into the equation too? Of course, it wasn't the monsters, was it? It was that damn blackmailer. Why else were you even there? Tyler snapped at Kathleen. That's my business, Kai Tyler. Regardless, you chased me all the way out of Chengwangmyo. You saw how far I was from the monsters. That wouldn't have prevented you from summoning them. That wouldn't have prevented you, at this, he pointed a finger at Juliet, from summoning them. Kathleen shook her head. You're being ridiculous. I'm going to go fetch Lord Kai to handle this. She trekked up the steps before Tyler could say otherwise, disappearing from view. In her absence, the living room fell quiet, Tyler watching Juliet carefully for any tell of her guilt, and Juliet racking her brain for how it was possible that the blackmailer would strike at the same time as her. It couldn't have been the white flowers. Roma had been lying unconscious in an alleyway. Benedict Montagoff had been with her. No one else knew of her plans unless Roma had set people after him, which she could not imagine, for otherwise he would have had to explain how he came across the information. So what happened? Listen, Tyler said. His voice had lowered. If you just come clean, I can help you. There's no shame in admitting that you're simply misguided. Juliet shook her head. How many times do you need to hear of my innocence, Tyler? It is not your innocence I want to hear. I'm trying to steer you to do what's right. Why can't you see that? There was the shuffle of footsteps from upstairs. It could have been Kathleen popping in and out of the rooms. It could have been the household staff slinking near to witness the drama. Either way, Juliet was so irritated that she could only splutter for a moment, temporarily losing grasp of every language she spoke. Your idea of what's right is not gospel, she finally managed. All she could see in her mind's eye was the people of Shanghai dying, gouging at their own skin from a preventable madness, all because the people at the top, because people in this very household, couldn't find it in themselves to care. Who do you think you are to tell me what's right? I am your family, he snapped. If I don't keep you in line, who will? Hey. Kathleen's voice cut through the argument. She was leaning upon the second floor banister her head visible from where Juliet and Tyler stood. Your father's not here, she reported once she had Juliet's attention. It's almost eleven o'clock. Juliet blinked. Lie run. Almost immediately, the maid came back. She had been waiting in the hallway, just outside the living room. Would you like me to make a call to see where your father is, Miss Kai? 
and apparently there wasn't even any shame in pretending like she wasn't listening. Yes, please. The maid disappeared, and Kathleen came back down the stairs. As they waited, hovering in the living room, Kathleen loosened her braid and smoothed her fingers along her scalp, as if the weight of her hair was giving her a headache. Quietly, Juliet pulled a thin, needle-like knife from her sleeve and offered it. Kathleen took it with a grateful look, then stuck it into her hair for a pin. The maid returned. She was pale. Scarlet reports say Lord Kai is at the burlesque club, she said. Juliet was already starting toward the door, ready to report to her father what nonsense was happening with the blackmailer, but then the maid went on, the place has been locked down. He's not letting people in. Juliet paused in her step, turning over her shoulder. On instinct, she looked at Kathleen, then Tyler, and they both appeared equally puzzled. For what reason? The only time she could remember her father shutting down a club or a restaurant was when someone had misbehaved, and he needed to. A bolt of ice sank down Juliet's spine. Suddenly she thought she could smell metal under her nose, the phantom scent of blood, the scent that soaked the ground each time a deal had fallen through or a secret had slipped and the men of the scarlet inner circle needed to pay for it. Punishment, the maid reported, turning even paler. He's just arrived. For Miss Rosalind. Rosalind? Tyler exclaimed. The hell did she do? Oh, Murd. Juliet ran for the door, but even as she tore into the night, the maid's answer followed her out. She's the white flower spy. 26. Juliet practically slammed into the two scarlets, guarding the door to the burlesque club, narrowly halting before a collision. Kathleen was close behind her breath coming fast. Let me through. Miss Kai. The Scarlets exchanged a glance. We can't. Stand aside. Now. One of them shifted out of her way, drawing a glare from the other, but that small gap was enough for Juliet. She squeezed past and pushed through the door, barging into the dark interior of the club, the smell of smoke bringing an immediate sting to her eyes. And inside, all she could hear was screaming. For a moment Juliet was frozen in shock, uncertain what she was witnessing. The club had been cleared out, the tables and bar emptied of patrons and workers. The only people present were her father's men, seated around him and at the ready while he lounged at one of the largest tables, arms splayed across the velvet of the half-moon couch. He was facing forward, facing the stage, where Rosalind was being whipped. The lash came down again on her back, and Rosalind cried out, her whole body shuddering. They didn't allow her to crumple to the floor, there were four scarlets around her, two to hold her upright, one with the whip, and one standing just to the side. Oh my God, Kathleen whispered. Oh my. Juliet charged for the stage. Stop it, she demanded. She was upon the platform in three fast steps. When the scarlet standing guard tried to stop her from lunging in Rosalind's direction, Juliet was faster, pushing at the arms that tried to grab her. The guard tried again, and Juliet immediately struck her fist across his face. He stumbled away, finally letting Juliet throw herself before Rosalind, her own body a shield for the next lashing. Xiao Wang, stand down. At Lord Kai's call, the scarlet who held the whip frowned. Droplets of blood were splattered across the front of his shirt, but he seemed not to notice. He didn't stand down. His arm pulled back, half prepared to strike again, as if he would release the whip. Go ahead, Juliet said, her words curling into a sneer. Whip me, and see how many pieces I'll cut you into afterward. Xiao Wang. That was Lord Kai again, his voice rising over Rosalind's whimpers. Stand down. The scarlet listened. He lowered the whip, and Juliet spun around, hands outstretched for Rosalind. As soon as the scarlets released their hold on her, she collapsed, and Juliet scrambled to catch her cousin, softening her fall onto the stage. By then Kathleen had reached them too, cursing and cursing under her breath. The burlesque club was silent. Waiting. Rosalind, Juliet said. 
Rosalind, can you walk? Rosalind mumbled something beneath her breath. Juliet couldn't hear what Rosalind was saying, but by Kathleen's stricken expression, she had understood immediately. Deserve what? Kathleen asked, her voice a mere rasp. Why would you say that? It was only then that the mumble registered to Juliet. I deserve it, I deserve it. Because she does. Juliet's head snapped up, seeking her father. He had spoken in such plain declaration, without room for dispute nor debate. Baba, she whispered, horrified. You know Rosalind. You know who she is. Indeed, Lord Kai replied. And so she should have known better. She should have had more loyalty, but instead she has been feeding scarlet information out. Juliet felt her throat grow tight. When she shifted her hold on her cousin, her palm came back entirely slick with blood, the mangled gashes in Rosalind's chi pao weeping bright and red from her wounds. Juliet was torn between the same indignation that had dragged her father out here to make an example out of Rosalind and utter outrage that this was Rosalind, no matter what she did, where was her chance to explain herself? Is this about her lover? Kathleen asked quietly. Her voice shook. He is a mere merchant. She said he would soon leave the white flowers. He is no mere merchant, Lord Kai replied. With disconcerting speed, he leaned off the couch, grabbing a stack of papers upon the table. In his hand, he flipped through them, then selected one to pass to a scarlet beside him, indicating in Juliet's direction. He is no merchant at all. According to the letters we found, he is a white flower through and through, and he has been siphoning our clientele lists through Lang Shalin for months. What? The scarlet presented the single piece of paper. Juliet scanned the Russian script briefly, reading a report about the members of the inner circle. This was one among hundreds. One day, logged out of months. Who? Juliet demanded. Who were these letters being sent to? Well, Lord Kai gestured toward Xiao Wang, toward the whip that trailed blood across the stage. That's what I wanted to know too. By now it seemed that Rosalind was close to losing consciousness, her body growing still. Juliet tapped her face, but her cousin's eyes had fallen shut, thick lashes fluttering up and down each time Juliet urged for a response. Come on, Rosalind, Juliet hissed. Stay awake. Lord Kai arose from his seat suddenly, and panic surged through Juliet's every cell in response. She had never responded like this before when it came to her father, whom she had always seen as fair, even when he was the one holding the whip. Nothing had changed. Her father was and had always been the leader of a ruthless gang, the head of a criminal empire. He had never hesitated to give punishment where punishment was deserved, and Juliet had never blinked until now, now, when punishment was still fair, but fair brought the blood of one of her best friends. We are done here, I suppose, Lord Kai said. If you want to interfere, Juliet, you can help by getting a name out of your cousin. She protects him even now, and it will not stand. He waved at the men around him. Help her home. Call a doctor. Kathleen made a noise of protest as they leaned over to grab Rosalind, but Juliet relinquished her hold. The time for punishment had passed, and the Scarlets weren't fond of unnecessary cruelty. They were careful, avoiding Rosalind's injuries. This whole event wasn't about hurting her, it was about making a point. Juliet, Kathleen whispered when the Scarlets started to clear out from the club. Did Rosalind lie to us? Yes. Juliet replied, certain. She squeezed her hands, and blood crusted into the lines of her palms. Rosalind had lied, had betrayed the Scarlets for whatever reason, and Lord Kai had not hesitated to make her answer for it. Juliet looked at the bloodred stains on the stage. The men were moving the tables into their original formation, glasses clinking together, voices yelling at one another to summon the car out front. She could feel her father's eyes on her calm in inspection, digesting her every reaction. She needed to keep her expression composed, no particular horror at the violence, no undue sympathy for a traitor. But all she could think was, 
if Rosalind was whipped like this for leaking scarlet information and protecting an ordinary white flower, then what was Juliet's fate if they were to ever find out about her past with Roma Montagov? Benedict wouldn't have run the message himself if it weren't such a late hour, but the clock was nearing midnight, and he doubted any of the white flowers were sober enough in the main headquarters to be summoned to a task. This was urgent. Though these few months, he supposed just about everything in this city was. I cannot concentrate with you hovering over me like this. Benedict heard Lawrence's booming voice before he saw him, pushing through the lab doors and scanning across the few technicians working overtime. Eventually, he sighted Lawrence and his cousin near the side tables, both of them squinting at something under a microscope. Or technically, Lawrence was the one with his face pressed to the eyepiece. Roma was looming over him and invading the scientist's personal space. Is that the vaccine? Benedict asked. Stolen right from the Scarlets, Roma answered, having recognized Benedict's voice without bothering to look up as he approached. But Lawrence is saying he doesn't think he can recreate it. I cannot read any of these papers, Lawrence shot back. Moreover, this sample is not pure. It has been manipulated for additional solubility or flammability. One or the other, I'm sure. Well, Benedict interrupted, it just became a lot more valuable. The Scarlets had their entire supply stolen. By monsters. Roma finally looked up, taking a step away from the microscope. What? I was there only a mere hour ago. I know. Benedict nudged a thumb toward the doors, indicating the rest of the city outside. That's why there are rumors that you orchestrated it. White flower credibility went up. Scarlet security went down. There will be blood feud fights on the streets tonight, I'm sure. Me? Roma muttered under his breath. That's rich. I wish I did. Lawrence, meanwhile, made a thoughtful noise, his eye still pressed to the microscope. I really would recommend finding the source of this rather than counting on our recreation of the vaccine, Roma. Roma didn't say anything in response. He was good at internalizing. If Benedict took a listening device to his cousin's head, he was sure he would hear an utter scramble of panic, but on the exterior, Roma simply folded his arms. Just try your best. Even if I can find the blackmailer, who's to say if I can find the rest of the damn monsters? Lawrence pushed the microscope away wearily. I am not paid enough for this. He reached for the drawers along the work table, retrieving a scalpel. Speaking of which, there was someone who came poking around in the evening, seeking you. Benedict pulled a face, though Roma was too busy with his own surprise to notice. To the lab? Roma said. Here? I do not know how he found his way over either. He was called General Shu. Why did that name sound familiar? Benedict combed through his memory, but came up empty. Roma, on the other hand, immediately reared back. He's a top nationalist official. What does he want with me? Lawrence merely heaved a sigh, like the topic was wearing him out. I suspect he circulated all the places you are known to frequent. He left as soon as I said you were not present. Are you in trouble? Benedict asked. With the Kuomintang? Roma replied, scoffing. No more than the usual level they want me dead. He stepped away from the work table, leaving Lawrence to his task. Shall we go? Benedict nodded. He was still mulling over Lawrence's strange report when Roma opened the doors for him, the smack of cold wind forcing him alert. You look better today, Roma remarked, starting in the direction of headquarters. Are you getting more sleep? Yes, Benedict replied plainly. And mere hours ago, I found out that Marshall is still alive. He wanted to say it aloud. He wanted to scream it from the rooftops and declare it to the whole world, so that the world could end its mourning with him. But now Benedict had been roped into Marshall's promise to Juliet. Benedict was another piece in a larger chess game, one with Juliet on one side and Roma on the other, and to keep Marshall from falling off the board, it seemed that he had to start playing for Juliet's strategy. Good, Roma replied. 
a slight crinkle appeared in his brow. Perhaps confusion, perhaps relief. His cousin heard the lift in his voice and couldn't quite pinpoint a cause, but he was not direct enough to ask outright. A street lamp flickered above them. Benedict rubbed at his own arms, easing his chill. When they turned a corner, deep enough in white flower territory that he felt assured they wouldn't be attacked any time soon, he said. You did not seem concerned by the news I brought you. I expected some exclamation when told that monsters robbed the scarlets of their vaccine. What's the point? Roma replied tiredly. The scarlets never would have distributed to us. The concern isn't the scarlet loss. It's the use of monsters for such a trivial task with no attack on the people. Roma blew out a breath, fogging the air around him. I'm almost convinced at this point they'll never go away, he muttered. They will keep coming and coming, and Juliet will keep appearing before me, dropping to her knees to ask for help just one last time, right before she puts a blade in my back. Benedict remained silent, not knowing what to say. The lack of argument must have seemed suspicious to Roma, because he threw a quick glance over, mouth opening again. But Roma didn't begin his next sentence. Instead, so quickly that it scared the living daylights out of Benedict, Roma pulled his gun and shot into the night over Benedict's shoulder, his bullet already echoing before Benedict had whirled around and caught sight of movement disappearing from the mouth of the alley. Who was that? Benedict demanded. He glanced around, taking inventory of their surroundings, the shop signs written in Cyrillic and the Russian bakeries all lined up in a row, though they had retired for the night. This was about as far into white flower territory as one could go. A scarlet? Roma frowned, drawing closer to the alley. His target had long disappeared, possibly struck, possibly only grazed, given the distance at which Roma had shot from. No, he replied. A nationalist, uniformed. I thought I heard someone behind us, but I chalked it up to my imagination until they came closer. We were followed almost immediately upon leaving the lab. Benedict blinked. First an official appearing at the lab. Now they were picking up a tail on the streets, right in their own territory? It was bold, far too bold. What did you do? he demanded. Roma didn't answer. He had sighted something on the alley floor, a wad of loose leaf paper. It looked like an old advertisement, but Roma picked it up anyway and unfolded it. His eyebrows shot straight up. Forget about what I did. Roma turned the slip of paper around, and a sketch of Benedict's face stared right back at him. What do the Kuomintang want by trailing after you? Benedict took the paper. A cold sweat broke out along his spine. His neutral expression was colored in careful ink, the illustration better than his own self-portraits. The artist had been generous with his crop of curly hair. There was no doubt that this was him. I haven't a clue, Benedict muttered. But his concern wasn't why the Kuomintang were following him. If they had been on his tail for some time now, the more important question was, how much had they seen from earlier in the day, when he was exiting the safe house and saying goodbye to Marshall, who was supposed to be dead? 27. Rumor had it that there would be more protests today. The early morning had passed with a flurry in the Scarlet House, its hallways combating collision after collision of whispers. If it wasn't Tyler's relatives trying to clarify with one another what exactly Miss Rosalind had done to be hauled home covered in blood, it was their speculation about whether it was safe to enter the central city today when reports said that workers were attempting to strike yet again. Tyler couldn't get out fast enough. A bunch of good-for-nothings, they all were, talking instead of doing. With the new hubbub, hardly anyone was paying heed to what had happened to their vaccine supply. The monsters had invaded a secure facility that only Scarlet Inner Circle knew about. Was no one suspicious? Was Lord Kai not the slightest bit concerned? Right? With delay, Tyler stubbed out his cigarette in the ashtray, then looked up at Anong and Kansun. They were across from him, pacing the length of the room, while Tyler remained seated upon a chaise lounge, granted a full view out the floor-to-ceiling window before him. 
Below, the intersection just outside the Bailman Dance Hall was at high capacity of activity, the citizens and occupants of Shanghai bustling to and fro like there was hardly a minute to spare. Every so often, someone walking on the street would glance up, tracing their eyes across the block letters reading Paramount, fixed outside the dance hall. They could likely see into the windows of the second floor, into the opulence and the vacant rooms opened for Tyler to come and go as he pleased. The rest of Shanghai didn't have such leisure. Were you saying something? he asked, frowning. Anong paused for a beat, like he couldn't tell if Tyler genuinely had not heard him or if he was giving him another chance to reconsider what he had just said. When seconds passed and Tyler did not look angry, Anong cleared his throat and repeated, I was only remarking on the uselessness of trying to disrupt the communist forces. Our numbers are dwindling as it is, and theirs keep growing. We have a blood feud on the other side to take care of, they are single-minded in their objective. Tyler nodded. He remained only half-listening, and when he replied, it was also half-hearted. No one cares to follow what is good. Tyler retrieved a new cigarette, but he didn't light it. The blood feud. The goddamn blood feud and the goddamn white flowers, siphoning their resources and their members and their members' loyalty like some parasitic invasion of the mind. What was it about their maneuvers that had people turning against their family? Juliet, and her dalliance with Roma Montagov. Rosalind, and whatever nonsense she had gotten involved with. Perhaps it was simply the women. Perhaps they were just weak. Tyler struck a new match. Once his own cigarette was lit, he threw the pack into the air, and Andong's hand whipped out, hurrying to catch it before it could fall to the floor. Cautiously, Anong took one cigarette out. He worried it between his lips, and as if reading Tyler's thoughts, asked, So what are you to do about Juliet? What am I supposed to do? Tyler replied immediately. He took a drag, then almost coughed. He had never liked these things. He smoked them for a lack of anything better to do. If she won't admit to her wrongdoing, I can't force it out of her. She will merely keep rotting us from the inside out. She didn't even know it. Tyler had no doubt that Juliet, his cousin who had grown up with everyone wrapped around her finger, would never for a second consider that she might be wrong. That her behavior was traitorous, even if she was not openly acting the traitor. Sympathy for the white flowers was weakness. Love for the white flowers was a direct strike against the scarlets in the blood feud. Juliet may as well take a gun to her own head for all that she was doing to the future of the gang she was supposed to lead. He still didn't know what to believe, whether she had something to do with the vaccine disappearing. Juliet was the one who had killed the last monster, was it so hard to believe that perhaps she had gotten her hands on five others? Juliet was the one who wanted the vaccine distributed to the whole city, was it so hard to believe that she would steal it for that purpose? But why seek a vaccine at all if the monsters were under her control? It made no sense. Something didn't quite click. Unless they weren't hers. Unless she was going along with it because they were under Roma Montagov's control, and she couldn't find it in herself to rebel against him. Tyler jumped to his feet, drawing Kansen's curious attention. The window was flaring with light, a vendor's stall passing the street underneath with its reflective surfaces. They had initially come to a high vantage point to watch for the possibility of monsters in the city, but there had been no chaos of the supernatural persuasion, only human strikes and human protests. If Roma Montagov was the perpetrator, then Juliet could still be saved. Tyler believed that. The Scarlets came first, and bitter as it was, that did include his cousin. Blood to blood, it was the same sort that ran in their veins. That had to count for something. If she were forced to choose sides, if she saw how this city was split, she would realize what was at stake. She would stop operating foolishly under a white flower's thumb. What does Roma Montagov treasure most? Anong blinked, taken aback by the question. Meanwhile, Hansun folded his arms and brought his shoulders near his ears, considering the question. He was already slight and looked even more so when he stood like that, wasting into a stick figure. 
what do we care about Roma Montaga for? Anong asked, but both Kansun and Tyler were looking out the window, tracing the crowds that gathered thicker and thicker. Tyler dropped his cigarette in the tray. His fingers were dusted with ash, prickling at his skin. The human body was so fickle. He should have been born a beast instead. He could have used it well. Come on, gentlemen, he said, making for the door. The protest starts soon. The streets were full of people, blocking the entrance of the meeting hall that Kathleen needed to enter. With a wince and an awkward sidestep, Kathleen tried to squeeze herself through, her elbows held out on either side of her. It did little to avoid the jostling, but it did streamline her path ever so slightly. The crowds could have been worse. They could have summoned a strike that incapacitated the whole city, but it seemed they remained localized in the central areas. Oh, Christ! Kathleen ducked, narrowly avoiding being smacked across the face by a worker's sign. The worker glanced at her momentarily before moving on, but Kathleen's gaze was drawn to the red rag tied around their arm. Which color do you bleed? Juliet had asked so long ago, in that den not far from here. Scarlet or the worker's red? When Kathleen brought her hand up to shield the sun off her face, the red thread at her wrist glimmered like jewelry. It was pristine and stark, dangling softly against her skin. This was scarlet red. This was the clean edges of a color used merely for allegiance, for decoration. The worker's red was dirty, and spirited, and desperate. It had long exploded outward, in all directions, spilling like a crowd growing frenzied. Kathleen finally pushed her way in, sidling into the meeting hall. This was not the very worst it could get, far from it, if the enthusiasm among the communists here was any indication. The communists and their unions would keep trying and trying, each time inciting revolt in one part of the city and hoping it would set off a chain reaction in the others. The better they prepared, the more likely they would succeed. And when they did, that was no longer the protests of unruly workers on the streets. That was revolution. Attention. Attention. The meeting had already started, switching from one speaker to another, so Kathleen slid into a seat, hoping she hadn't missed anything critical. It hardly seemed important now to keep an eye on their further plans, the Scarlets already knew. The Communists had almost reached the end of their planning, the final revolt waiting in the wings, ready to take to the stage. What are we rising for? the speaker on stage asked. What do we incite change for? Our own gain? Our own peace? Kathleen pulled at her braid. Her mind wandered to Rosalind, to her sister's silence last night when she had stirred back into consciousness. The state will continue to suppress us. The law will continue to cheat us. Anyone who deems themselves a savior of this city is a fraud. All kings are tyrants, all rulers are thieves. It is not peace nor gain that revolution shall aim for. It is only freedom. All through the meeting hall, party members rose to their feet. Their chairs scraped back, the noise grating to the ear. Kathleen didn't move, only taking it all in. She wasn't worried about sticking out. No one was paying attention to the last row, too focused on the speaker at the front. The gangsters of this city sacrifice us for their pride, for their meaningless blood feud. The foreigners of this city sacrifice us for riches, for unending gold stockpiled on their ships. We will free ourselves from these chains. Who are they to tell us what to do? Who are they to punish us when they see fit? His words washed over her like a tidal wave. Kathleen suddenly wanted to clutch her stomach, unable to bear the truth nodding up inside her. Indeed, who was the Scarlet Gang to whip Rosalind bloody merely because they had decided she was not loyal enough? Why did they deserve the power to hurt another person? Why was this the way they lived? falling to their knees under Lord Kai just because it was the way it had always been. If he wanted them dead next, then Kathleen and Rosalind had no choice save to place their heads down for the sword's blow. Protection was nothing when it hinged on one family's whims and desires. This wasn't what Kathleen had sworn loyalty to. She wanted order, she wanted order under Juliet's control. 
but if order needed to tremble under fear first, maybe it wasn't worth it. Rise, the speaker on stage said. Too long have we suffered and languished. We shall rise. At last Kathleen stood too, putting her hands together to clap. Elisa chewed on her fork, her foot dangling off the roof edge. At present, she was sitting at the very top of headquarters, face turned to the cold wind as her fingers flipped through a file swiped from her father's office. Her bedroom was directly below, warm and cozy, but her brother or other white flowers could walk in at any moment, and she couldn't have that while she was snooping. In search of privacy, she had climbed up to the roof tiles instead, a plate of cake in one hand and the folder of papers tucked under her arm. She stabbed her fork in for another bite, chewing thoughtfully. Just as she started flipping to the next page, there was a burst of noise from afar, the usual rowdy shouting of a fight starting. Elisa stiffened, knowing she would need to go inside if there was blood-feud conflict coming nearer, but she couldn't see anything other than the usual empty alleyways, even as the voices got louder. For several long moments, Elisa continued searching, but nothing moved in her periphery short of her blonde hair waving with the wind. Strange, she muttered, content to stay put for the meanwhile. Elisa flipped to the next page. The folder had been selected at random after she poked her head into her father's office for the briefest second and saw it lying on his desk. She had heard rumors of communist spies infiltrating the white flowers and was curious. Roma had been busy lately, though Elisa wasn't sure if he was looking into the same communist spies or something else. No one ever told Elisa anything. No one ever paid her attention at all unless it was to barge in on her and tell her that her tutors were here. Unfortunately, Elisa didn't think she had stolen anything very relevant. The folder contained profiles on the Kuomintang, but nothing past basic information. Some news clippings on Chiang Kai-shek. Some maps from spies who were tracking the northern expedition. The only thing that seemed briefly interesting was an investigation into General Xu, who had little information made public about his life. By the time Elisa scanned to the end, however, all she had gathered was that General Xu had a bastard son. Which was entertaining but hardly helpful. Hey! Elisa set the file aside and peered down from the roof. With that shout catching her attention, now she could see the fighting, though it seemed not to be a fight at all. She squinted, trying to pick out exactly what was coming in her direction, and only when she saw the signs did she realize that perhaps it was not a blood feud conflict moving down the main road but a worker's protest. Oh, Elisa said under her breath. That makes more sense. She tucked the folder under her arm, then gathered up the plate and the fork. In a hurry, she skittered across the roof, carefully lowering herself over the edge with the one hand she had free and sliding the whole way down upon one of the exterior poles. She landed in the thin alley around the back of the apartment complex, her shoes squelching hard in the mud, her elbow thwacking against a pot of flowers growing upon one of the first-floor windowsills. It wouldn't do to be spotted waving this folder around at the front of the house, and so she would merely use a back entrance, or else. Elisa stopped when a figure stepped in her path. Before she even had time to run, the bag came down over her head. In white flower territory, the protests reached all-time heights, spilling over the footpaths and wreaking havoc in the buildings. When Roma exited the safe house he had been visiting, another stop on his search for the identity of the white flower Frenchman, he was almost impaled by a shovel. By God, Roma spat, hurrying to the side. The worker only eyed him, not seeming very sorry. Why would he be? There were no other gangsters in sight to put a stop to this. With another muttered curse, Roma hurried back home, staying close to the buildings. His father should have sent men out for crowd control. Their numbers should have gathered by now, fighting back against the rioters with weaponry. So where were they? Roma ducked into the alleyway that took him to headquarters a hand above his head to protect himself from dirty laundry water. A heavy drop landed on his palm right as another colossal shout echoed down the road, driving unease into his bones. 
it seemed nonsensical that he was spending time searching for the Frenchman when there had not been an attack since the train cart. When instead all that had been wreaking havoc across Shanghai was the blood feud or the rioters, and as far as he knew, not a soul in the White Flowers had a plan of action to combat that sort of discord instead. You're full of nonsense. Roma frowned, closing the front door after himself. The loud bang did not interrupt the voices shouting from the living room. A wave of heat from the radiators immediately warmed his stiff skin, but he did not shrug his coat off. He wandered into the living room, following the shouting, and found Benedict and Dimitri in the heat of an argument, a plate smashed to pieces by Dimitri's feet, as if someone had thrown it. What is going on? Roma asked, for what felt like the umpteenth time that day. That's what I want to know too, Benedict replied. He stepped back, crossing his arms. Elisa is missing. An ice-cold sensation swept down Roma's spine. I beg your pardon? I heard her yell, Benedict seethed. From somewhere outside the house. And when I went to investigate, guess who the only person present was? Oh, don't be tiring, Dimitri sneered. I heard no children screaming. Nor any ruckus past the chaos on the streets. Perhaps you are imagining things, Benedict Ivanovich. Men who do not assert themselves tend to. Roma did not hear the rest of whatever foolish thing Dimitri was surely to say. He was already charging up the stairs with a roar in his ears, taking two at a time until he was on the fourth floor, charging into Elise's bedroom. Indeed, as Benedict had said, it was empty. But that didn't mean anything. Elisa was always disappearing for large blocks of time. For all he knew, she was hidden in some air duct across the city, biting into an egg roll and having the time of her life. She's not in her room. I already checked. Benedict's voice traveled up the staircase before he did, emerging with his hands buried in his hair. It's hardly unusual, Roma said. Yes. Benedict bit down on his cheeks, turning his face gaunt. Yet I heard her yell. Dimitri is right on one thing at least, there is plentiful yelling outside. The streets are rioting. I can hear yelling right now. But Benedict only gave Roma an even look. I know what Elise's voice sounds like. The certainty was what had Roma on edge. Acting on a sudden instinct, he made a sharp pivot for his room. He didn't know why that was the first place he thought to check, but he did, easing his door open gently. Benedict was close on his heels, peering in curiously too. Three things became immediately apparent, one after the other. First, Roma's room was freezing. Second, it was because his window had been pulled open. Third, there was a letter fluttering on the window ledge, pinned down by a thin blade. A wave of goosebumps broke out all down Roma's arms. Benedict hissed in a breath, and when Roma didn't make a move to go fetch it, he did the honors instead, tearing the blade out and unfolding the letter. When he looked up, his face was void of blood. Moi diadia samic chestnik pravel, Benedict read. Cogden need v shut kozain mog? He didn't have to finish it. Roma knew the next two lines that were coming. On Yuvazhat Sebi Azastavil, he intoned. I lush by Dumit ni mog. The opening verse to Eugene on again. Roma marched forward and took the letter, immediately crinkling the edges with his grip. Past the famous lines of poetry, the letter proceeded. I hear dueling is the most noble way to kill someone. It's about time this blood feud earned some nobility, don't you think? Meet me in a week's time. And I'll give her back. And beneath the text, there was a flourish of a signature, leaving no doubt who had devised this masterful scheme. They have taken Elisa, Roma rasped aloud to Benedict, though Benedict already knew. Tyler Kai has taken Elisa. 28. Rosalind was awake, but she was unresponsive. At this point, Juliet was almost getting worried, wondering if the injuries had extended to her mind, too. Could you give us a moment? Juliet called to the scarlet standing by Rosalind's bedroom door. He had his hands folded in front of him, rigid and on guard. I'm afraid not, 
Miss Kai, he said. Your father said to keep watch. I'm already here keeping watch, so can't we have some privacy? The Scarlet only shook his head. Whatever information you extract has to go straight to Lord Kai. Juliet swallowed her huff of annoyance. And does my own father suspect I would keep it from him? Your father never suspected his niece, either, and yet here we are. Juliet stood up from her chair, her fists clenched. The Scarlet paused, eyeing her stance. It wasn't as if Juliet's trigger-happy fingers were unknown to the gang. They had all heard the stories, and they had all seen the results, what mattered now was whether he feared Juliet's immediate threat more, or the eventual consequences of not following Lord Kai's exact instructions. I will stand outside, with the door open a crack, the scarlet relented. He stepped out, and tugged at the door, the hinges squeaking. Juliet flopped back into the plush chair. Rosalind had hardly blinked through the whole exchange. On any other day, she would have made some comment about Juliet being more bark than bite. Now she only stared, a glaze over her eyes. Her cousin was in pain, Juliet knew. The wounds on Rosalind's back were severe, and Kathleen had almost swooned at the sight when the doctor was dressing them last night. Juliet was torn between sympathy and frustration. Torn between absolute horror that this had happened and a complete lack of understanding over how this had happened. Perhaps it made her a bad person, a bad friend, a bad cousin. Even while Rosalind was like this, so pained and dazed that she was reduced to absolute silence, Juliet couldn't help but feel betrayed that Rosalind had lied to her. And she didn't know if it was because this city had hardened her or if her heart had always been like this, cold, brittle, turning away with the first sign of disloyalty. Juliet was a liar too. When it came to telling the truth, Juliet was perhaps the most corrupt of them all, but that didn't stop her from flinching instinctively when she was dealt lies in response. I promise to protect you, Juliet said quietly. But not like this, Rosalind. No answer. She hadn't expected one. It was copies of your correspondences that they dug up at the post office. That's how you were found out. Not sightings, not rumors. Simple pen to paper and your handwriting. Juliet blew out a frustrated breath. Was the merchant business all false, then? Is there even a lover, or did you play spy for no reason? Suddenly, Rosalind's eyes swiveled to Juliet, her gaze sharpening for the first time. You would have done the same, Rosalind rasped. Juliet sat up straighter. She looked to the door, to the slight gap left ajar. What? I love him, Rosalind mumbled. A bead of sweat had broken out along her hairline. She was delirious, probably running a fever. I love him, that is all. Who? Juliet demanded. Rosalind, you must. It doesn't matter, she interrupted, almost slurring her words. What does any of it matter? It is done. It is done. None of this was making any sense. Even if this lover was a white flower, what was the point of protecting a regular member? What consequence would there be, short of having him on a scarlet hit list? He couldn't be high up. It certainly wasn't Roma, and it wasn't Benedict. If not a Montagog, then why the torment? Why did Rosalind squeeze her eyes shut as if the world were bearing upon her? A sudden knock on the door. Juliet jolted her heart hammering in her chest, as if she had gotten caught doing something bad. The Scarlet poked his head back in, scanning the scene. She expected him to remark on Rosalind's mumblings, but instead. Telephone call for you, Miss Kai. Juliet nodded, then got to her feet, reaching out to pull Rosalind's blankets a little higher. Rosalind hardly stirred. She only closed her eyes, shivering and shivering, even once Juliet left the room, shutting the door after herself. Don't bother her, she warned the Scarlet. Let her sleep. You're going too easy on traitors, he called after her. Juliet thinned her lips, proceeding down the hallway. He was right. They were going too easy on her, Juliet was going too easy on her. 
and because Juliet had been the one to interrupt the whipping, her father would give the task to her just to teach her a lesson. If Rosalind gave no information soon, then it would be on Juliet to uncover why her cousin had betrayed them, by whatever means necessary. Juliet swallowed hard, approaching the telephone. She had no doubt she could do it. She had never hesitated to garrote and cut her way through the other scarlets that her father had sent her after, whether for rent money or a quick answer on a trade receipt. The question now was whether she wanted to, whether she believed that this was a stain on her conscience too large to bear. Juliet picked up the receiver and pressed it to her ear. Way. Miss Kai. The voice was speaking English. And it sounded like. Roma? An uncomfortable cough. Close, but no. It's Benedict. Juliet released a tight breath, pushing back her disappointment. She told herself it was because she had been expecting Roma to have found the Frenchman, not because she wanted to hear Roma's voice. Did something happen, she asked, lowering her volume. A quick glance over her shoulder showed her there was no one else in the hallway, but that didn't mean no one was listening in on her conversation. Define what something is, Benedict replied, his voice pitching low too. I've been meaning to contact you for days, but this is the first time I managed to shake Roma off. Your cousin took his sister. For a long moment, Juliet did not comprehend what Benedict Montagov was talking about. Then, as the words registered, she spluttered, What? Rosalind took Elisa? No, no, Benedict rushed to correct. English was far too simple a language for familial relations, and he sounded confused that she had leaped to that conclusion. Your Tongdi. Kai Tile. Now Roma has torn through the whole city looking for Elisa, but she's nowhere to be found. I figured that when his back was turned I may as well ask if you knew anything. Juliet pressed a hand to her eyes, biting back the burning urge to scream. Of course Tyler would pull a stunt like this now. As if one wayward cousin wasn't enough. Now another had to go poke at the blood feud. I do not, Juliet replied bitterly. I did not even know that he had taken her. Is she safe? He cannot harm her, won't harm her. She will have to remain safe and alive if he is to get his chance at killing Roma. Juliet almost dropped the receiver. I beg your pardon? She looked around again. Two messengers were on the landing of the stairs, giving her a suspicious look. Juliet forced herself to refrain from shouting. How do you mean? Benedict was unspeaking for a long moment. It almost seemed he was regretful to have to deliver this news. A duel, Miss Kai. If Roma can't find Elisa in three days' time, then he's going to fight a duel with Tyler to get her back. Juliet found Tyler hours later, among the dimly illuminated tables at Bailman. It seemed like decades had passed since she was last here with Roma, like the city had shifted and grown so much wider underneath her feet. The dance hall, however, was as full as ever. A place like Bailman would probably never fully clear out, even if there was war outside. Scatter, she spat at the men surrounding him, seating herself opposite her cousin. They all looked to Tyler for instruction. Juliet's hand was already inching for the garrote wire around her wrist in case she needed it, but then Tyler nodded, and the four around him walked away, eyeing Juliet with a hint of disdain. What can I do for you? Tyler asked. He leaned back into his seat, hands splayed on the armrests. In front of him, he had three empty drink glasses, but he did not look in the least bit inebriated. He hadn't been here for long. The moment a messenger reported the sighting to Juliet, she had rushed over immediately. Don't do it, Juliet said plainly. It was never worth it, and it's not worth it now. Tyler picked up one of the empty glasses in front of him. He waved it in slow circles, like there was some invisible liquor inside that Juliet could not see. I was wondering how long the news would take to reach you, he replied, watching the glass refract light. Longer than I thought, I must admit. Not all of us have as many ears on the city as you do. Ah, but instead, you have a direct line to the Montagovs. Juliet's blood turned cold. 
So this was what it was. Tyler had finally decided to call her bluff. With a quick tug, she snatched the glass out of her cousin's hold. He was not to look at the dance floor, at the shimmering walls, at the phantom drinks. She forced him to look at her. I assume you have been reading your Pushkin, she said. Russian duels allow for seconds, and seconds are allowed to ask the aggressor whether they would like to apologize instead. So I ask, Tyler, return Elisa and let this go. It is not worth your life. Tyler let out one short laugh. It did not have the delirious ring that echoed around the rest of the dance hall, heightened by the dark night and erratic music. It was laughter hedged in ice, a sound that came from predators watching their traps snap into place. What are you thinking? As quick as his humor came, it was gone. Tyler leaned into the table. Who asked you to speak on Roma Montagov's behalf? Who asked for you to be his second? Juliet's fists tightened. One of her fingers crept around her wire again, not to use it, but just to ground herself, just to twist the thread hard around her finger until the pain neutralized the hot ire burning in her throat. It was merely a turn of phrase. Tyler stood up. Don't lie to me. There was no glee in his voice, not this time. He was taking it seriously, anointing himself as some overseer of Juliet's loyalties. You can act as my second, and you can either let this play out or forfeit the Scarlet Gang to me now. Juliet lunged across the table in a fury, but Tyler met her just as fast. Her fist halted in midair, Tyler's sudden grip on her wrist stopping the blow from landing on his nose. You're out of your mind, Juliet hissed. He is just as likely to kill you. You are not invulnerable. I'm not, Tyler agreed. But I am a scarlet. And right now, that is more than can be said about you. He pushed her fist away harshly, then tugged at his coat in preparation to leave. Juliet, meanwhile, grabbed hold of the table, steadying not only her physical body but her rapidly spinning mind. Monday morning, Tongjia, Tyler said. Right outside the border of the settlement, by the Suzhou Creek, shall we say? Don't be late. 29. I can't talk him out of it, Benedict Montagov said. Juliet glanced at him. They were standing alongside the Huangpu River, looking out into the water. Two days until the duel, and the weather was starting to turn warm, or perhaps it was the glint of the sun over the choppy waves that made the day seem overly golden. How strange it was that Benedict would agree to meet her like this, hands stuck in his pockets, unflinching when she arrived. He maintained his birth, certainly. Even in making nice, there might always be a part of him that thought Juliet could shoot at any moment. But still, he had arrived. He had arrived and was sharing information like they were old friends, united on a cause. You're sure that we cannot break Elisa out? I don't know where she is, Juliet replied. This city is too big. Just as I can hide Marshal Seo, Tyler can hide Elisa Montagova for as long as he wishes. Then there is no way around it, Benedict said plainly. Tyler will get the duel he wants. Juliet took a deep, deep inhale, holding it in her throat. He has dictated that it will be a Russian duel, so they both only get one shot, she said, her words coming out as a croak. But this is Roma and Tyler. Someone is going to die. In the duels of stories, that one shot often went awry, striking the ground instead, piercing through a cap instead. But neither Roma nor Tyler was capable of such ineptitude. It's worse, Benedict said. If we're really going by the old rules, the person who challenged the duel receives first shot. What are the chances that Tyler will miss? Juliet squeezed her eyes shut, bracing against the intense prickling that had started up in her head. The wind was not helping. The wind was luring out what terror she was trying to clamp in, asking for a dance. None, she whispered. Absolutely none. She didn't want to see this unfold. Scarlet against white flower. Family against her whole heart, beating red and bloody. You can talk him out of it, Juliet. Juliet startled, opening her eyes again and turning to look at Benedict Montagov. He had switched to using her first name. 
perhaps he didn't mistrust her as much as it seemed. I have tried. Tyler won't listen to me. Not Tyler. Her stomach dived, wondering if Benedict was implying what she thought he was. When the wind blew across her face this time, it was as frigid as ice. A tear had tracked down her cheek, running sharply and quickly, dropping to the concrete before it could be seen. They were silent for a few moments while the bund rumbled around them, with Benedict looking out into the river and Juliet looking at him, wondering exactly how much he knew. She got her answer when Benedict caught her gaze and asked, Why don't you tell him? Tell him what, she replied. She knew, of course. The truth. Tell him the truth. Benedict had been at the hospital that day. He had seen Roma's unwillingness to walk away from Juliet. It was not hard to put together what they were to each other. Lovers. Liars. It is not like Roma cannot keep a secret, Benedict said. He cares little for his own life because he cares so much about everyone else's. He would throw himself in harm's way for Elisa because she's all he has left. But if he knows he still has you, he might be less eager to rush into death. Tell him you lied. Tell him Marshall is alive. He'll have to find a different plan. Juliet shook her head. Pretty as it might be to think it all came back to this, to her, to love, that was one mere fracture on a whole web of shattered glass. It won't do anything, she replied quietly. Besides, I am not afraid of him revealing to the world that Marshall is alive. I am afraid of him forgiving me. Benedict swerved to face her. He looked aghast at her words. Whatever is there to be afraid of? You don't understand. Juliet hugged her arms to herself. So long as he hates me, we are safe. If we love again, this city may just kill us both for daring to hope. She would be saving him from one strike of death just to push him right into another. Indeed, Benedict's long silence seemed to say, I don't understand. Juliet had watched Benedict walk into the safe house in search of Marshal Seo. She had almost taken a bullet to the face in Benedict's vengeance for Marshal Seo. She knew that Benedict understood fear. Fear of love and all the ways that it might not come back, all the ways that it could hurt. But he didn't fear a blood feud, and Juliet was glad he had been spared from at least one terrible thing. Spit it out, Benedict Montagov, she whispered when the silence drew on. Benedict turned his back to the river. I think, he said eventually, so faintly that it seemed like his mind was elsewhere, you do yourself a disservice by refusing to hope. Before Juliet could think to respond, Benedict had already given her a friendly pat on the shoulder and was walking away, leaving her standing at the bund, one lone girl with her coat billowing in the wind. Kathleen had leafed through the correspondences, read the information that had been passed on. There was no doubting it anymore, no matter which direction one looked at it from. All the times Lord Kai had made threats to the Scarlet Gang, warning of a spy in the inner circle. All the times he had gone around the house, making note of which relatives resided within earshot of his meetings, cutting down their numbers one by one in hopes that he had managed to purge the spy out. It had been Rosalind. It had always been Rosalind. And Kathleen wanted answers. She trekked up the stairs, single-minded in her task. Her sister had promised. Even oceans apart, it had been her, Rosalind, and Juliet, promising to protect one another, promising that they were untouchable so long as they stuck together. What was possibly more important than that? Kathleen stopped outside Rosalind's door ignoring the scarlet standing guard. She knocked, her knuckles coming down harshly enough to hurt. Rosalind, open the door. She's hardly in a position to be walking around, the scarlet said. Just go in. No, Kathleen managed. No, I want her to get up and look me in the eye. Never had Kathleen felt such treachery stab her through the gut. She understood if Rosalind had lost her loyalty to the Scarlet Gang. She understood if Rosalind had finally snapped, determined to ruin the Kai name after years and years of being kept out from the core of the family. That alone was something Kathleen could forgive, even if it was a slap to Juliet's face. 
what Kathleen couldn't comprehend was why she hadn't been told. Rosalind, she snapped once more. She was answered with silence. Too much silence. When she finally tried to open the door, it was locked. How long has it been since you checked in on her? Kathleen demanded. The scarlet blinked, staring at the handle that wouldn't turn. Merely an hour. Merely an hour? Something was wrong. That much was immediately clear. The scarlet quickly waved for Kathleen to take a step back. She shifted out of the way, and the scarlet kicked the door hard, blowing it off its hinges with a thud. The door whipped back against the wall and the room came into view, an empty bed, a chair pushed over, and the window wide open, the gossamer curtains blowing in the breeze. Kathleen rushed to the window. There was a rope hanging over the ledge, made entirely of bedsheets, secured to one of the legs of the four-poster bed. It trailed down, down, down to the flower beds below, where the roses were trampled into the soil. Kathleen heaved a long, bitter sigh. She made a run for it. If Roma hadn't been polishing his pistol in the storage room on the ground floor, he wouldn't have heard the rustle in the alley outside. The window was pulled open, the afternoon sunlight pouring into the dusty corners, reflecting off the brass lamps. When he set the cloth down, he heard a splash and then a quiet curse. It sounded like a girl whimpering in pain, footsteps coming nearer and nearer. Roma's immediate thought was that it was Elisa, that she had managed to escape and had found her way back home. Without even thinking, Roma pushed the window as wide as it would go and climbed through, his shoes clunking down on the wet clay ground outside. Nothing on the northern side. He spun around and saw Rosalind Lang, dressed in what looked like a nightgown, a heavy coat thrown over her shoulders. Roma resisted the urge to rub his eyes, wondering if he was hallucinating. His lack of sleep in the last few days might finally be getting to him, because if Rosalind's presence here wasn't strange enough, her bedraggled state certainly was. Then a beat passed, and Rosalind pulled a pistol from her coat. She raised it fast, seeming to expect a fight. Roma didn't return the gesture. He only raised his hand slowly and said, Hello. What are you doing here? There was humor in this, it wasn't lost on him despite the utterly unhumorous situation. Once upon a time, before Roma met Juliet, before Roma rolled a marble at her feet and fell in love with her, he had been sent into Scarlet Territory with another mission. He had been sent in for Rosalind. That was why his father had started to suspect him in the end. Rosalind Lang had become the talk of the town as the best dancer the Scarlet Burlesque Club had ever seen, and there had been plans for Roma to mingle into the Scarlet crowds to get closer to Rosalind and obtain scarlet information under the guise of a great, star-crossed love affair. Instead, Roma had heard rumors of Juliet Kai's return to Shanghai and had switched gears while crossing onto scarlet territory, wanting to see this terrible scarlet air for himself. He hadn't stood a chance. The moment he saw Juliet Kai for the first time, saw that smile playing on her lips, standing there at the bund, it was a done matter. That false star-crossed love affair pivoted and turned real. Roma would claim, in reporting back, he hadn't had any luck with their plan, yet he kept slinking into scarlet territory regardless. Of course his father caught on. How strange it was to find Rosalind Lang here, mere paces away from his father's domain, five years later. One shout, he said when Rosalind kept the pistol pointed in his direction. That's all it takes before white flowers rush out of the house and you're riddled with bullets. Think carefully, Miss Lang. About what? Rosalind managed. Her hand was trembling. I may think carefully and shoot you, or I may forget to think entirely and shoot you. Roma frowned. When he took a step closer, he saw the redness in her eyes, like she had been freshly crying. Teach me how one should forget to think he remarked. That sounds like a feat most valuable. He did not know what he was quite stalling for. It didn't seem right, somehow, to draw forth a crowd of white flowers and kill Rosalind Lang. Perhaps it was because he did not dislike her sister, and Roma had no inclination to bring hurt onto Kathleen Lang. 
Perhaps it was because she reminded him of Juliet. Don't think I won't shoot, Rosalind spat. Shout for help. Do it. Roma did nothing. He only stood there, frowning. What could she possibly be doing here? Finally, Rosalind gave up, a fresh tear tracking down her face as she lowered the gun. How much easier it would have been, she whispered, if it had been you instead. How good you are. How noble. Rosalind quickly pressed the back of her hand to her lips, like she was stopping herself from saying more. With a hard blink to clear her eyes of tears, she charged forward and hurried by, her shoulder brushing Roma's as she passed. Roma stared on even after she disappeared, fixated on the mouth of the alleyway as if mere concentration could dissolve his bewilderment. Maybe he should have shot her. It would have been what Juliet deserved. An eye for an eye. A life for a life. Roma shook his head. But that wasn't who he was. It wasn't who he wanted to be. The Scarlet Gang had taken Elisa, and he would get her back honorably. The Scarlet Gang wanted to stoop low, and he would steer in an entirely new direction. He had washed his hands with enough blood. He was tired of it. Tired of the smell that permeated into his sleep, tired of hating so deeply that it burned him from the inside out. Quietly, Roma climbed back in through the window. 30. The sky was overcast, dark enough that the morning almost seemed to be nearing night. That would have been too much to ask for. If the whole day could simply skip past itself, then no duel could be fought. But here they were, standing by the Sujo Creek under clouds as plump and heavy as waterlogged laundry. Juliet couldn't make sense of how quiet it was, how there hardly seemed to be anyone present today on the roads. In the distance, the large gasworks factories sat utterly idle, not a single worker to be seen. Was there something happening that she did not know about? Some rally gathering all the numbers elsewhere in the city that she was not aware of? Look alert, Juliet. Juliet cast a wary eye to Tyler as he hovered at the end of the alley, ready for the very moment that the Montagovs appeared. Directly ahead, the creek flowed on, filled with fishing boats and houseboats that seemed to sit unoccupied. I don't suppose we're following the actual dueling code, are we? she asked. Because there are quite literally five hundred rules, and my Russian vocabulary only goes so far. In answer, Tyler pulled something from his pocket and tossed it Juliet's way. She caught it swiftly, the pages crumpling underneath her fingers. The cover was faded, but its text was still legible surrounded by a border decoration, Yevgeny Onegin. Thirty-two paces, Tyler replied evenly. We can make that trash bag a barrier. Juliet glanced over her shoulder, checking on Elisa again. The girl stood under the grip of two of Tyler's men. Another two scarlets were posted at the other end of the alley. They were standing guard in case the white flowers decided to rush in from the back roads and summon a turf war but Roma would never be so thoughtless. There was no possible victory picking a fight within such a small space, surrounded by high walls and tiled rooftops that jutted into either side. All that could possibly suit a place like this was a duel. Thirty-two paces. A barrier in the middle, which the dueler on each side could approach, but could not retreat from once they had stepped forward. Tyler had one shot. If he missed, Roma could compel him right to the barrier, and when Roma took his returning shot, there was only one outcome possible. At such proximity, Roma could only strike true. But that required Tyler missing first. And even at thirty-two paces, Juliet wasn't sure if it was possible. She could only hope that they wouldn't advance to the barrier. That they would both stay far, far from each other, and both would miss and this duel would end with honor restored and without death, with Elisa returned to the white flowers and Tyler mollified. An utter joke, Juliet thought. Her heart was thudding a storm in her chest. Never could that happen. So how was this going to end? Hey, Juliet said, stepping closer to Elisa. You need anything? Thirsty? Elisa shook her head. She tried to tug her arm out of her captor's hold, but it was a weak effort, 
she had long given up trying to escape. I just want to go home, she said frostily. Juliet swallowed hard. You will. She placed the copy of Tyler's novel at Elise's feet. Look after this for me, would you? Tyler had promised to give Elisa back at the duel's end, regardless of the result. So far, he certainly seemed to have kept his word. Elisa was unharmed, at most, she only looked annoyed to be here. Perhaps, it occurred to Juliet suddenly, Elisa didn't even know that her brother was being summoned for a duel. Footsteps sounded from the road outside the alleyway. Juliet inhaled sharply and straightened, her fists clenching hard. If Elisa didn't know why she was here, she would soon. Roma and Benedict appeared. They were visibly tense, coats pulled up to their necks to brace against the cold. For a moment, Juliet wondered if Roma might be wearing something protective underneath, but then he unbuttoned his coat, showing merely a pristine white shirt. There would be no tricks here. Tyler would see through any attempt. Tyler, Juliet snapped. Her voice drew Roma's attention, summoning his eyes to the back, where Elisa was being held. He lurched forward, but Benedict grabbed his arm, warning him against any sudden movements. Another cold gale blew into the alley. The Montagovs were twin reflections of the same picture, one ablaze as a study of contrasts and shadows, the other a faded, blonde replicant. No need to chide me, Tyler replied, striding toward her. I'm getting into position. Just as he started to walk, there was a loud bang. From nearby, and everybody in the alley flinched. No matter how blasé Tyler acted, he was just as tense as Juliet was. Where Juliet stood taut in fear, he stood white-knuckled to prepare for blood. Only a rickshaw runner, I'm sure, Juliet said. She offered Elisa another glance, trying to communicate with her eyes that everything would be all right, before walking to meet Benedict in the middle of the alley. As seconds, this was supposed to be their last chance to communicate on behalf of the duelers, to resolve the matter and walk away. Any success? Benedict murmured. Juliet shook her head. No luck. What about with Roma? He won't back down. Knowing that they were speaking about him, Roma kept his gaze trained on Juliet. His expression was blank, revealing nothing. Roma, Juliet whispered. She knew that he could hear her. Even if she mouthed every word, Roma could probably read it. Don't do it. I must, he said. There was no other argument. It was as simple as that. The blood feud was fated to run deep. Even Roma, who had hated the idea of it, couldn't resist its draw. It would pull him in, force him to kill. Remember what you used to say, Juliet wanted to scream. Aster inclinant, said non obligant She remained still, her breath caught in her throat. Her heart was pounding, so loud that it had to be audible, so loud that it was all she could hear. But Roma, Roma only idly turned and took his position at the end of the alley, sparing no second glance at Juliet or Benedict. The moment Juliet turned on her heel and started to walk, Benedict snapped to attention too. He hurried to Roma and grabbed him by the elbow, hissing something that Juliet could no longer catch. With every three steps, she glanced over her shoulder, trying to make sense of what was happening, but each time, Roma did not look responsive. He only shook his head and brushed his cousin off. Tyler, Juliet called. Step behind me, Tyler replied. He did not look in Juliet's direction. Unless you want to be within firing range? One breath in. One breath out. Tyler. This time Tyler did give her his attention, his pistol dangling at his side. Yes. And Juliet's tongue stalled. What was she to say? Was she to beg for Roma's life? Was she to plead, drop to her knees, do all that Tyler expected her to do as that weak-hearted girl he had never thought could lead? Juliet swallowed hard. She could not. She would not. She was the heir to the Scarlet Gang. Heir of mobsters and merchants and monsters, each and every one of them, blood frothing at the mouth. She kneeled to no one. Tyler smiled. 
Take your place, then. But God, she wished she weren't. She wished she could just be a girl. Juliet walked to the back of the alley, stopping beside Elisa. By now Elisa was starting to frown. She was putting together the pieces, watching Roma and Tyler face each other at opposite ends of an alley, pistols in their hands, as Benedict said, Tyler Kai. You may approach the barrier at your own pace. What's happening? Elisa demanded suddenly. Is this a duel? A crack dashed across Juliet's heart. She felt the gouge form like it was a physical sensation. Don't look, Juliet said to Elisa. Tyler was walking far too fast. The fear of a Russian duel was that the first shooter would miss, that the closer they had approached the barrier for their own shot, and closer they were when it became their opponent's turn. But Tyler did not seem to have that worry at all. Tyler kept going, and going, and going, until he had closed in on the barrier entirely, his shoes stopping by the trash bag. What do you mean don't look? Elisa shrieked. She was struggling, squirming like her life depended on it, doing everything in her effort to loosen the grip the Scarlets had on her arms. He will kill him, Juliet. Tyler will kill him. Elisa Montagova, Juliet snapped. I said look away. Tyler raised his pistol. Aimed. And just as Elisa started to scream, a shot rang into the early morning, as loud as the world ending. The scream ended abruptly. Tyler touched his chest, where a bloom of red was starting, flowing faster and faster. Roma took a step back, his eyes widening, searching the scene before him. Because he had not made the illegal shot. Juliet had. Both her hands came around her smoking pistol. There was no room for regret now. She had done it. She had done it, and she could not stop there. She turned, and with a sob choked on her tongue, she shot each and every one of Tyler's men before they had even comprehended what was happening, bullets studding their temples, their necks, their chests. The moment they were all down, Juliet threw her pistol to the ground too. Damn it! Tyler, she screamed. Tyler turned around and looked at her, really looked at her. He dropped to his knees. Fell to his side. Rolled to face the dark, dark sky. Juliet rushed forward. She had made the shot, all his men were dead, and yet still she reached out and tried to stanch his wound, as if she would be more despicable if she didn't try, as if there could possibly be any coming back from this. Why did you have to keep pushing? she cried. Why couldn't you have just left it? Tyler blinked slowly. It would have been easier if he had answered Juliet in hatred. It would have been easier if he had spat at her and called her a traitor, used any of the names that he never had any trouble labeling her with. Instead, he looked confused. Instead, he touched his weeping wound over Juliet's hands and pressed down, and when his fingers came back covered in bright scarlet, it was absolute incomprehension that marred his face, like he never thought Juliet would hurt him this way. Why, he rasped. He might have been echoing her. But Juliet knew he wasn't, he was asking a question of itself. Juliet's hands came down harder, certain that if she just pressed enough, by sheer will she could close the wound, could stop the blood, could reverse the last minute of the world. But even if she did, the city's feud would still go on. Because, Juliet said. Her voice was no louder than a bare whisper. Yet in the quiet of the alley, with only Tyler's gasps, she was all that could be heard. I love him. I love him, Tyler, and you tried to take him from me. Tyler exhaled. Something like a dry laugh shuddered from his lungs. All you had to do, he said, was it choose your people. Juliet's jaw trembled. Nothing was ever as simple as my people and your people, but to Tyler, it was. He thought himself capable of rising to the top, thought himself worthy of being the next heir, but all he had ever done in his eighteen years was act off orders from the top, tainted by the hate that ran like poison through their lives. How could she fault him for that? In that fleeting moment, Juliet closed her eyes and tried to remember a time before it all. 
a time when Tyler tossed her his apple before breakfast because she was hungry and her little fingers couldn't reach the fruit bowl. When Tyler climbed onto the roof of the house to fix the electrical wiring and was hailed a hero by the household staff. When Juliet walked into his bedroom shortly after she'd returned from New York and found him curled into himself, crying over a picture of his father. He had slammed his door in her face, but she understood. She had always understood. By the time Juliet opened her eyes and whispered, I'm sorry, Tyler was already dead. 31. Numbly, Juliet removed her hands from Tyler's body. They were coated in red up to her wrists. Her fingers were wet, slick with the viscosity of blood. For a long moment, the alley was quiet and still, frozen like a film that had become stuck on its reel. Then Elisa darted forward and flung herself at Roma, who opened his arms for her, his face shell-shocked. He stared at Juliet, Juliet stared at her hands, and the only one who seemed to have some sense remaining was Benedict, who called, Juliet, you should probably tell him now. A harsh, salt-soaked gust of wind blew at Juliet's hair, obscuring her vision when she looked up. Some faint argument had broken out afar in tandem with dimly chiming bells, striking twelve times to signal noon, each echo adding to the white noise in her ears. Just my two cents, Benedict added softly. Roma's grip tightened on Elisa. He looked between Juliet and his cousin, his brow furrowing, still unable to erase the shock in his expression. What, he managed faintly. His eyes shot to the corpses on the ground. Tell me what? Juliet rose to her feet. It was a shaky effort. It was that feeling in dreams when she couldn't push up from the ground, her bones as heavy as metal. Only before Juliet could respond, she was interrupted by another voice, one that came from above, from the roof of the building pressing in on the alleyway. That she beat me to the shot. A blur of motion landed before her with a thump. Marshal Seo turned smoothly, as if he had not leaped down two stories, tugging off the cloth around his face and offering Roma a small smile. Roma stared. And stared, and stared, and stared. Then he ran at Marshall and hugged him so tightly that he had to thump his friends back to work off his excess energy. Marshall hugged Roma just as enthusiastically in return, not at all minding the attack. You died, Roma gasped. I saw you die. Yes, Marshall replied simply, Juliet tried very hard to make sure of that. Suddenly, Roma released Marshall, his eyes snapping to Juliet. She could feel her distress emanating off her skin like a visible aura. She didn't know how to stand or where to place her hands, didn't know whether it was appropriate to try to rub the blood off or if she was to pretend she wasn't occupying an alley with three white flowers while all her scarlets lay dead around her. Roma's mouth opened. Before he could demand an explanation, Juliet was already speaking, her eyes turned back to her hands. She couldn't, couldn't look at him. I had to. Her voice cracked. Tyler had to see your hatred. He would have destroyed us if he knew I'd a Juliet broke off, her red fingers scrunching into fists. She hardly needed to elaborate. They had heard her. They all heard what she'd said to Tyler. Juliet. Juliet looked up. She lifted her chin and faked bravery, faked it like she faked every damn thing in her life, all to survive and for what? To piece together some pathetic excuse of living, surrounded by material goods and not a single shred of happiness. Her heart had never felt so heavy. It doesn't matter, Juliet said. He can't hurt us now, can he? Juliet turned away and started to walk. She could feel it, the shaking was already starting in her hands, and soon the tremors would shudder her chest, consume her whole body. She needed to leave before she could break, before her mind started to circle exactly what she had done here and how she would explain this away. Tyler was dead. Tyler's men were dead. The only person left to spin the tale was Juliet. She could say whatever she wanted, and the thought felt too big for her to comprehend. Juliet. Footsteps thundered after her. She picked up her pace a moment too late, a touch coming upon her wrist. Only as soon as Roma grabbed her arm, 
a horrific sound, came from outside the alley, from North Sujo Road, near the wide creek. They both ducked at once, heads turning toward the source. What was that? Benedict demanded. Was that gunfire? The sound came again, a spray of bullets moving even closer. Like phantoms materializing from the mists, three men suddenly ran across the mouth of the alley, quickly enough that they did not sight Roma and Juliet standing there, but not so quick that Juliet couldn't sight the red rags tied around their arms. It all seemed to happen in seconds. Where it had been quiet, the road suspiciously empty like its business occupants were taking the day off, the city suddenly roared to life, shouting at every corner, and gunfire. Constant gunfire. It's happening, Juliet said in disbelief. Today was the 21st of March, by the Western calendar. Revolution. Where are they? Where are Juliet and Tyler? Kathleen peered down the second-floor banister, frowning at the sudden commotion. The front door slammed and the volume in the foyer increased, voices shouting atop one another. Lady Kite seemed to be giving instructions, but with so many other people speaking too, she had grown inaudible. Kathleen hurried down the stairs. What's going on? she asked. Nobody paid her any attention. Lady Kai continued giving orders, her posture stick straight, her arms gesticulating, grouping men together and sending them out the door as if she were merely conducting some orchestral show. Nyang Nyang. Kathleen slid herself right in front of Lady Kai. At any other time, she would never have dared. Right now, the house was in so much chaos that her aunt couldn't tell her off. Please. Tell me what is happening. Lady Kai tried to brush Kathleen aside. Communists are acting against Kuomintang instructions for patients, she said distractedly. Separate uprisings are happening across the city in an attempt to take Shanghai for the northern expedition. It was then that Lady Kai cocked her head, looking at Kathleen properly. Aren't you our inside source on this business? I, yes, Kathleen replied, tripping over her words. She hoped she wasn't about to get the blame for this. I am your source and I've told everyone again and again that the strikes will get larger, that their numbers will rise. Nothing to worry about, Lady Kai interrupted, her no-nonsense mode returning. No matter what the communists take, the nationalists will take it back, and then it will again be in our hands. Our only problem now, she waved her hands at the nearest group of men, is finding where my daughter has gotten herself to before she gets herself killed. Kathleen watched the gangsters hurry out the door. Heard them mumble Tyler's name, Juliet's name. Rosalind was missing too. And yet there was hardly a single gangster worried. They pushed and shoved to get out, piling onto the streets while the workers caused chaos, but only because they had been given the instruction to find the younger Kais, somewhere out in the city. If Lady Kai had not commanded it, would they still care? Kathleen breathed out, stepping away from Lady Kai. Even here, at the mansion, which sat along the city's outer boundaries, there came the sound of gunfire in the distance. There came the deep, deep rumble of the ground shifting, like something colossal had just blown up. Juliet would be fine. She would not be so easily taken down. Shanghai, on the other hand, was a different question. And Rosalind, too, was another matter entirely. Kathleen pulled her coat off the rack. She merged with a group of messengers heading out of the house, piling into a car heading for the heart of the city. She needed to find Rosalind. She needed to get her sister back before this city burned down around them. Lady Kai walked upon the driveway, her arms folded, and locked eyes with Kathleen through the window of the car. When the car drove off, Lady Kai did not protest. Juliet watched a brothel owner wander out onto her balcony her silk billowing in the wind. In seconds, she was shot from below, and with a spray of red, tumbled over the railing onto the hard cement ground. The worker who had fired the bullet did not pause. He was already moving on, joining a crusade of others in their hunt for another target. Juliet slammed back inside the alley, her hand flying to her mouth, the metallic tang of the drying blood hitting her tongue. She knew violence. 
She was used to it, used to bloodshed and hatred, but this? This was on a scale wholly unknown. This was not a feud between gangs and a contained face-off. This was the whole city rising up from the gutters, and it seemed riots and protests were no longer enough. Once the workers were finished, the nationalists would come in to claim an allied victory. And depending on when the blackmailer decided to show their face, it would soon turn into a civil war fought with monsters and madness. Juliet supposed she should be grateful this revolution was merely an exercise in bullets right now. The monsters were being conserved. Squirreled away until the real claim for power. We have to go, Benedict declared. I'm sorry, Juliet, but you'll have to leave the bodies here. No matter, Juliet replied quietly, wiping at her face. Perhaps when they were found later, the workers would be blamed for the deaths. Perhaps she wouldn't need to be more terrible. She could just be a murderer instead of a murderer and a liar. Another round of heavy gunfire. They had to take the back roads out. There was no way they could venture along the main creek and not be shot immediately. Where are we going to go? Elisa whispered. There was something in her hands. She had retrieved Tyler's book, hugging it to her chest. What sort of? Marshall shushed her, then gestured for them to press against the wall, remaining very still while a group gathered close to the alley, yelling instructions at one another to fan out. This was not just an opportunity to incite chaos. With the machine guns coming out, the workers were trying to take Shanghai from the hands of imperialists and gangsters. It was exactly what both the Scarlets and the White Flowers had feared. We have a safe house two streets away, Benedict reported quietly when the gunshots seemed to move in the other direction. Let's go. Marshall touched Juliet's elbow. Come with us. Juliet startled. She could still feel Roma's eyes on her. No, she said. No, I have my own. The ground shook under their feet. Somewhere, somehow, something was blowing up. On the other side of the creek, the nearest factory's windows all shattered into dust. There was no time to lose. They needed to disperse. Juliet bent and picked up the pistol she had tossed, trying hard not to look at her cousin's body. Stay inside until this blows over. When it ends, Shanghai will not be the same city. She made to leave, and for the second time, Roma lunged out quickly and grabbed her wrist. This time Juliet finally whirled to face him, her teeth gritted. Roma, let go. I'm coming with you. The hell you are. Quit running from me, Roma snapped. We need to talk. Really? Juliet exclaimed. A bullet struck the mouth of the alley, and Juliet knew that they had been spotted. You want to talk now? While the city undergoes revolution? Behind them, Benedict and Marshall were wide-eyed, uncertain if they needed to step in and facilitate this. They could either demand that Juliet to accept it, or persuade Roma to back off, and neither option seemed very likely to have success. Only Elisa offered a little thumbs up as Roma turned over his shoulder, waiting to see if another bullet was coming. Benedict, Marshall, he said. There was a note of awe in his voice that he could at last say those two names together again, the way that things were supposed to be, the return to a normal he knew even if the world around him was splitting apart. Please take Elisa to the safe house. Roma. I'm standing here until Juliet agrees to talk, he warned. If the workers storm this alley, then they themselves can move me. Juliet stared at him, flabbergasted. You have lost your mind. True to his word, he was unmoving as Benedict and Marshall exchanged a quick nod, nudging Elisa to hurry and go. Elisa reached over to squeeze Roma's arm as they passed by, whispering a quick, stay safe, before the three of them disappeared. Then it was only Roma and Juliet, and an alley soaked in red. It is not a difficult choice, Juliet, he said. Voices now, coming right by the main road, seconds away from turning into the alley. We can leave, or we can die here. Juliet felt the press of his fingers on her wrist. She wondered if he noticed her pulse beating a cacophony under his touch. For crying out loud, 
she said darkly, shaking his grip loose so that his fingers entwined with hers instead, blood mixing on skin, pulling him away from the mouth of the alley. You are so dramatic. Just as the workers rounded into the alley and loosed their ammunition, Juliet and Roma disappeared through the narrow back passages and merged into the city. 32. Blockades were already forming on the streets, an attempt to close the concessions before the havoc traveled here, too. Roma and Juliet reached their intended destination in the nick of time, turning onto a thin street before British soldiers could rope it off. Every window they hurried past had its curtains drawn tight. The sounds of gunfire followed on their heels. Fighting would soon arrive in the vicinity. Quick, Juliet whispered, opening the door to the safe house. After accepting that he was going to keep playing vigilante, she had warned Marshall to keep his temporary residence unlocked when he was not there, to ensure that it seemed unoccupied if any scarlets were to come looking, and she was relieved to find that he had listened. This was the closest scarlet location. She figured there was no harm in taking shelter here, especially when it was outside proper international settlement territory, hovering at the edges of Jabay. Just as Roma hurried in and Juliet bolted the door, there came shouting from the British soldiers at their makeshift barricade. Their voices coursed down the street, bringing a hush upon the apartments as every resident inside waited for chaos to erupt. Are the windows boarded? Roma demanded. Juliet didn't answer, she only waited for Roma to beeline for the windows and pull at the curtains, breathing out in relief when he found them to be nailed shut with wooden panels. The darkness didn't give it away, she muttered, bringing her lighter to a candle on the table. The first echoes of shooting began outside. Perhaps Juliet should have tried to get home instead, tried to organize the Scarlets to fight back. Somehow, she had a feeling it would not make a difference. For the first time, the gangsters were not only outnumbered but vastly overpowered. Roma pulled the curtains shut tightly. He waited there for a moment, then turned around, folding his arms and leaning up against the boards. There was nowhere really to sit, Marshall had made the place cozy, but it was still as small as a crawl space. One chair, propped near the stove, and a mattress on the floor, the blankets resembling a nest atop it. Juliet opted to lean up against the door. They remained like that, on opposite ends of the room, unspeaking. Until Roma said, I'm sorry. Juliet's eyes widened a fraction. For whatever reason, there was anger roiling in her belly. Not anger at Roma. Just anger, at the world. Why are you sorry? she asked quietly. Slowly Roma inched away from the window. She watched as he trailed his fingers across the surface of the table and found no dust, a hint of fascination flashing in his eyes before his gaze flickered to the coat hanging on the wall. It seemed Roma had come to the realization that this was where Marshall had been living. Roma took another step across the room. In answer to her question, he gestured at the blood on her hands. He was still your cousin, Juliet. I'm sorry. Juliet closed her fists, then tucked them under her arms, folding her posture. Her head was a storm. She had fired on her cousin. Fired on his men, her own men, Scarlets, all of them. Still, she couldn't quite regret it. She would live with this forever, live with her cousin's blood on her hands, and in the dark of night when no one could hear her, she would cry her tears and mourn the boy he could have been. She would mourn the other Scarlets, just as she mourned the white flowers she had destroyed in the blood feud, and even more so, because their loyalty should have been their protection, and yet Juliet had turned on them. She didn't regret it. She hated it, and she hated herself. But standing there, in front of her, was the reason for everything she had done, and to look upon him alive and well was enough to push back the loathing she had for the blood on her hands for the city that had made her into this monster of a person. This kindness is disconcerting, she managed. Whatever turmoil exists in my heart, I deserve it. Roma sighed. It was a vast sigh, one that might have formed smoke had he huffed just a tad harder. You are a liar, Juliet Kai, he said. You lied to me until I wanted you dead. Juliet couldn't bear how soft his voice had grown. 
because I could not risk the consequences. I could not risk my own cousin taking your life because I was too weak to let you go. She loosened her fists, feeling the dried blood itch in the lines of her palms. And yet he pursued your death nonetheless. Roma inched forward once more. He was careful, careful even to look at her, afraid that she might bolt. You think so intently of protecting me that you did not consider whether I wanted to be protected. I would have rather died knowing you are as you are than lived a long life thinking you cruel. I am cruel. You are not. Juliet swallowed hard. How quickly he forgot. How quickly he tried to convince himself otherwise. Your mother, Roma. Oh, please, he said, I already know. He what? A tremor hastened through the room, Juliet staring at Roma and Roma staring right back. What do you mean? I know how these things work, Juliet. Roma tore a hand through his hair, exasperated. His dark locks became so must that the longer strands fell loose over his forehead, and all Juliet could think was that this stone-cold, perfect image of a boy was at last giving way for the real one underneath. I know we were a risk to each other from the very beginning. And I know you far better than you think I do. Do you? Juliet challenged. But Roma wasn't buying her pity party. He folded his arms. In what world would you have sent men after my mother, no matter how upset you were? You didn't know her. She had no personal gain to you, and if I never knew that you did it, then it wasn't to spite me, either. No, you told someone. In a fit of recklessness, you gave her a dress, however you found it, and then the blood feud did the rest of the work. Roma strode two, three steps more, stopping at arm's length, in front of her. Tell me I'm wrong. Juliet looked away, her eyes prickling with tears. Somehow, he had found the heart of the matter and told it so generously that it seemed undeserved. You're not wrong, she managed. Roma nodded, his shoulders straight and assured. By flickering candlelight, he appeared all the more sturdy, like nothing could phase through his bravado. Only as Juliet tried to blink away the emotion threatening at her eyes, she peered at Roma and found that he was struggling to do exactly the same. We live, he said, with the consequences of our choices. I know that better than anyone, Juliet. I am the only one in this entire damn city who feels exactly as you do. You should have known that I would understand. He didn't have to say it aloud. They both knew. Nurse. He was talking about Nurse, and the explosion at the Scarlet House. You're right, Juliet said tightly. You do know. You know that all we do is take from each other, break each other's hearts in turn, and hope the next time won't shatter us completely. When does it end, Roma? When will we realize that whatever sordid affair we have between us isn't worth the death and the sacrifice, and... Do you remember what you said? Roma interrupted. That day in the alley, when I told you my father made me set the explosion. Of course she remembered. She was incapable of ever forgetting a single moment between them. Depending on how she looked at it, it was either a great talent or a mighty curse. Juliet's voice shrank to a whisper. We could have fought him. Roma nodded. He swiped hard at his eye, getting rid of the moisture there. Where has that attitude gone, Juliet? We keep bending to what the blood feud demands of us letting go of what we want in fear that it will be taken first. Why must we wonder when this mutual destruction will end? Why don't we fight it? Why don't we just end it? A bitter laugh crept up from her lungs, echoing faintly into the room. You pose questions that you know the answer to, she said. I am afraid. She was so damn afraid of being punished for her choices, and if it were easier to shut down, then why would she not? If there were an easier way to live, to choose ease over pain, how could she not? But Juliet knew she was lying to herself. Once, she used to be braver than this. Roma closed that final breath of space between them. His fingers grasped her chin, and he turned her gaze upon his. Juliet did not frighten, did not jolt out of the way. She knew his touch. Knew it to be gentle, 
even when it had tried being violent some few days or weeks or months ago. What are you afraid of? Roma Montagov asked. Juliet's lips parted. She exhaled a short, abrupt breath. The consequences, she whispered, of love in a city ruled by hate. Roma drew his hand away. He remained quiet. A terrified part of Juliet wondered if this was it, if they had reached the end of the line. Try as she might to tell herself they were better off if she and Roma were finished, that future flashed suddenly before her eyes, one without this love, one without this fight, and the sorrow almost cleaved her in two. Answer me something, Roma said suddenly. His words sounded eerily familiar, and with delay, Juliet realized why. He was echoing her. He was echoing her that day behind the newspaper building, that day she had collapsed in the grass with hands just as bloody as the ones she held in front of her now. Do you love me? Juliet felt her heart wrench. Why are you asking, she croaked. Less than an hour ago, you wanted me dead. I said I wanted you dead, Roma confirmed. I never said I didn't love you. Juliet gave a weak splutter. There's a difference? Yes. His fingers twitched, like he was going to reach for her again. Juliet. I love you, she whispered. And in echo of his words so many months ago, I have always loved you. I'm sorry I lied. Roma was unmoving for one slow thud of a heartbeat. Their eyes locked, bearing the truth their words left behind. And when Juliet's lips started to tremble, Roma finally pulled her into a tight embrace, so tightly that Juliet squeaked, but she clutched him back just as fiercely. In the end, this was all that they were. Two hearts, pressed as close as they dared, shadows melding into one by the flickering candlelight. I missed you, Dora Gaea, he whispered against her ear. I missed you so much. The city was in chaos, and yet Kathleen wandered the streets in some dreamlike trance, left alone by the workers with rifles, left alone by the gangsters with broadswords. It was as if they did not see her, but they did, she made eye contact with each and every one of them, and they merely looked onward, finding no reason to bother one lone girl walking like she had nowhere to be, hard shoes coming down on the rough pavement. She didn't know where to begin looking for Rosalind. She had tried the usual places, but the burlesque club was locked down and the restaurants were all barred. Their favorite shops were ransacked, windows smashed and doors torn straight off the hinges. Where else could Rosalind even go? What else could Kathleen do except walk the city and hope that some invisible string was pulling her to her sister? Kathleen put one foot in front of the other. She had always had the skill to look like she belonged somewhere. Act like she had been invited in, because if she did not, then she would be waiting forever for an invitation that was not coming. Who could have known that it would work during a revolution too? Ow! Kathleen turned around, thinking she heard a voice nearby. It sounded like a child, but why would a child be out during this time? She turned the corner and identified the source of the cry, indeed, there was a little girl, sprawled along the sidewalk. The girl dusted herself off, awkwardly brushing her palms together, then shaking the folds of her skirt. Something about her tugged at Kathleen's memory, but Kathleen couldn't immediately recall why. Are you okay? Kathleen hurried over and crouched down, the edges of her chipow brushing the dirty ground. It didn't matter, at least then she would match with the stains on the girl. Is okay, the girl said shyly. She showed Kathleen the gauze in her hands. I was sent to fetch supplies. Wanna come? Supplies? Kathleen echoed. Who was sending a little girl for supplies in the middle of revolution? When she took too long to answer, the girl took her silence for a yes and looped their hands together, dragging Kathleen along. A round of gunfire sounded from afar. Kathleen grimaced, then hurried the girl along hoping they weren't far from wherever they were going. The little girl didn't protest their hastening speed, she trotted along gallantly, and when Kathleen ducked down suddenly, moving them into an alley to avoid a group of nationalists, the girl said, I like your hair. It was then that Kathleen finally recognized the kid, 
because she had said the very same thing in one of the communist meetings. Suddenly it made much more sense. She was the child of workers. She was out here because there was nowhere else to be. I like yours too, she replied. Are we almost there? Right here. They turned into the next alley. Where the others remained empty, this one hosted a whole group of workers, judging by their state of dress, and active workers in the uprising too, if their injuries were any indication. This was some rest area, some makeshift space of recuperation, workers leaning on the walls and clutching large gashes in their torso, some sitting and cupping a palm around a bloody eye. It was hard to see, the sun was starting to set, and the city was awash in a hazy orange. Colors blended together like a rain-stained paint palette, broken bodies and fading shadows looking exactly alike. The little girl ran off, tasked with getting the gauze to wherever it was needed. Left now to her own devices, Kathleen kneeled beside a man some few years older than her, examining his bleeding forehead without being asked. That was the trick. Pretend that she had been assigned everywhere she went, avoid letting a single second of hesitation slip through. Who did this, she asked. Police or Scarlet? What's the difference, the man retorted. But neither. White flower. He pulled his knees closer to his chest and spat on the concrete beside him. We're close to taking almost all territories except Jabe. The Russian bastards are putting up a hell of a fight there. Kathleen prodded his cheek. It was bruised too, but he would survive. Head wounds bled more seriously than they actually were. Are we really? she remarked casually. The man grew more wary then. He looked her up and down, a slower appraisal than the initial quick scan when Kathleen crouched beside him. You don't look like you're a part of the cause. Kathleen stood, brushing her hands on her skirt. She gave a thin smile. And what do people of the cause look like? The man shrugged. We don't have clothes that nice, that's for sure. When the sun went down on the city, the alley felt it immediately, felt the chill sweep in and set into the bones of those already hungry and tired. This was a place of final destinations. A place people were tossed when they could go on no longer, the fire dampened in their heart. And what do you have? Kathleen asked. Impatience? Exhaustion? The man jerked back his head almost colliding with the rough brick of the wall. How dare you? Stand up, Kathleen snapped. The night stirred around her, prickling to life by the bite of her voice. You are sitting ducks here, waiting for slaughter. But... Stand up. Without her noticing, the rest of the alley had fallen quiet. The injured and tired were listening, watching Kathleen watching this girl who had come out of nowhere but sounded just like one of them. She swiveled a slow turn on her heels, and though the moon was yet to grace the skies, her eyes could pick out each and every one of their expressions. The man stood. Good, Kathleen said. Her ears perked, hearing the sound of striking batons. Police, no matter under which jurisdiction, no matter under whose control. They were coming, and coming fast. Now. She looked at the alley full of workers. Are we going to lie down and die, or are we fighting to live? The gunfire continued into the night. Juliet had figured it would surely come to an end by twilight, but the sounds did not stop even when the candle burned out and the room fell into darkness, matching the dusk outside. It's likely your white flowers who are holding the fort here, Juliet whispered, blowing at her hands. Her fingers were ice cold, but at least they were clean now, the blood scrubbed away. It's a lost cause, Roma said quietly. The thick of the fighting echoed from the north, which was white flower territory. The workers are armed. They outnumber the gangsters, and judging by the sounds outside, there could be hundreds of thousands throughout the whole city. Juliet leaned her head against the wall behind her. She and Roma were seated on the mattress huddling among the blankets to brace against the cold. Through the boarded-up window, there was only a sliver of glass uncovered, letting in a beam of light that cut a line between the two of them. She hoped her father and mother were safe. 
she hoped that the house was far enough in the outskirts of the city that it went unharmed, that the workers wouldn't think to target the Scarlet Gang there and cut down the head of the dragon. It seemed unlikely, even if the workers hated gangsters. The Scarlet Gang had their alliance with the Nationalists, and the Nationalists and Communists were still allied on paper. If the Communists had a say in it, they would instruct the workers to stay far, far away from harming the Kais. At least that was what Juliet was telling herself so she didn't lose her mind from worry. Juliet blew another hot breath onto her hands. Noting her discomfort, Roma shifted onto her side of the light beam and grasped her fingers. Juliet's first instinct was to hold on to him. When Roma gave her a wry look, biting back his amusement, she loosened her grip, letting him rub her hands to get some warmth into them. Roma, she said. The chaos outside. It won't just end tonight as it always does. It won't go back to the way it was. Roma smoothed his thumb across her wrist. I know, he replied. While we weren't watching, we have lost power. While the Scarlet Gang and White Flowers were busy chasing a blackmailer, busy maintaining their business to stay atop each other, a third threat had risen quietly among the noise. The gangsters still had weapons. People. Connections. But they would not have land to operate on. If the revolt outside was victorious, come morning, Shanghai would be a workers' city. No longer under a false government, lawless for the gangsters to run amok. No longer a self contained paradise for trade and violence. It seems so fruitless, Juliet grumbled. The communists are armed, the workers are taking the city. There has been no monster attack, no madness. Perhaps it will come once the communists clash with the nationalists, but for all we know, this blackmailer was never even a threat upon our people. We kept chasing after monsters, and politics was what swept the rug from right under our feet. Roma's hands stilled. By now Juliet's fingers were plenty warm. Still, Roma didn't let go. He held on. It's not our fault, he said. We are heirs of a criminal underworld, not politicians. We can fight monsters, not the turning tide of a revolution. Juliet huffed, but she hardly had anything worthy of argument. She leaned toward Roma, and he let her settle against his chest. What are we to do, Roma, she asked, her voice careful. What are we to do when we get out of here? Roma made an inquisitive noise. She felt the vibration against her ear. We survive. What else is there? No, that's not what I meant. Juliet lifted her head, blinking into the hazy darkness. Roma smiled the moment he peered down and met her gaze, like it was an instinct. What are we to do? On two sides of a feud, in a city that might crumble before our families stop killing each other. Roma was silent for a moment. Then he wrapped his arms around her and collapsed the both of them backward him with a firm plop and Juliet with an ungainly noise, taken by surprise. This is warmer, Roma explained, yanking the blankets over them. Juliet lifted a brow. Trying to get me into bed already? When Roma let out a soft laugh, it almost felt like the world would be okay. Juliet could fool herself into thinking the rounds of gunfire outside were fireworks, the same sort of celebration that had hurtled through the city during the new year. They could pretend it was January again, revert back to a time when the city was still. But even when it was still, it had been teetering towards something, on the brink of metamorphosis. Nothing was going to remain idle and unchanging when there was so much anger lurking just beneath the floating surface. The gangsters would no longer be the power in charge when the city outside fell quiet again, but the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers would still be at war. Juliet felt her heart sink right down to her stomach. She retrieved her hand from inside the blankets and brought it to Roma's cheek. I wish we had been born as other people, she whispered. Born into ordinary lives, untouched by a blood feud. Roma's hand came up too, curled loosely around hers to keep her touch remaining upon him. For a long while, he looked at her, taking in her eyes, her mouth, gaze roaming like he had once been starving and this now was a feast. No, Roma finally said. Then we would not have met. 
then I would have lived an ordinary life, pining for some great love I would never find, because ordinary things happen to ordinary people, and ordinary people settle for something that satisfies them, never knowing if there would have been greater happiness in another life. His voice was rough, but it was certain. I will fight this war to love you, Juliet Kai. I will fight this feud to have you, because it was this feud that gave you to me, twisted as it is, and now I will take you away from it. Juliet searched his face, searched for any hint of hesitance. Roma didn't waver. What pretty words, she whispered. She tried to play it cool, but she knew Roma could hear her breathlessness. I mean them all, Roma replied. I would engrave them onto stone if that would have you believe me more. I believe you. Juliet finally let herself smile. But you shall not engrave it onto stone, because I don't need you to take me away from the feud. I'll be running by your side. Roma rose onto his elbows. In a blink, he was hovering above her, their noses already brushing, lips so close that the proximity was itself a tangible sensation. Don't be afraid, he whispered. Not of us. Not ever. His hand brushed her neck, his thumb smoothed across her jaw. Time seemed to crawl to a stop, creating a little pocket for just the two of them. I will stare fear in the face, Juliet promised quietly. I will dare to love you, Roma Montagov, and if the city cuts me down for it, then so be it. A beat passed. Another. Then Roma pressed his lips to hers with such ferocity that Juliet gasped, the sound immediately muffled when she pushed herself up and drew closer. Despite his burning energy, Juliet felt Roma's mouth move with sincerity, felt his adoration while he trailed kisses all down her neck. Juliet, he whispered. Both of their coats came off. Roma had the zip of her dress pulled in seconds too, and Juliet lifted her arms to accommodate. My darling, darling Juliet. The dress fell to the floor. With some disbelief, Roma suddenly blinked, his eyes clearing for the briefest moment while she worked at his shirt buttons. Are you trying to impale me? he asked, pulling the knife from the sheath around her thigh and setting it aside. His shirt joined her dress on the floor. Juliet ripped the sheath off too, tossing it onto the pile. What's a little light stabbing between lovers? Juliet had intended it as a joke, but Roma turned serious, gazing at her with his dark eyes. His hand had been curled around her elbow, but now he trailed his touch of her arm, drawing goosebumps in his wake. Juliet didn't quite understand the hesitation until his fingers settled gingerly at her shoulder, tracing the newly healed wound there. The one he had made. Is it going to scar? he whispered. Let it, Juliet replied. It'll remind you that you can't get rid of me that easily. A smile quirked at his lips, but still he didn't let Juliet brush the matter away. What Juliet tried to shake off, to tamp down and forget, Roma hauled out into the light and forced them both to face. What Roma refused to combat, Juliet fought head on, dragging them both into the scuffle. That was why they worked so well together. They balanced the other depending on what the other needed. Roma leaned down. He brushed his face against hers, then pressed a kiss to her shoulder. I'm sorry, Dorigea. Chineida, Juliet whispered back, tucking an errant piece of his hair behind his ear. I'm sorry too. She pulled Roma close once more, meeting his lips. It was hard to voice the extent of their penance, hard to put into words exactly how much they needed to apologize for the bloodshed between them. Instead, they begged for a lifetime of pardon from each other through touch, through tender caresses and pounding hearts raging in tandem. With effort, Juliet finally managed to get Roma's belt off. It hit the floor beside the mattress and clanked against her knife, striking a discordant sound that made Roma jump. Juliet let out a small laugh, cupping his face. Well, don't be nervous. In the dim moonlight, Roma arched a brow. Nervous? Me? He kissed her again, intent on proving it. And again, and again. Juliet, he whispered eventually. Uh-huh. Is this okay? It's perfect. Outside, the night raged on, 
awash with warfare and terror. There was no telling when it would stop, when the shelling would cease and the picket lines would fall back. There was no telling if this city would ever be whole again. With each passing moment, the world could fall to pieces. With each passing moment, a total collapse approached, some inevitable finality that had been looming since the first lines of division were drawn in this city. Juliet breathed out, sinking her hands into the sheets. But that was not here yet. That was not the present, that was not this moment, this heartbeat of time locked in by heady breaths and gentle worship. It was distant to Juliet, and she would let it remain at a distance, so long as she could have this, here, now, perfect, her soul as boundless as the sea, her love as deep. 33. April 1927. The grass under Juliet's feet was damp, leaving dew on her polished shoes as she shifted under the shade of the tree. She scratched at her ankle, then winced when her finger caught the metal of her shoe buckle. She inspected her hand. No blood. No scratch. Instead, she felt covered in grit, an unwashable taint upon her skin. Shanghai was now under the rule of the Nationalist Army, under Chiang Kai-shek, their commander-in-chief. Juliet shouldn't have been surprised that it had come to this. He had already seized much of the country, after all, the northern expedition had been building for months, after all. But it was the workers who had ravaged the city until it was awash in red. It was the communists who had led the effort. Then the communists had asked their workers to give way when General Xu marched his men into the city and set up nationalist bases before the dust had even settled. Something was afoot. The tension was a pungent smell in the air, waiting to see whether it would be the nationalists or the communists who struck at the other first. And Juliet knew, she just knew, that the Scarlet Gang was involved, but no one would tell her how. Juliet cast a glance to her side, reaching out and putting a hand to Kathleen's wrist. Kathleen jolted, then realized what Juliet was indicating. Her cousin stopped tapping the side of her chi pao resolved to clutch her hands in front of her instead, her feet planted firmly in the short cemetery grass. Last week, most of the Scarlets had escaped the chaos on the streets relatively unharmed. There were casualties, certainly, but few enough that this was the last of their funerals. Instead of mass lives, what they had lost was control. Nansher, and all the industrial roads south of the French concession, taken. Honko, the narrow strip of land surrounded on three sides by the international settlement, taken. Wusong, jammed amid ports leading into the Huangpu and Yangtze rivers, taken. East Shanghai, taken. West Shanghai, taken. Zhebei, where the workers were most densely populated of all, taken, though their fight with the white flowers had lasted through the night. When morning broke, Whispers flew through the city to report that the white flowers had at last relinquished, slinking into their homes with broken bones and letting the streets take a different ruler. By six o'clock, Shanghai was quiet, occupied by the workers. Officers had been ousted out of police stations, call centers raided and trashed, rail stations bombed to render them ineffective. The web of connections that powered Shanghai had been snipped at every juncture point save for inside the French concession and international settlement, which the foreigners now guarded with chain-link fences and barbed wire to keep the nationalists out. In the Chinese parts of the city, there was no such thing as scarlet-controlled or white flower-controlled territory anymore. For a fleeting moment, it had seemed that Shanghai was some malleable place, humming with the possibility to grow anew. Then the nationalist armies marched in and the workers gave way, letting the soldiers take over. Now everywhere they looked, there were nationalist soldiers stationed along the streets, the city under occupation. The most outrageous thing was, these few days had still passed as normal. Though the clubs were closed, though the restaurants were closed, though the city was ghostlike in its stillness as it waited for the next political move, her parents acted like nothing was wrong. Private dinners hosted at the mansion went on, albeit with more nationalists present. Private parties went on, albeit with more nationalists present. And funerals went on, albeit with more nationalists present. May he go on to the next life peacefully. It didn't make sense. 
The blackmailer was still out there. Unless Juliet had been utterly mistaken this whole time, the blackmailer had to be aligned with the communists in some way. Yet in this crucial moment, why hadn't the monsters come out? Why not fight the nationalist army off with madness? Juliet, Kathleen whispered. Now you're the one twitching. Juliet shot her cousin a quick glance, conveying her annoyance. In the same motion, she caught sight of three nationalist soldiers to their left, eyeing her. The communists' fight was a long one, Lord Kai had said after the takeover. Their fight encompassed not just the city but the whole country. Why would they upset their alliance with the Kuomintang so soon? Why wouldn't they pretend that all this rebellion and bloodshed had been a joint matter of sticking it to the imperialists, of taking Shanghai back under the control of a true unified government, and bide their time for class revolution? Would it not be sensible to revolt against the Kuomintang only when they actually had a true army alike to the nationalists? Red rags and anger could not stand up against soldiers and academy training. Lord Kai had sounded convincing. He had not sounded one bit worried. Their whole city had just been overturned by a force so mighty, and he cared not? Their entire way of life was at a standstill, waiting to see how the nationalists would organize their rule, how the nationalists would come to an agreement with the foreigners, and Lord Kai was content to stand by and let it happen. It was unlikely. Juliet wondered what she was missing. If all who wish to speak have spoken, then let us bid Kai Taile a safe passage away. The priest stepped aside, gesturing for the relatives nearest to him to begin saying their goodbyes. Each person in the cemetery today clutched a flower in their hands, a faded pink, for though it was customary to use white for mourning, the Scarlet Gang would never use white flowers under any occasion. Lady Kai stepped up and tossed her flower into the grave. The casket already lay inside, closed, as shiny as the headstone. Once the procession finished, the grave would be closed with dirt and laid softly with new grass. Juliet clenched her fists tight, nodding as her mother motioned for her to go on. How fortunate it was that she was a modern girl who did not believe in the afterlife. Otherwise, she would certainly burn in hell for this. Oh, Juliet. Lady Kai brushed her daughter's face as she passed. Don't look so somber. Death is not the end. Your dear cousin performed tremendous feats in his time alive. Did he? Juliet said softly. There was no challenge in her voice. It would be foolish to voice resentment now, when she was standing and Tyler was dead. Of course, Lady Kai reassured her, taking her daughter's monotony for grief. She clutched Juliet's hands, holding them steady. He made the Scarlets proud. He stopped at nothing to protect us. He should never have had the power to do so. We should not have the power to do this. And yet it was all a lost cause, wasn't it? If it were not the Scarlets stopping at nothing to consume the city, it was someone else. I will go pay my respects, Juliet rasped, swallowing every bitter word that she wanted to throw in her mother's face. Lady Kai smiled, and with a squeeze on their enjoined fingers, stepped back to let Juliet proceed. For the briefest moment, Juliet imagined what her mother would say if she knew, knew what blood had once tarnished her palms, knew what blood was running traitorous inside Juliet's veins. Perhaps there was a possibility that she might be forgiven. But mercy and blood feuds had never mixed well together. Juliet approached the grave, peering down at the casket. There was already an abundance of flowers scattered upon the smooth wooden lid. Maybe you would have made a better heir, Tyler, Juliet whispered, crouching to throw her flower in. When it landed, its petals appeared far paler than the others. But I have a feeling the title is soon going to be rendered null. Once, Juliet could never have considered a future without the Scarlet Gang, a future where they were not in power. That was before a monster tore through their numbers, before a madness incited revolution. That was before politicians marched their armies in and filled the streets with their artillery. Once, she had wanted power. But beneath it all, maybe it was never power she wanted. Maybe it was safety. Maybe there was another way to get it, 
away from being heir to a crumbling empire. Juliet rose to her feet. Her hands felt claw-like, still folded over an invisible flower. Someone was coming up behind her and it was time to take her leave, but for a second longer, she hovered around Tyler's headstone, committing its features to memory. I'm sorry, she said, her voice so quiet she could be heard only by herself, and Tyler, wherever he was. If there is a life after this, one that is free of the blood feud, I hope we can be friends. Juliet slipped away from the funeral after activities without notice, tipping her hat low and falling out of step with her relatives once they exited the cemetery. Kathleen corked a brow in her direction, but Juliet shook her head, and Kathleen merely looked to the front of the footpath again, pretending not to see. The Scarlets walked onward in the direction of their parked cars, and Juliet pivoted onto a smaller street, melding deeper into what was once Scarlet territory. Soldiers. Soldiers everywhere. Juliet pulled at the sleeves of her dress and tried to walk without letting her posture slump. The French concession and international settlement were closed, no one in, and no one out. That could not last for long, the foreign concessions were never built to operate as their own self-contained territories, and once they came to an agreement with the nationalists, the barbed wire and makeshift fences would go down. For now, people steered clear in fear of the armed soldiers along Boundary Road, and so that was where Juliet went, to the rooftop of a building at the outer bounds of the Chinese part of the city, just out of view of the foreign soldiers peering through their rifle scopes. There was no telling what this building once was. Perhaps a small noodle shop, or a tailor's parlor. When Juliet trekked up, she saw shattered glass and ripped ledgers left behind on the emptied shelves. Juliet eased open the rooftop door, her shoes coming onto the cement carefully. She kept her breath in her lungs, scanning the space. Her exhale came out with relief. Silently she bounded over to the figure standing in the corner and wrapped her arms around his shoulders before he could turn around, setting her chin at the crook of his neck. Hello, stranger. Roma relaxed under her grip, tipping his head back so that his hair brushed her cheek. Is this an attack? Perhaps, Juliet replied. She shook the knife from her sleeve and pressed the blunt side to his throat. One lone white flower, out in the middle of nowhere? Juliet felt a sudden pressure on her ankle. She hardly had a moment to gasp before she realized Roma had hooked his foot over her leg and pulled her off balance. For the briefest second, she was falling backward, before Roma turned around fast and caught her waist swiping the knife out of her hand and pressing the flat side to her throat instead. You were saying? Roma asked, grinning. Juliet shoved his shoulder. She was scowling, vexed to be caught off guard, but then Roma dropped the knife and pulled her closer. Their lips met, and she forgot what exactly she was going to rebuke him for. I missed you, Roma said when he pulled away. Juliet quirked a brow placing her hands upon his face. You saw me yesterday. To talk business. We're here today to talk business too. Semantics, Roma stopped with a frown, noticing the headdress twined around her hair. It was pale pink, just as the flowers at the cemetery were, a far lighter color than a scarlet would usually dare to wear. Another funeral? Tyler's, Juliet answered quietly. Roma touched the fixture in her hair, adjusting it carefully so it would hold back the strands from her eyes. When he had it in place, he smoothed his hand along her neck. Are you okay? Juliet leaned into the touch, exhaling. What other choice is there? That's not an answer, Dora Gaia. Juliet pulled away gently with a shake of her head. The warmth and kindness were too distracting, it fooled her into thinking that all would be well that the city was not crumbling under their feet. Instead, she twined her arm around his to drag them to the edge of the rooftop. There, they looked out upon the streets, upon the casual sprawl bleeding outward to the horizon. I'm okay, she said. Surviving. That's the best one could hope for now. Roma cast her a sidelong look like he was going to argue, but Juliet shook her head, directing the topic back to true business. 
They were meeting today because Roma had sent a note about new information on the blackmailer, and to tell the truth, Juliet had been surprised. Much as she wanted to eradicate the threat once and for all, it hardly seemed important in the grander scheme of things. The monsters had not attacked in so long. Now Roma and Juliet's search for the blackmailer was not so much in fear of the madness or in desperation to protect their people, it was simply for something to do, something to keep themselves from sitting idle while their city fractured to pieces on a level that teenage gangsters could not touch. What did you find? Juliet asked. A hint of pride flickered upon Roma's expression. I got a name for the Frenchman, he said. The one who turned into a monster on the train. Pierre Moreau. Juliet blinked, the name striking a nerve of familiarity. Roma was still speaking, but Juliet had stopped listening, desperately searching her memory for where she had heard the name before. Had it been an introduction in the French concession? No, she would have remembered if she had met the Frenchman before. Could she have seen his name in their records? Their guest lists? But then why would she have seen a white flower on scarlet lists? sailed into the city some few years ago to start trading. Finally, Juliet remembered. She almost dropped to her knees. Roma, she said breathlessly. Roma, I've seen that name before. A slip of paper on Rosalind's desk. She said he was a patron at the Scarlet Burlesque Club. Roma furrowed his brows. She had told him about Rosalind's disappearance, about her affair with a white flower whom she wouldn't name. Roma had reported back a brief sighting of Rosalind near the White Flower headquarters the day she went missing. Because the scarlet grapevine wasn't working as well as it used to, that was the last time anyone had heard from or seen Rosalind. Impossible, Roma insisted. I may not have known the man by name, but he is prominent enough to be recognized in your clubs. He would have been identified immediately as a White Flower. Then. Juliet physically felt her gut twist, her fingers pressing to her stomach. Then he was never a patron at the club. Rosalind just happened to have a list of names, the first of which happened to be a monster. Juliet needed to find the list again. There were four other names on it. Four other names, four other monsters. Could it be, she whispered. She met Roma's eyes, a reflection of her own horror, having reached the same conclusion. Rosalind was raised in Paris, as passably French as anyone in the concession could be. Is Rosalind the blackmailer? 34. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Juliet slammed the drawers of Rosalind's desk shut, striking her hands so hard against the surface of the table that her palms stung. Rosalind playing spy was one matter. People were lured into betrayal across blood feud lines all the time. It was why their numbers were always shifting. It was why there were always eyes trying to penetrate the inner circle. But setting a monster on the city was another matter altogether. Using monsters to aid politics was something so absurd coming from Rosalind that Juliet couldn't even comprehend a reason for it. Unless the only motive was destruction. Unless the only motive was to burn the whole city down. Is that why? Juliet asked aloud. She lifted her head, peering into the mirror opposite her, acting as if her reflection was a sullen Rosalind staring from some faraway place. Sooner or later, Juliet would have to reckon with her own guilt. She could keep thinking of herself as mighty because she knew her way around a blade. But it was not the blade nor her ruthless tendencies that pushed her to the top. Perhaps they kept her there. What had gotten her there was her birth. It hardly makes sense. Juliet whispered. She reached out with her fingers. The cold press of the mirror sank into her skin. Be angry at me for how we were born. Be angry that you were born a Lang. But you never wanted Scarlet Airdom. You never wanted the city. You wanted to be important. You wanted adoration. So why would she be the blackmailer? How did gathering guns and money help? How did lurking in the shadows with monsters and madness bring her anything that she might desire? Lie run. Juliet called. A maid popped her head in immediately at the summons. She must have been waiting nearby, 
hearing the ruckus Juliet was making. How may I help, Miss Kai? Can you make a call to Kathleen? Juliet waved her arm, trying to think. The communist strongholds kept moving. The gangsters were still trying to dissolve them at the nationalists' command, but otherwise it had been relatively quiet. The communists, too, were waiting to see how this would turn out. She should be at the my tea house? Or maybe. Can't, Xiaojia, the maid interrupted politely before Juliet could waste more time guessing Kathleen's location. Since the takeover, the telephone control centers have not been restaffed yet. Some lines near the railway station are down too as they fix the tracks. Juliet cursed under her breath. So communication across the city was piss poor. Without workers at the control centers, there was no one to direct and connect calls. Fine, Juliet grumbled. I will send a messenger the old-fashioned way, then. Rosalind's room had been cold, but Juliet didn't realize she was shivering until she returned to the warm hallway again, hurrying down the steps and into the living room. As soon as she started to scribble a note by the tables, the front door opened, and Kathleen stepped in. Kathleen. Kathleen didn't hear her. She continued walking, her eyes glazed. She looked deep in thought. Juliet set the pen down, hurrying into the first-floor hallway in pursuit. Kathleen. Still no response. Juliet finally got close enough to set her hand on her cousin's shoulder. Piaoji. At last Kathleen turned around, registering Juliet's presence with a start. She put a hand to her heart her black gloves fading into her deep blue chi pao. You scared me, Kathleen said breathlessly. I called your name at least three times. Kathleen blinked. Did you? Well, Juliet looked around. There was no one else in the hallway, so she joked, technically not? Kathleen quirked her brow. Juliet waved a hand, seeing that she was getting sidetracked, and hooked her arm through her cousin's dragging her back out into the living room and up the stairs. As they walked, she talked as fast as she could, covering what Roma had told her and what conclusion she had come to, ending with how she had run home immediately and started searching through Rosalind's things, only to find nothing upon her desk. Wait, 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 Kathleen said, coming to a firm stop at the top of the staircase, the two of them on the second floor, right outside Lord Kai's office. It was presently empty. He was out somewhere, maybe in the concessions, gauging the temperament of the foreigners, maybe meeting with Chiang Kai-shek himself, drawing up the final collaboration plans between Scarlet's and Kuomintang. You were looking for a slip of paper on her desk? Juliet nodded. It may have been moved since I last saw it, but she had so much paper there, and now there's nothing. They're all in my room. Kathleen exclaimed. Juliet, I've been sifting through them for days, trying to find clues for where she went. Juliet stared at her cousin for a long moment. Then she made fists and pretended to thud them down on Kathleen, raining light blows on her shoulder. Why didn't you tell me? I spent so long digging through her room. Tell you? Kathleen echoed, slapping her hands at Juliet's fists. How was I to know you would need something among those papers? Oh, hush, Juliet windmilled her arms, gesturing for Kathleen to lead on. They hurried, almost ramming into a servant, before piling into Kathleen's room, where the curtains stirred with the open window. Juliet could hardly remember the last time she had come in here, she couldn't remember the last time she had sat down among Kathleen's magazines and shoe racks, upon the thick quilt piled on her bed. It was always in and out, poking a head through to call her cousin to attention, or it was Juliet's room where they congregated. Voila, Kathleen said, pulling Juliet from her brief reverie. With a quiet oof. Kathleen dug forth an arm's cradle of papers from her shelf and tossed it all atop her bed. Ink and prints glimmered under the late afternoon sun streaking through the window, and Juliet got to work, sifting through the papers. She only wanted the list. Then she would know if Pierre was a mere coincidence. Maybe they could even find Rosalind by finding one of the names on the list. 
just as Juliet's eyes snagged on a smaller piece of paper at the corner of Kathleen's bedspread, there was a loud knock on the door downstairs. The sound reverberated through the house. Curious, Kathleen walked to her doorway and peered out, listening while Juliet lunged for the paper and shook it from the pile. It's this. Juliet cried. Kathleen, it's the list. Wait, wait. Hush for a second, Kathleen chided, pressing her finger to her lips. Juliet tilted her head right as the voice wafted up. An attack? There's a monster attack in the city. Deep in the French concession, where the city remained yet quiet, Rosalind was making a racket trying to get into an apartment on Avenue Joffrey. She could see people passing on the street below her, but the duplex walls were thick, and the glass of its windows muffled the sound. Even the gardens below were rustling quietly with the wind, green shrubbery and yellow flowers entwining together. So peaceful with its own business, like every person she had passed on her way here. She hated it. She wanted them all to burn, to suffer as she was suffering. Open this door, she demanded. Her voice bounced in the corridor. No amount of polished tiles and chandeliers could soften her pitch or her near hysterics. Is this how it's going to be? Has it all been a lie to you? Rosalind knew the answer. Yes. It was. Like some pitiful creature, she had ensnarled herself in a trap, let herself be sheared and skinned and slaughtered, and now the hunter was walking away with the job well done. She had been waiting in one of their other concession safe houses for the past week, sending word along that she wanted to run. He had said he would come for her, she just needed to be patient as he finished up his business. God damn it. Rosalind gave up on the door, her arms trembling with exertion. It wasn't love that she had chased, at least not in the physical sense. If all she had wanted was a warm body, she had her pick at the burlesque club, an unending list of men who would throw themselves at her for consideration. She didn't care about that. She never had. A honk came from afar. Cars, rumbling down the residential driveways. She merely thought she had found a companion. An equal. Someone to see her th her, just as she was, not a scarlet, not a dancer, but Rosalind. It was her fault for thinking that she was enough to change someone. Monsters and money and the city on strings, up against Rosalind, who hadn't even wanted to go along with it in the first place, who had only done so out of hope that he would be happy once he had the city, that they could be happy and no one could touch them. The world in one palm and her in another. But someone who wanted the world would never stop before they had it, everything else be damned. It was hardly a competition. She was foolish to think that her friends could be kept safe, that she could be the hand guiding him away from chaos. She had never possessed any power here. She had never mattered. Days had passed in that safe house with no change. In the end, this was the harsh truth, Rosalind had left everyone she cared about for someone who was not coming. Rosalind had hurt everyone she cared about, risked their very lives, all for someone who was long gone. Rosalind tore her pistol from her pocket and shot at the door handle. The sound grated on her ears as the bullet struck once, twice, three times. The walls seemed to shrink from her, smooth silver and gold wallpaper inching back from the violence rarely brought into places like these. The handle fell. The door inched open. And when Rosalind nudged into the apartment, she found it entirely vacated. She couldn't help it. She laughed. She laughed and she laughed, tracing her eyes along every missing thing. The apartment had never been well decorated to begin with, but now the papers on the table had disappeared, the maps atop the grand piano were gone. When she peered into the bedroom, even the sheets were stripped. We can live here forever, can't we? She had twirled with those sheer curtains, splaying the lace across her head like some bridal veil. Had thrown her arms up, delirious in her happiness. Don't get too excited, love. We're only here until we rise higher. Must we? Can we not live a quaint existence? Can you not be a good man? A good man? Oh, Rosa, Rosalind trailed her hands along the bookshelf, finding only dust, 
even though it could not have been more than a few days since the worn paperbacks were cleared away. Yechelovek Bolenoi. Yezloy Chelovek. Neprvlekatelna Yechelovek. When the monsters were sent in for the scarlet vaccine, she had said she didn't think she could do this anymore. Had that prompted the decision to abandon her? Or was it because she had gotten caught, because she could no longer supply scarlet information? I would have abandoned them for you, she admitted to the empty room. She had always known who he was. She had always known him as a white flower. The truth was that she hadn't cared. The blood feud did not stoke a fury in her heart like it did to others in Shanghai. She had not grown up here, had no ties to the people. The fighting on the streets seemed like a show she might catch in the theaters. The gangsters running their errands were interchangeable faces she could never keep track of. Kathleen had a kind heart, Juliet had blood ties, but Rosalind? What had this family ever given Rosalind to deserve her loyalty? Incompetence from her father and irreverence from the Kais. Year after year, the bitterness festered so deeply that it had developed into a physical hurt, one that stung as much as the current injuries on her back. Had they just accepted her, had they seen her for what she could do, she could have offered the Scarlet Gang her life. Instead, they gave her scars and wounds, she was marked if she bit her tongue and stayed, she was marked if she tried to make something of herself and strayed. Scars upon scars upon scars. She was a girl with nothing else now. Rosalind walked to the desk and was startled to find a slip of paper pinned to the wood of the table. For a second, as her heart leaped to her throat, she thought it might be an explanation, instructions on where she could go now, something to say that she had not been left behind. Instead, as she drew closer, she read, Goodbye, dear Rosalind. Better to part now than when the havoc really begins. He had known she would come looking. He had long planned to clear out the apartment and leave her with nothing but a pitiful note. Rosalind tore the paper out, bringing it closer to her eyes, as if she might be misreading the messy scrawl. When the havoc really begins? What more was coming? What more would descend on the city? Rosalind turned around, facing the apartment windows. She watched the trees wave, watched the sun beat on. And in that very moment, a loud scream tore through the streets, warning about a monster on the loose. See anything yet? Roma asked, putting aside the eighth folder he had finished going through. Rest assured, Marshall replied, if we find something, we're not going to remain silent and wait patiently for you to ask. Without looking, Benedict reached over with a wad of paper and thudded Marshall over the head. Marshall nudged out with his foot to kick Benedict, and Roma grinned, so pleased to have the three of them together again he hardly cared that they were cramped in the tiny scarlet safe house where Marshall was living, papers spread out on every inch of flooring. No matter how small, he would always be fond of this apartment now. It had kept Marshall safe. It had brought Juliet back to him. Don't be a clown, Benedict said. Though he was also flipping through a folder with one hand, he held a pencil in the other, scribbling miniature sketches on the discarded pieces of paper. Focus, or we're not going to finish going through the profiles. There was a sect within the White Flowers working with the communists, to find a lead, they would have to sift through all the information they had on their own gang. Receipts, import logs, export logs, gangsters who ran anything on behalf of the White Flowers had to keep an account of their ongoings. Technically, at least. In truth, it was not as if gangsters were very good at bureaucratic records, that was why they were gangsters and not politicians. When Roma carried over the boxes, he had managed most of the hall on his own, with Benedict holding only one so that Roma's vision was not obscured. I cannot help it. Marshall threw the file in his hands aside, picking up another with a sigh. I've been bottling up my wisecracks for months, and now they must come out all at once. Benedict scoffed. He thwacked Marshall again, this time with his pencil, but Marshall grabbed his whole hand instead, grinning. Roma blinked, the paper in front of him suddenly the least interesting thing in the room. He met his cousin's eyes. Does he know? Roma mouthed. 
as Marshall let go and turned to fetch the last file in his pile, Benedict mimed a slash across his throat. You shut your mouth. Benedict. I mean it, Benedict mouthed furiously. Stay out of this. But. There was almost an audible clack from Roma's jaw when he snapped his mouth shut, his teeth biting together the moment Marshall turned around again. Marshall looked up, sensing something in the air. Did something happen, he asked, bewildered. Roma cleared his throat. Yeah, he lied. I, uh, heard something. He pointed in the direction of the door. Maybe off boundary. Benedict jolted forward. Wait a minute. There really is something. Roma arched a brow. His cousin really knew how to act. He had even drained his face of blood, his cheeks as white as the paper sheets on the floor. Then he heard the screaming too, and he realized that Benedict wasn't playing along. You don't think. Kwai Wu. The white flowers bolted to their feet. Roma was the first one out, scanning the street in disbelief, his hand going to his gun. Benedict and Marshall followed closely. Perhaps it was not a good idea to be out in the open, especially for Marshall, in what would be Scarlet territory. Mere weeks ago, it would have been a declaration of war, now they were already in the midst of one, and no one had the energy to fight another. There hasn't been a monster attack in months, Roma said. Why strike now? We don't even know yet if it is an actual attack, Benedict replied. Streams and streams of civilians ran past them, their shopping bundled to their chests, hurrying children and elderly along by the elbows. Marshall started in the direction where the civilians were running from. Roma and Benedict followed, moving fast but warily, eyes searching for the source of the chaos. They sighted no madness quite yet. Nor were there any insects skittering on the streets. This is pandemonium, Marshall remarked, spinning around quickly to take inventory of their surroundings. His eyes widened. Why? Roma knew exactly what Marshall was asking. It was only then that he started to run. Where the hell are the soldiers? He had his answer as soon as he turned the corner, coming upon the railway station. There had previously been an abundance of nationalists stationed here, standing sentry to make sure their political opponents weren't trying to escape from the city. Only now they were not guarding the station but fighting monsters, rifles and guns pointed, shooting at the creatures that lunged at them. Oh God, Benedict muttered. One of the monsters lunged, swiping a claw against a nationalist soldier's face. When the soldier staggered up against the railway station, his cheek was hanging off. Roma would have blanched if he were not stunned beyond belief. He had glimpsed Paul Dexter's monster, and he had seen the one on the train. These monsters before him were no different in appearance, but it was broad daylight, the weather warm and almost pleasant, and to watch them with their blue-green muscles rippling in the sun almost frightened him enough to run. Marshall, stop, Roma snapped, holding his arm out. He could raid Marshall's intent in the tension of his shoulders. While Roma considered scrambling backward, Marshall had planned to surge forward. This doesn't involve us. They'll all die. That's their fight. Roma's voice trembled, but his instruction didn't waver. More than anything, he was confused by the scene in front of him. There were still a few civilians nearby, huddled by the sidewalk and frozen in fear. Five monsters, all of them tall enough to bowl over an ordinary human, and yet they had eyes only for the nationalists. Five monsters, all of them with the ability to release thousands upon thousands of insects and induce a madness that could sweep the city and have it on its knees, and yet they did not. Roma, Benedict said quietly. He pointed, near the feet of one of the monsters. Look. A dead man. No, a dead white flower identifiable by the white handkerchief hanging from his work pants. And over there, Marshall whispered, tilting his chin at the bench in front of the railway station. Another corpse was collapsed there, the red cloth around their wrist looking like a gash of blood. A scarlet. With a deep shudder, Roma took a few steps away from the scene, leaning against the emptied restaurant behind them. 
the nationalist soldiers continued shooting, yelling at one another to report on where reinforcements would be. Their numbers were dwindling. Even without madness, they could not win against indestructible creatures. Nationalists, white flowers, scarlets, Roma said aloud, his brow furrowed as he worked through the puzzle pieces. What game are they playing at here? Stop. The shout came from the perpendicular road, coming nearer and nearer the railway station. Roma poked his head out, suddenly gripping Benedict's arm in alarm. Who is that? he demanded. Where is it coming from? It sounded familiar. Too familiar. Not Juliet, don't get hasty, Benedict immediately replied. It's. The figure came into view, throwing herself in front of one of the monsters, arms waving wildly. Her hair resembled a tangle of black wire trailing down her back. Though she was significantly more disheveled since the last time he had sighted her, it was undoubtedly Rosalind Lang. What the hell is she doing? Marshall exclaimed. She'll get herself killed. Bewildered, the three white flowers watched Rosalind Lang dart in front of a soldier, screaming incoherent commands at the monster. The monster, however, loomed ever the closer, not deterred by gun nor girl. She could be the very blackmailer, Roma said. Then why does she look so frantic? Benedict asked. Would she not have control of them? Maybe she lost control, Marshall suggested. Roma made a frustrated noise. So why aren't they releasing their insects? The million-dollar question. Suddenly the monster reared back and charged right toward Rosalind. At the last minute, she spat a curse and dove out of the way, the monster hardly seemed interested in her anyway. It attacked and pounced on the nationalist so viciously that the blood came up in an arc, splashing down on Rosalind until her face was sprayed with red. She lifted her head from the ground, elbows propped on either side of her, visibly trembling even from this distance. Do we? Benedict started hesitantly. Do we help her? Another round of gunfire from a rifle that made no dent. Another cry, another soldier down. With a sigh, Roma put his gun away and tore his jacket off. Help isn't quite the right word, he said. Shed your colors. I think they're only attacking gangsters and nationalists. Marshall peered down at himself. I don't think I'm wearing any to begin with. Do any of us ever carry around a white handkerchief like some errand runner? Benedict added. With his eyes pinned on the scene before him, Roma pushed his sleeves up, then grabbed a plank of wood from nearby. Shed anything identifiable, he clarified. Then hurry up and help me pull Rosalind Lang out of there so we can knock her out. Wait, what? Marshall yelled. Knock her out? Roma was already marching forward, lifting the plank of wood. How else are we supposed to take her to Juliet? 35. Baba. Juliet exclaimed. Please, tell me what's going on. The house was in disarray, overtaken by activity. At first Juliet had thought they were assembling their forces to fight against the attack. Messengers had been sent out the door at rapid speed, but as soon as she listened in on exactly what her father's men were saying, it seemed that it was not a defense they were putting up. They were summoning nationalists to the door, gathering forces inward. They were bringing together the scarlet inner circle, the business tycoons who held properties in the city. Now they were here in abundance, greeting Lord Kai briefly and hurriedly, eyes darting back and forth like there was something urgently pressing on their heels. The moment her father came up the stairs, Juliet lunged for his sleeve, holding on tightly. What's going on? She tried again when he continued walking forward. Why would the blackmailer strike now? It was never one blackmailer, Lord Kai replied evenly. Pausing before his office, already humming with noise inside, he eased her grip off his sleeve, then smoothed the fabric of his shirt down until it was free of wrinkles. It was the communists. It has always been the communists. Juliet felt her face furrow, all her muscles pinching together. No, I told you, they're working with the communists, but those were Paul's insects. One of the monsters is a Frenchman. 
Lord Kai opened his office door, then gestured for Juliet to stay put. He wasn't allowing her to follow him in. Not now, Juliet, he said. Not now. The door closed in Juliet's face. For a minute Juliet could only stand there, blinking in disbelief. It had been laughable of her to think that she would be accepted into this gang once Tyler was gone, that Tyler was the only thing standing between her and complete recognition. They let her feel powerful, running about the city like she could solve all its problems, but as soon as true trouble came, they closed the damn door in her face. Juliet took a step back, practically seething through her teeth. Miss Kai. A pitter-patter of footsteps came up behind her. Juliet turned and found a young messenger holding a note out for her. For you, he said. Juliet scrubbed a hand over her face, then took the note. How come you weren't sent out into the city with everyone else? The messenger grimaced. I so, if you don't need me, I'll be off now. He fled before Juliet could get another word in. She almost called out again to summon the messenger back, but then she unfolded her note and stopped short. It was written in Russian. The messenger had not been a scarlet at all, but a white flower. Come quickly. The safe house. We have Rosalind. Heart suit. Kathleen. Juliet bellowed. She was already sprinting down the hallway, coming to a sharp stop outside her cousin's bedroom, her heels practically making skid marks in the flooring. Kathleen scrambled up from her bed. Do we know what's happening? We have something better, Juliet said. Get your coat. Roma found Rosalind. When Roma opened the door to the safe house, it was so dark inside that Juliet could hardly see anything past his shoulder. As soon as she and Kathleen stepped in, Roma closed the door again and the apartment fell into utter black. What is this, an ambush? Juliet remarked, flipping her lighter on. The first sight that flickered to life was Benedict and Marshall, both standing by the stove and grimacing like they were bracing for something. The second was Rosalind, gagged and tied to a chair. Oh my God, Kathleen cried, starting forward immediately. What? Make her promise not to yell before you take that out, Roma cut in quickly. He finally flicked on the overhead light, then sighed when Kathleen didn't listen, yanking at Rosalind's gag. It was only a small wad of fabric that once bundled vegetables. If Rosalind had really tried, she might have been able to spit it out. No yelling, Marshall emphasized. One shout and the nationalists will come knocking. Don't you tell me not to yell, Rosalind grumbled. I'll. Rosalind, Juliet cut in. Her cousin fell quiet. There was no running this time. There was nowhere to go. The streets outside were crawling with soldiers, their numbers gathered thickly after the panic that had erupted near the railway station. The attack had happened too close to the international settlement. One wrong move, and the British would start firing along the borders. Juliet walked to the window, unwilling to face Rosalind quite yet. She pulled at the boards, peering through the slivers. How did they stop the attacks? she asked. They didn't. Benedict answered. The monsters retreated of their own volition. Juliet sucked in a tight breath. Thinned her lips. Crossed her arms, maybe crossed them a bit too tightly and looked as if she was reaching for a weapon, gauging by the way Benedict made a noise of alarm. Roma rolled his eyes at his cousin, gesturing for him to step back and get out of the way as Juliet wound around the table, coming to a stop beside Kathleen, in front of Rosalind. Was it because of you? Juliet asked quietly. Did they retreat because of you? No, Rosalind replied. Across the room, Benedict and Marshall exchanged a nervous glance. Roma leaned into the table, his body inclining in Juliet's direction. Kathleen bit her lip and shifted to her left until she was against the wall. Rosalind, Juliet said. Her voice cracked. I can't help you unless you tell me what you did. Who said I needed help? Rosalind replied. There was no malice in her tone. Only a faint, faint sense of dread. I am a lost cause, Junely. 
If the table hadn't been behind her, Juliet would have staggered back, guts twisting at the sound of her name. The last time Rosalind might have used it was when they were children. When they were barely taller than the rose bushes in the gardens, jumping over each other in a game of leapfrog, diving into the piles of leaves the household staff were trying to sweep and giggling when they messed it all up. Oh, don't try that with me. Juliet. Kathleen hissed. Juliet didn't relent. She plunged her hand into her pocket and dug out the list they had retrieved, unfolding the paper with a brisk snap. This was on your desk, Rosalind, she said. Pierre Moreau, Alfred Delaunay, Edmund Lefervre, Gervais Carroll, Simon Clare, five names, and if my guess is correct, five monsters. It is a simple question, are you the blackmailer? Rosalind looked down in lieu of answering. Juliet threw the paper to the floor with a loud curse, her foot stamping on the list. Wait, Juliet. Roma bent over to pick up the piece of paper. Under normal circumstances, she wouldn't have made much of the curiosity in his voice. Only then Benedict and Marshall surged forward too, the three of them pale under the hazy bulb light, leaning in to read the list like it was something incomprehensible. What is it? Juliet demanded. Simon Clare? Benedict muttered. Alfred Delaunay, Marshall added, rocking back on his heels. Those are. Dimitri's men, Roma finished. He passed the list back to Juliet, but Kathleen reached over and intercepted it. Those are all Dimitri Vornin's men. For all Juliet knew, the ground underneath her feet had crumbled to pieces. She was in free fall, her stomach suspended in motion. Rosalind did not deny it, did not offer another explanation. Nor did she do anything to resist when Juliet reached forward and pulled out the chain around her neck. It glimmered under the light, but Juliet paid no attention to hidden jewels. Instead, she flipped over the flat strip of metal at the necklace's end, running her finger across the engraving on the other side. Juliet choked out a laugh. Half gasping, half guffawing, she was almost struggling to catch her breath when Roma pulled her back gently, easing her grip off Rosalind's necklace before she could rip the chain off and strangle her cousin with it. Don't judge me, Rosalind said. Her eyes flickered between Juliet and Roma not when you clearly did the same. The same? Juliet echoed. She couldn't stand here anymore. She pushed off the table and marched to the other side of the room, gulping in air. If Juliet had thought hard enough, perhaps she could have worked it out sooner, could have stopped this. She had always known, Rosalind was angry, angry at the world, at the place she had been given. But what she wanted was not to change her place, it was to find something that made her place worth it. Juliet turned to Rosalind, her eyes stinging. I decided to love a white flower, she managed, each word slicing at her tongue you helped a white flower set destruction onto this city. It is not the same. I loved him, Rosalind said. She denied none of it. She was too prideful to deny it once she had been caught. Tell me, if Roma Montagov had asked, wouldn't you have done it too? Don't speak about me as if I'm not right here in the room, Roma interrupted before Juliet could answer. His tone was stern, if only to disguise how shaken he was. Juliet, sit down. You look as though you are near fainting. Juliet folded herself upon the floor and dropped her head into her hands. Wasn't Rosalind right, in a way? However it had happened, she had loved Dimitri enough to betray her family, feed him information to whatever ends he wanted. Juliet had loved Roma enough to kill her own cousin in cold blood. Rosalind was a traitor, but so was she. Marshall cleared his throat. Just to be sure that I am following, he said. Dmitri Vornin is the blackmailer? And you are his lover. Not anymore, Rosalind cut in. Marshall took the correction in stride. You were his lover, both his source for scarlet information and his, he trailed off, thinking briefly, what? Monster keeper? Rosalind turned her head away. Untie me, and I will give you answers. Don't. The command came from Kathleen, who had remained quiet until now. 
The ceiling light flickered, and underneath it, Kathleen's eyes looked utterly black. You owe us that much, Rosalind, Kathleen said. She tossed the paper onto the table. By now, Kathleen had scrunched up the list so much that it was nothing but a tiny ball, bouncing off the surface and flying to the floor. I won't tell you how deeply you have betrayed us. I think you know. So speak. Slowly, Juliet put a hand on the floor and started to get back onto her feet. Kathleen. Kathleen spun. Don't defend her. Don't even think about it. I wasn't going to. Juliet straightened to her full height, dusting off her hands. I was going to ask you to take a step back, Rosalind is about to stand. Just as Rosalind shifted, Benedict lunged forward and yanked Kathleen toward him, stopping Rosalind from bowling her sister over with the chair's leg and making a run for the door. Heavens knew how she expected to escape her bindings even if she got to the door. Yes, fine. Rosalind snapped, finally reaching a breaking point as her chair came back down with a defeated thump. Dimitri wanted to take over the white flowers, and when one of his associates came in contact with Paul Dexter's remaining monsters, I went along with his plan to destroy this city. Is that what you want to hear? That I am weak? No one ever said you were weak, Marshall replied. Merely foolish, as the best of us have been known to fall prey to. Roma waved for Marshall to stop speaking. Backtrack, Roma said. He looked over his shoulder briefly and exchanged a glance with Juliet. What do you mean, take over the white flowers? Paul Dexter's last note went to someone in the French concession, how did Dimitri even get a hold of it? If Rosalind had her hands free, this would have been the time she placed a delicate palm to her forehead, smoothing down the long wisps of hair around her face. But she was bound, subject to interrogation by family and enemy, and so she only stared ahead, her jaw tight. Your search through the French concession would never have led anywhere, Rosalind whispered. In the event of my death, release them all. It was an instruction to the servants at a different property Paul owned in the concession, on Whiteflower territory. When they didn't pay rent, Dimitri stormed the place and found the insects before they could be released. Her eyes closed, like she was remembering the scene. No doubt she would have been called upon to examine their findings, no doubt she must have seen to the fates of the servants, perhaps a simple bullet to shut them up, perhaps thrown into the Huangpu River so no one could follow Paul Dexter's last trail. Lord Kai will kill you for this, Kathleen said quietly. Rosalind blew a harsh breath through her nose, feigning an amusement that didn't land. Lord Kai hardly has the time. Don't you wonder why Dimitri thinks he can stage a coup? Don't you wonder where he got the nerve? Her gaze shot up, landing right on Juliet. The Scarlets and the Nationalists are working together to purge the city of communists. As soon as the Kuomintang armies are ready, they will open fire on the city. Dimitri is waiting. He waits for that moment, and in the struggle, it will be him who comes in like a savior with his guns and money and allied communists, driving the nationalist effort back. It will be Dimitri who rises just as the workers are at their lowest, and he will give them hope, and when he is the prize force of the revolution, he will have the power he wants. The safe house fell quiet. All that could be heard was faint shouting outside, as if soldiers were nearing. Quickly, Marshall walked to the window and peered through the cracks again. The others in the room remained where they stood, ignoring everything beyond their four walls. For whatever absurd reason, Juliet's mind went to the assassin who had come after the merchant at the Grand Theatre. There was no greater scheme, there never had been. It was merely Dimitri trying to stir trouble with Roma's tasks. It was merely Dimitri, intent on taking the white flowers for himself. Where did you hear this from? Benedict asked in horror. Why would you have information about secret scarlet plans when even Juliet does not? Another laugh. Another dry, bitter sound that held no humor. Because Juliet is not a spy, she replied. I am. Juliet did not lurk in the corners, listening to her father. I did. Juliet's pulse was beating so hard that the skin of her wrists trembled with movement. 
Roma reached over and squeezed her elbow gently. How long might we have? Juliet asked, the question directed at Kathleen. If the nationalists decide to purge everyone with communist alignment out of the Kuomintang? Kathleen shook her head. It's hard to say. They haven't come to an agreement with the foreign concessions yet. They might wait until jurisdiction settlements are made. They might not. A purge itself was bad enough. But monsters and madness loosed on the gangsters that went in with guns blazing? It would be slaughter on both sides. We have to stop Dimitri before the Scarlets do anything, Juliet said, almost speaking to herself. It was impossible to put a stop to politics. But monsters could be found, and the men who controlled them could be killed. Should we? Juliet looked at Kathleen sharply. What? It might help, Kathleen said quietly. If the Scarlet Gang is organizing massacre, setting chaos onto our side might help save the workers. Don't get brainwashed. That was Marshall, cutting in. You can't control an infectious madness. Besides, your Scarlets have practically been overtaken by the Nationalists. You haven't had true power for months. You cut down a few of your numbers, and the armies only bring more in. The room grew quiet again. There was no easy answer to any of this. Benedict, Roma said after a long moment. Do we know where Dimitri is? Benedict shook his head. I haven't seen him since the takeover. I don't think anyone has seen him since the takeover. He hasn't been around the house. All his men are scattered. Lord Montagov even suspected he might have been killed during the battle in Jabe. But he is alive, Juliet said, her eyes pinned on Rosalind. Isn't he, Biagie? Alive, Rosalind confirmed. Only I don't know where. Then I'll ask again. A click echoed through their tight space. Juliet knew it was disbelief that had every gaze in the room reacting so slowly that caused the stunned, gaping alarm when Juliet pointed her pistol at her cousin, the safety off. I want his location, Juliet said. Don't think I won't do it, Rosalind. Kathleen started forward, panic setting into her eyes. Juliet. Wait. Roma stepped in front of Kathleen quickly, keeping her out of Juliet's way. Just wait. I am telling the truth, Rosalind snapped. She pulled against her ropes to little avail. After all these years, she knew that Juliet did not wave around her pistol to make an empty threat. Juliet might not aim for the heart, but a body had many expendable parts. You wouldn't even have caught me if I hadn't heard screaming about a monster attack and followed the sounds in an attempt to stop it. That was out of my own goodness. I have been trying to find Dimitri too. The men inside the monsters don't listen to me anymore. Juliet's grip tightened. The pistol in her hand trembled. I don't know where he is. Rosalind spat, increasingly agitated. He used to base his operations from an apartment on Avenue Joffrey, the one he took over from Paul's people, but he moved. He wouldn't risk it with the French concession so carefully watched after the takeover. He is out of my reach. Forgive me, Juliet said, if I don't believe you. Her hand stilled. In her head, she counted to three, just to afford her cousin one last chance. But when she reached three, it was not her gun that deafened the safe house with sound. It was the door, shuddering with explosive effort, once, twice, and then before Juliet and Roma could dart for it and hold it closed, it had blown open, halting the two in their tracks. Juliet's pistol was still raised when General Shu came in, followed by so many soldiers that half of them were forced to remain outside, lest the apartment overspill. Not one step farther, Juliet demanded. Her eyes darted to the side. In that brief second of eye contact, she and Roma were silently asking each other how the Nationalists had found them and what the Nationalists wanted, but neither had an answer. All that was for sure was they had been found, Juliet Kai and Roma Montagov, colluding together. But General Shu, as he ignored Juliet and took a step in, was not even looking at them. Nor did he take note of Rosalind in the corner, bound to a chair. 
with an expression akin to amusement, he merely examined the room, like he was a new tenant searching for a place to rent. Put your weapon down, Miss Kai, General Xu said, finishing his perusal and resting his hands at his belt. There, a vast selection of handguns sat at the ready, dangling from the leather. I'm not here for you. Juliet narrowed her eyes. Her finger twitched on the trigger. Then why bring so many soldiers? Because, he signaled for the men behind him, I heard that my son was alive and well, and I have come to fetch him back. At once, the soldiers raised their firearms, pointed at one person in the room. Hello, Baba, Marshal spat. You have terrible timing. 36. Havoc erupted within the safe house. Roma was shouting, Benedict was shouting, Kathleen had pressed herself up against the wall, Rosalind was trying to free herself, and Juliet barely managed to get out of the way before the soldiers were surging out the door, Marshall clasped between them in captivity. Stop. Roma bellowed. You can't just take him. He was fast to follow, almost colliding with the building wall before barreling out from the front archway. A beat later, Juliet made to follow him, only Benedict grabbed her wrist, stopping her mid-motion. Don't let Mars get caught in the crossfire, Benedict said in one breath. You protected him once, Juliet. I know you have it in you to look out for him again. No use telling me this, Juliet hissed, grabbing Benedict's arm and yanking him out with her. Help me fix it. Kathleen, watch Rosalind. Kathleen's mouth opened as if to protest, only Juliet was already running out. She surveyed the scene, guns, soldiers, Roma Marshall had long ceased struggling, but Roma had rooted himself in their path, stubborn until the very end. The street around them was quiet. Give it some minutes more, however, and this would grow into a scene, gawkers at every corner. It was almost bizarre that Juliet's first thought was I can't be seen with white flowers. The city had been taken, territory lines had turned as fluid as flowing river water, and yet still the blood feud raged on, as if it had any meaning, as if it ever had any meaning. Does my father know that you are hassling scarlets? General Shu stopped. He turned around. When all his men were forced to halt too, Marshall made a valiant effort to tug himself free, but their hold upon him was iron. No matter how he lunged, there were too many in a small circle holding him in and too many in a larger circle that kept Roma at a distance by the threat of their rifles. Does your father know you lie about white flowers being scarlets? Juliet lifted her chin. At the far side of the soldier cluster, Roma's head snapped up, trying to catch Juliet's eye. He made a motion at her, urging her not to stick her neck in, to let him handle it. Fool! If he was sticking his neck in, she was already there too. How are you to prove that Marshal Seo is a white flower? Juliet asked. General Xu pulled a revolver from his holster. He did not point it at her, at anyone. He merely examined it, opening and closing the cylinder to check his bullets. What would you prefer, Miss Kai, he said. The letter he wrote when he ran from me, declaring his intent to survive on his own in Shanghai by joining the White Flowers? News clippings I've kept over the years that report him to be the Montagoff heir's right-hand man? I have them all, just give the word. Juliet bit down on the inside of her cheeks, throwing Benedict a glance, hoping he had some idea of their next move. But Benedict looked startled beyond description. When General Shu put his revolver back into its holster, the street was quiet enough that Benedict's low murmur could be heard very clearly. Ran from you? Marshal grimaced, looking away. He had stopped struggling. He never told you? General Shu asked. I assume he said that we were all dead, didn't he? He looked at Marshall. Now, out in the light, the resemblance appeared. The same face shape, the same lines crinkling at the eyes. You are, Marshal seethed, his voice a sudden crack in the air. He had never before seemed so furious, hairless, cheery Marshal, who had never angered once in Juliet's presence, was now red in the face and shaking, the tendons in his neck standing at attention. When Umma died and you weren't home, for all that it mattered, 
you were dead to me too. General Xu didn't flinch. If anything, he looked a little bored. He didn't even seem to be listening. I will not discuss your mother with you in the middle of the street. We may have a nice sit down later, if you wish to talk. Mr. Montagov, would you please get out of the way? Roma remained firm. His brows were drawn. Juliet knew that look, he was trying to buy time, but the problem was that more time was not going to help the present situation. This is not your jurisdiction, Roma said quietly. When Miss Kyde says you can go, only then may you go. General Xu put his hands behind his back, behind all the weapons at his belt. When he spoke again, he really did address Juliet, like Juliet had any control over what was to happen here. I have no interest in whatever strange arrangement between gangsters this is. All I want is to take my son home with me. I stay quiet about your business, you leave my business to me." A wad of spit narrowly missed his face. General Xu stepped back, but Marshall looked like he was gearing up to do it again. "'You think you can just march in here?' Marshall exclaimed. "'You march into the city even though you did none of the work to take it. You march in and grab me like I'm your damn property. Where were you all these years? You knew I was here. You could have fetched me at any point. But you didn't. The revolution was more important. The Kuomintang was more important. Everything but me was more important. General Xu said nothing. Juliet's grip tightened on her gun, tightened on the trigger. She wondered what would happen if she shot him. She wondered if she could get away with it. A year ago, it would have been nothing. Today it would be a declaration of war against the Nationalists, and the Scarlets, tough as they were, could not fight such a war. It would be annihilation. But now, Marshall went on, now that you're in Shanghai anyway, you may as well tie up your loose ends, right? Everything is falling into place, your country and your happy little family. He spat again, but it wasn't aimed at his father this time. Merely an expulsion of the anger within his body like popping a bullet out from its exit wound. Well, Miss Kai? Juliet started. Despite Marshall's speech, his father was still speaking to her. It sounds like he doesn't want to go, she said tightly. At once, by some signal that Juliet had not caught, the soldiers all stood to attention, saluting. Then they aimed their rifles at Roma, ready to shoot. Don't make things difficult, General Shu said. Staying with the white flowers is a death sentence. You know what is coming. I'm keeping him safe. Don't, Benedict muttered from beside Juliet. Don't believe it. But this wasn't a matter of believing or not. This was truth. This was knowing that the gangsters were near collapse. No more territories. No more thriving black market. How long could they hold on for? How long could the white flowers survive, given they didn't have nationalist support like the Scarlets did? Roma, Juliet called shakily. Step aside. No. Benedict snapped. Juliet, stop. Juliet swiveled around, her fists clenched. You heard what Rosalind said, she hissed. Though she attempted a volume only for Benedict, there was no doubt that everyone present could hear her. You know what violence is to come. How many communist meetings has Lord Montagu sent Marshall to? How many times has his face been cited there? Who is to say if his name is on a kill list when the city erupts? This is a way to keep him safe. Benedict reached for his gun. Juliet smacked it out of his hands immediately, her wrist crossing with his, her eyes ablaze. Benedict did not try it a second time. He knew he would not win. In his expression, there was only hard disappointment. Is it for his safety, he asked, horse? Or is it for Roma's? Juliet swallowed hard. She released her hold on Benedict Montagov's wrist. Roma, she called again, unable to look over. Please. A long moment of silence passed. Then, the sound of rifles clacking against shoulder straps, Heavy boots starting to walk Roma had stepped aside. Benedict kept his eyes pinned on Juliet, 
like he didn't dare to look away, didn't dare watch Marshall be hauled off. The least that Juliet owed him was to hold his gaze, own up to the decision she had made. He will be safe, she said. The marching footfalls grew farther and farther away. Safe inside a cage, Benedict replied, his jaw tight. You sent him off to a prison sentence. Juliet would not be chided like this. As if there had been any other choice. Would you rather your cousin be shot? At last Benedict turned away. Miraculously, no onlookers had come to see the commotion. Miraculously, even after the soldiers marched off with Marshall, the street remained empty, and now it was only the three of them out in the open, Roma standing by the sidewalk with his arms to either side of him like he didn't know what to do with himself. No, Benedict said dully. He started to walk toward the city center. Merely three paces away, he paused again and spoke over his shoulder. I would rather the two of you not burn the world down each time you choose each other. 37. Juliet wasn't one who liked relying on eavesdropping, but she was out of options. With her heels and dresses, she wasn't the sort of person who was very good at being sneaky either, which meant her current predicament was truly a last resort. At any moment, she almost expected someone to wander out into the gardens and ask what she was doing, hanging from a guest bedroom balcony, leaning as closely as she could to the open window of her father's office. Forces Juliet shifted forward, trying to hear more than a few snippets of each sentence. Fortunately, it was past dusk, and the purpling hour of the night obscured her strange position against the walls of the house. There weren't many scarlets around the house to catch her like this anyway. She had been sitting on the couch all afternoon, observing the quiet around her. For however many hours Juliet wasted away in the living room, dragging a sharp nail down the armrest, the front door had not opened once, no one coming in, no one going out. In the twenty-four hours that had passed since learning Dmitri Voronin was the blackmailer, Juliet had assigned messengers to watch every corner of the city. Until Rosalind gave up a location, there was no way to seek Dmitri. Until the Nationalists actually acted, until the Scarlets acted, there was no way to know how the coming fight would unfold if Dmitri were truly going to unleash madness on behalf of the Communists. Lord and Lady Kai feigned ignorance. When Juliet gave them Rosalind's accusation about the coming massacre, passed off as a rumor on the streets, her father had waved her off with assurances that this was nothing she needed to concern herself with. Which made no sense. Since when was the heir of the Scarlet Gang supposed to remain unconcerned? This was her job. Numbers, unknown. Juliet cursed under her breath, hooking her leg over the balcony when it sounded as though the meeting in Lord Kai's office was ending. The thing was, she had been waiting to hear something, anything, from the eyes she had placed across the city. Scarlet messengers were commonly prone to false reports. Even when nothing was awry, the more dramatic ones who wanted to prove themselves always came in with a whisper or two picked up from unreliable sources. Juliet was playing eavesdropper in her own house because she had received absolute silence. And silence didn't mean the city had settled into peace and harmony. It meant the messengers weren't reporting to her anymore. Someone, multiple someones, had clammed them up, and after all, there were only two people in this gang higher ranked than her. Her parents. Have you seen Juliet? Juliet froze right in the middle of the guest bedroom. Slowly, when it seemed the conversation was only passing in the hallway, she crept forward to press her ear to the door. She was in the living room earlier, Lady Kai. For a second Juliet wondered if she was finally being summoned. If her parents were going to sit her down and explain what the Scarlet Gang was planning, assuring her that they would never collaborate with nationalists if collaboration meant bathing their city in a wave of red. Ah, well. Her father asks to keep her away from the third floor sitting room if you see her. We have a meeting. The voices faded. Juliet's fists clenched tight before she even realized what she was doing, carving her nails deep into the skin of her palms. She could not fathom the meaning of this. Her mother was the one who told her time and time again that Juliet deserved to be heir. Her father was the one training her to take over, 
who summoned her into his meetings with politicians and merchants alike. What was different now? Is it me? She whispered into the bedroom, her breath disturbing a fine layer of dust gathered on the wall. Juliet was a traitor. Juliet was a child. When push came to shove, maybe her parents had decided she wasn't competent enough. Or maybe it was them. Maybe whatever plans were being dreamed up behind closed doors were so horrid that they were too ashamed to pass them on. Juliet pulled the door open, popping her head out. At the other end of the hallway, a group of gossiping relatives bade one another a good night and dispersed, parting ways like they were taking separate exits in a stage play. Only when the coast was clear did Juliet slink out, trekking down the stairs and poking her head into the kitchen, where Kathleen was skinning an apple. Hey, Juliet said, leaning her elbows onto the counter. She switched to French, in case any maids were listening. We need to do something. And buy something, her cousin replied, thumb still working at the apple peels, what are you referencing? Juliet's gaze roamed around. The kitchen was empty, the hallways otherwise quiet. It was eerie for there to be so little noise, for the household to be absent of messengers dropping in and out. It made the mansion feel unwell, like some dark shroud had crept into the walls, muting sound and blocking sensation. I think we need to scare Rosalind, Juliet said. Just unpoo. The knife in Kathleen's hands came to a stop. Her eyes flickered up. Juliet, she said sharply. I can't sit around like this. The days were counting down. The clock kept ticking forward. I cannot claim to stop the nationalists. I do not claim to have the power to stop a whole political movement. But we can stop Dimitri from making it worse. Rosalind is sitting on his location. I know it. When Juliet fell quiet, she was breathing so hard that her chest heaved up and down. Kathleen was unspeaking for a moment, letting Juliet put herself together again, before shaking her head. What does it matter, Juliet? Kathleen asked quietly. Don't rush to answer me. Really ask yourself at first. What does it matter? Whatever is about to break out, what is one more element of chaos? It will be bullets against madness. Gangsters with knives against monsters with claws. It will be a fair fight. Juliet bit down on the inside of her cheeks. Of course it mattered. One life was one life. One life did not become forgettable merely because it was lost in the masses. She wouldn't regret the lives she had taken, but she would remember them. Before Juliet could say so, however, she was interrupted by the quiet groan of the front door opening. Its hinges squealed despite the messenger's effort, and when Juliet rushed into the living room, his wince was immediate. It was dusk. The house was dim with shadows. Nevertheless, Juliet immediately zeroed in on the letter the messenger held, marching his way. Give me that. I'm sorry, the messenger said. He attempted a firm tone, but his voice shook. This isn't for you, Miss Kai. Since when has anything, Juliet exclaimed, in this house been not for me. The messenger resolved not to answer. His lips thinning, he simply tried to push by, heading for the staircase. When Juliet was twelve, she had felt a sudden flare of pain inside her abdomen while watering the flowers over her Manhattan window. The feeling had spread like an internal invasion, had felt so hot and severe that she dropped the watering can with a spasm, watched it fall and smash to pieces on the pavement four stories below when she crumpled to the floor. Later, they would tell her that her appendix had ruptured, had refused to keep on functioning and had torn a hole in its own wall pushing infection into the rest of her body. That was what her anger felt like now. Like something had died, and now its vicious pus and poison had burst inside of her. Juliet unwound the garrote wire from her wrist. In one lunge, she had it around the messenger's throat, silencing his cry before it could escape. The letter, Kathleen. Kathleen snatched it quickly and Juliet held on to the stranglehold for just a second longer until the messenger slumped. The moment he did, Juliet loosened the wire and let the messenger collapse in unconsciousness. 
By then Kathleen was already reading the letter. By then her hand was pressed over her mouth, so much horror in her eyes that she could have been a painting rendered by tragedy. What? Juliet demanded. What is it? It's for your father, from the highest command within the Nationalists, Kathleen answered shakily. The Central Control Commission of the Kuomintang have made their decision. The Communist Party of China is anti-revolutionary and has undermined our national interest. We have voted unanimously for them to be purged from the Kuomintang and from Shanghai. We knew it was coming, Juliet said quietly. We knew. Kathleen thinned her lips. The letter was not finished yet. Having paled tremendously, she didn't speak the rest aloud, she merely flipped the letter around so Juliet could read it for herself. Powers of execution should be reserved for the elite, imprisonment for the masses. All members of the Scarlet Gang are to report for duty at the turn of midnight on April 12. The White Flowers may be treated as communists when the purge begins. When the city wakes again, we shall have no adversaries. We shall be one combined beast to fight the true enemy of imperialism. Put the Montagov's heads on pikes and be rid of them once and for all. In their very living room, the clock told for ten o'clock. Juliet staggered back. At the turn of midnight April 12th, a faint buzzing started up in her ears. Today, today, is April 11th. Put the Montagov's heads on pikes, was that what this blood feud had come to? Total and utter annihilation? Kathleen broke for the front door, the letter fluttering beside the unconscious messenger. She had already burst outside, progressing several steps down the main path before Juliet caught up to her, grabbing her cousin by the wrist and halting her in her tracks. What are you doing? Juliet demanded. The night was cold and dark around them. Half the lamps in the gardens were turned off, perhaps to save on electricity, perhaps to hide the fact that there was not a single guard standing sentry by the front gate. I'm going to warn them, Kathleen replied, her words a tight hiss. I'm going to help the workers fight back. They're allowing execution powers. It will be a bloodbath. The truth was, the bloodbath had long been building. The truth was, execution powers were already being used, it was only now coming right into the open. You don't have to. Juliet looked up at the windows across this side of the house, all illuminated. The night seemed so dark in comparison, its shadows almost liquid. When she lowered her voice, she almost thought she would choke on her next breath, like the darkness was pressing against her chest. We can run. It's over. Shanghai has been taken over by nationalists. Our way of life is dead in the ground. Everything either dead or dying. Juliet almost keeled over with the thought. All that she had worked for, all that she thought was her future, none of it mattered. Territories disappeared in minutes, loyalties switched in seconds, and revolution bowled over anything that was in its path. Mere moments ago, Kathleen said tightly, you were resolute to stop Dimitri. Mere moments ago, Juliet echoed, her voice breaking, I didn't know that there was an execution order for Roma's head. We have two hours, Biagie. Two hours to leave. To run far, far away. Gangsters never belonged in politics anyway. Slowly, Kathleen shook her head. You have to leave. I'm not going anywhere. They're going to kill them, Juliet. Civilians. Shop owners. Workers. That letter was a pretense, there will be no imprisonment. With the force of gangsters alongside the soldiers, anyone who takes to the streets in support of the communists will be shot on sight. It would be terror. Juliet did not deny that. If she went to her parents right now and demanded answers, they would not deny it either. She knew them too well to think otherwise. Maybe that was why she was afraid of confronting them. Maybe that was why she was choosing to run instead. Do you realize? Her tears refused to fall, but they hovered in a thick sheen over her eyes. We have passed violence, passed mere revolution. Nationalist against communist, this is civil war. You're enlisting yourself as a soldier. 
maybe I am. But you don't have to. Juliet did not mean to yell. But here she was. You're not actually one of them. Kathleen pulled away vehemently. Aren't I? she asked. I am at their meetings. I draw their posters. I know their protest calls. She tore her jade pendant off. Held it up, in the moonlight. Short of these riches, short of my last name, what is stopping me from being one of them? I could just as easily be another face in the factories. I could just as easily have been another abandoned child thrown onto the streets, begging for scraps. Juliet breathed in. And in. And in. I am selfish, she whispered. I want you to come with me. Around them, the lamps flickered, then turned off completely. With only moonlight illuminating the gardens, Juliet wondered briefly if this was some indication that trouble was coming to the Scarlet House. It was not. At times like these, trouble no longer needed to act under the guise of darkness. Trouble was a roaring, raging fire. Kathleen offered a small, shaky smile, then tied her pendant back on. We have been allowed selfishness, she said. But so many others in this city have not. I cannot find my own peace unless I help them, Juliet. I cannot find my peace with this city unless I stay. Juliet knew what a losing argument looked like. A long second passed, and Juliet waited to see if her cousin would falter, but she did not. Kathleen's expression remained determined, and some part of Juliet knew that this was a goodbye. Her face crumpling, she reached for Kathleen, pulling the two of them close in a tight hug. Do not die out there, she snapped. Do you understand me? Kathleen choked out a laugh. I'll try my best. Her embrace was equally fierce, as was her expression when they released each other. But you. We're under martial law. How are you two? They can block off our trains and dirt roads, but we're the city above the sea. They cannot monitor every swath of the Huangpu River. Kathleen shook her head. She knew how stubborn Juliet was when she needed something done. Find Dinao. He's a communist sympathizer. Dinao the fisherman? The one and the same. I'll get a note to him telling him to wait for you. Juliet felt a hot stone of gratitude royal in her stomach. Even at a time like this, Kathleen was running tasks for her. Thank you, she whispered. I don't care if this makes me too much of a westerner. I need you to hear my indebtedness. You only have two hours, Juliet, Kathleen said, waving her off. If you're going to run. I won't make it, I know. I'll buy everyone more time. I can hold off the purge until morning at least. Kathleen's eyes widened. You're not going to approach your parents, are you? No, Juliet didn't know how they would react. It was too risky. But I have a plan. Go. Don't waste time. Afar, a bird had started cawing. The sound was high-pitched, a warning from the city itself. With a firm nod, Kathleen stepped back, then gave Juliet's hand one last squeeze. Keep fighting for love, she whispered. It is worth it. Her cousin disappeared off into the night. Juliet allowed herself one ragged breath. She let the quavery sound rush outward and tear a rip into her composure before she inhaled deeply and clutched her hands over the silk of her dress. When Juliet stepped back inside her house, the living room remained silent, the messenger still lying on his side. She picked up the fallen letter and lifted her head, staring up the staircase. The light in her father's office was off. Now she knew, in the third-floor sitting room, her parents and whoever else they had deemed worthy to invite in were discussing senseless massacre for the sake of the scarlet survival. Juliet squeezed her eyes shut. The tears fell then, finding an easy path down her cheeks. Keep fighting for love. But she didn't want to. She wanted to hold love to her chest and run, run like hell so the rest of the world couldn't touch it. It was exhausting to care about everyone in the city. She thought she had the power to save them, protect them, but she was still one girl, shut out of everything important. If she was going to be treated like a mere girl, 
then she would act like one. The wind blew into the living room, the front door still cast a jar. Juliet shivered once, then suddenly couldn't stop shivering, the tremors rocking from head to toe. I will fight this war to love you, Roma had said, and now I will take you away from it. Enough was enough. In this moment, Juliet decided she did not care. This was a war they had never asked to be a part of. This was a war that had dragged them in before they had the chance to leave. Roma and Juliet had been born into feuding families, into a feuding city, into a country already fractured beyond belief. She was washing her hands of it. She was not fighting for love. She was protecting her own, everyone else's be damned. 38. The uniform was less itchy than Marshall had expected. He had grumbled like high hell when his father had tossed it at him upon his arrival, opting to fold his arms and demand that they throw him in a cell instead. General Shu had stared at him blandly, as had all his men, as if Marshall were a child throwing a tantrum in a candy store. It had seemed rather silly then. To stand around and waste time, achieving nothing meaningful save for being a big headache. It was only that if he remained petulant, he could fool himself into believing that someone was coming for him. That the city might stop fighting, that the gangs would go back to normal, that the white flowers would storm the place, waving for him to hurry and come home. But Marshall had been hiding out for months. The white flowers thought he was dead. The city had given up on him. There was no use digging his heels in and being difficult. Marshall inspected the cuff of his sleeve his attention drifting from the nationalist currently speaking. This was General Shu's residence, and his father and twenty-odd men were presently convening around the heavy wooden table in the council room, letting Marshall listen too, as if he were here to learn. There were no more seats available at the table, so Marshall stood by the door instead, leaning on the fraying wallpaper and eyeing the ceiling wondering if the creaking he heard late at night from his bedroom one floor above was the footsteps of his father, pacing the council room at odd hours. Ertzi. Marshall jumped. He had zoned out. When his eyes focused on the table again, the men were clearing out, and his father was staring at him, his hands behind his back. Come sit a minute. At the very least, Marshall hadn't missed anything. He had heard all he needed in the other meetings. The communists needed to go. Shanghai was theirs. The northern expedition would succeed. Blah, blah, blah. No campaigns to rush off to? Marshall remarked, dropping into a seat. General Xu didn't seem amused. The door closed after the final nationalist, and Marshall's father returned to the table, selecting the seat two away from Marshall. You are not being forced to remain here. Marshall snorted. Given the soldiers stationed around this house, you and I have very different definitions of what being forced means. Mere precautions. General Shu wrapped his knuckles on the table surface. Marshall's eyes shot to the sound immediately, stiffening at the move. It was how his father used to get his attention at the dinner table on the rare occasions he came to visit. Visit, as if it weren't his own family. You're young. You don't know what is best yet. What I must do is keep you within the most ideal conditions, even if I must compel it, and only then can you. Stop, Marshall pleaded. They had had enough low-toned, mean-spirited back and forth yesterday. He was hardly in the mood to start hashing out again how exactly a childhood kept out in the countryside qualified as an ideal condition. Get to the point. What am I doing here? Why do you care? For several long moments, General Xu said nothing. Then, this country is going to war. I was content to let you run yourself wild as a gangster when there seemed no harm, but it is different now. The city is dangerous. Your place is here. Marshall resisted the urge to laugh out loud. Not in humor, in belly deep, stinking resentment. I survived as a gangster in Shanghai for years. I can manage. Thanks. No General Shu turned to his side, looking across the top of the chair between them. You didn't, did you? At the merest provocation, the scarlet air asked you to play dead, and you did. 
Marshall was so tired of this being some crime. What was wrong with hiding? What was wrong with retreating and lying low, if only to survive and recoup, if only to fight another day? I bear no ill will to the Scarlet Air. Maybe you should. She is reckless and volatile. She is everything wrong with this city. I ask again, Marshall repeated through gritted teeth. Is there a point to this? His father could say that it was for his own good. He could pull up the city's every obituary, could show Marshall the sheer numbers that had been lost in these recent few years to the blood feud, a bullet through the chest for no reason other than wandering too close to the wrong territory. It didn't matter. It was all an excuse. The nationalists shunned the imperial monarchy, but when they marched into the city and took it, they acted just as conquering kings and empires did. Different titles, the same idea. Power was only long-lasting if it were a reign, and reigns needed heirs. Marshall's father never cared to find him when he was a child surviving off scraps. It was only now, when appearances became key, that he remembered Marshall existed. General Shu sighed, dropping the brewing argument. Instead, he reached into his jacket, his hands brushing past the flashing medals pinned to his lapel, and retrieved a small, square card. I divulge this information because I care. The card landed upon the table, face up. There is an execution order from the Kuomintang on the Montagovs. In a flash, Marshall shot to his feet, lunging for the small card and scanning the telegram. The stroke of midnight. No prisoners left alive. Call it off, Marshall demanded. His voice turned to steel. He hated when he sounded like this. It wasn't him. Call it off now. I can delay it, General Xu said evenly. I can continue delaying it. But I cannot call it off. No one has that power alone. Marshall's fists tightened. He imagined marching out right now, through the line of soldiers, past the tall, tall walls bordering the mansion. So you tell me as if I should be grateful, he asked. You tell me as if I should bless the Kuomintang that they are only soon to be dead? General Xu was not bothered by Marshall's outburst. He never was. I tell you so you realize what is left out there. Your former gangsters whose lives hang on a thread your scarlet air under her father's thumb, your white flower air with nothing left under his command. What remains for you? The only place where you are needed is here. As the Kuomintang leadership flock into the city, as the number of meetings rise, as they look to see where the next generation of capable leaders may stem from, you are needed. The telegram crinkled under Marshall's fingers. He was biting the inside of his cheeks so hard that he could taste the metallic tang of blood. The white flowers were crumbling. The white flowers hardly qualified as a gang any longer, never mind an empire that could exert power against the city. You cannot help your friends by running out, General Xu continued. But you can help by staying with me. I am willing to train you in your studies, your potential for leadership. I am willing to bring you up the chain of command to be my son in proper public view. A nationalist prodigy. An obedient son, one who had stayed in the house that day he found his mother dead, who hadn't fled the very second he envisioned living only with his stranger of a father. He wondered how much of his past he needed to erase, whether it was his history as a gangster or his history flirting with boys that would be more of a scandal. Do you promise? Marshall asked hoarsely. We can save my friends? You will help me? You will not abandon me? You will not leave me to fend for myself? General Xu nodded firmly, rising to his feet too. We can be a family again, Marshal, so long as you do not fight me. We could do grand things, make grand change. Marshal released the telegram, let it flutter back upon the table. I will keep your friends safe, General Xu finally said. I will protect them to the very best of my ability. But I will need your help. Don't you want a purpose? Don't you want to stop running? Yes, Marshall replied quietly. Yes, I would like that. Good, General Xu said. He dropped both his hands on Marshall's shoulders, giving a squeeze. 
it almost felt fatherly. It almost felt gentle. Very good. If Roma looked at one more map, he feared he would fry his brain. With a huff, he pushed all the papers out of the way, dragging a hand through his hair and musing his careful combing beyond repair. A mess. Everything was a goddamned mess, and he couldn't begin to imagine how the white flowers could survive this. His father kept himself locked in his office. The other powerful men in the white flowers were either mysteriously missing or had outright signaled their intent to disappear. It hadn't been like this immediately after the takeover, but it seemed the more time passed, the clearer it was that there was no reverse button. Their contacts in the foreign concessions were lost, their agreements with militia forces across all territory had collapsed. Lord Montagu had very few options. Either gather his numbers together and wage outright battle on two groups of politicians, communist and nationalist alike, or tuck tail and disintegrate. The first was not even in the realm of possibility, so the second it needed to be. If only his father would actually open his door when Roma knocked. So many years of Roma trying to prove himself, and for what? They would have ended up here anyway, a city in flames, whether Roma behaved or not. Roma. Roma sat upright, stretching his body so he could peer through his half-open door. It was late at night, the light at his desk flickering at random. Something was wrong with the wires in the house, and he suspected it was because the electric factories and power lines across the city were still sitting in ruins. Benedict? Roma called back. Is that you? His lamp made a sound. With a suddenness that almost gave Roma a fright, the bulb went out completely. At the same time, footsteps were thudding up the stairs and down the hall, and when Benedict burst through Roma's door in a complete rush, Roma's immediate instinct was to assume his cousin had had an epiphany for Marshall's rescue. Then Benedict slumped to rest his hands on his knees, his face so pale as to look sickly, and Roma bolted to his feet. Not an epiphany. Are you okay? he demanded. Have you heard? Benedict gasped. He staggered forward, looking as if he would fall. Heard what? In half darkness, his sight guided only by the light of the hallway, Roma smacked his hands along his cousin's arms. He found no wounds. Are you injured? So you haven't heard, Benedict said. Something about his tone brought Roma's eyes up, snapping to attention. There are confirmed reports. Nationalists, communists, scarlets, they're all talking about it. I wager it was not supposed to leak past the scarlet circles, but it did. About what? Roma resisted the urge to shake his cousin, if only because color still had not returned to Benedict's pale cheeks. Benedict, what are you talking about? Benedict did stumble to the floor then, landing hard into a sitting position. Juliet is dead, he whispered. Dead by her own hand. Juliet was not dead. She was, however, at risk of collapsing from overexertion, given how hard she had run across the city. In an effort to hurry as fast as possible, she had possibly twisted her ankle and blown out her lungs. Perhaps lungs did not blow out so easily, but the tightness in her chest said otherwise. Affording herself a mere minute of rest, Juliet pulled her hat low over her face and leaned against the exterior wall of White Flower headquarters, heaving for breath behind the building. She had managed to push the purge to four in the morning. Any later than that and her ruse could fall through if the nationalists demanded further explanation. The plan had unfolded so smoothly that Juliet just knew something was going to go wrong. She had succeeded in sneaking into her father's empty office, succeeded in forging a letter with his handwriting, and stamped it in his name. To the Chinese, a man's personal stamp was as good as an unforgeable signature, never mind how insensible that was given Lord Kai locked his in a drawer Juliet knew how to open. She had succeeded in pressing down the ink, in folding up the letter with its contents brief and succinct, my daughter is dead, a dagger to her own heart. While I understand the importance of revolution, Please allow all scarlets to mourn until daybreak before any action is taken. 
she had even succeeded in prodding the unconscious messenger awake and threatening him at knife point to take the letter and deliver it to the same nationalist who had sent Lord Kai the last correspondence, promising that she would peel his skin like a sliced pear if he tattled about Juliet being alive. The moment the messenger ran out the door, Juliet charged for the nearest phone. She needed to warn Roma, warn him that there was an order for his execution, and warn him that she was very much alive no matter what the streets were about to say. That was when Juliet remembered the lines were down. Ta Madi. She tried, of course. Tried calling and calling in case the operator centers had one or two workers mingling around. The line refused to connect. There was not a single messenger around the house to run a warning to the Montagovs, they were all out, dispersed across the city, lying in wait like live snakes in tall grass. Now it was already past midnight. She had spared precious time in packing first, jewelry and weapons and cash shoved into a burlap sack slung around her shoulders. If she was going to run, she was going to run with all the means possible to survive. Who was to say how long it would be before she could come back? Who was to say if Shanghai would ever heal enough for her to come back at all? Juliet slunk around the side of the building, then took a sharp turn in her route hurrying into another thin alley. She was not walking toward the front door of headquarters, instead, she needed to get to the building behind their central block. From above, the darkness of the clouds beat down as if it were oppressive heat, so heavy that the lone street lamp some paces away seemed like the only salvation for miles. Juliet came to a stop outside the other building. Listening for sound and hearing nothing, she knocked. The shuffle of footsteps came immediately, like the occupant inside had been waiting for someone. When the door opened and a flood of light bled into the heavy night, a woman was blinking at Juliet, young, Chinese, wearing an apron dusted with flour. This used to be how Juliet snuck into the Montagov house in the few times she had dared it. It had been years since her last attempt, by now the people living behind the central block had long moved, bringing in strangers for replacements. Which apartment are you in? Juliet asked, not bothering with pleasantries. I, what? Which apartment? Juliet repeated. You don't occupy the whole building, do you? The woman blinked again, then with delay, shook her head. I am only this floor, she said, gesturing behind her. Some renters in between, and at the top is my elderly father. Juliet withdrew a clump of money and pressed it into the woman's hands. Let me through, would you? I just need to use his window. I. After a long second of staring at the sum of money in her hands, the woman made a stammering noise and let Juliet into the building. Thank you, Juliet breathed. She spared a glance over her shoulder before stepping through the threshold. If you're waiting for someone to come home tonight, I urge you to stay in. Don't leave, understand me? The woman nodded, her eyebrows knitting together. Juliet didn't wait for further invitation, she surged forward, trekking up the nearest set of stairs that appeared. All the buildings in these parts of the city were built in a labyrinthine manner, window panes shooting out from staircase banisters and rooms leading into rooms leading into other rooms, which held the next set of stairs up. Juliet finally found the floor she wanted her memory withstanding the years. When she eased open the door into the dark bedroom, she found an elderly man sleeping in his bed, the curtains to his window undrawn, a flood of silver illuminating his frail form. Careful not to let her shoes click on the hardwood floor, Juliet crept to the window and lifted it, shivering with the gust of wind. The back of this building was directly facing the back of White Flower headquarters and they were so close to one another that when Juliet reached out, she easily slid open Roma's window and climbed over. For one exhale, her body was dangling four floors above ground, one wrong twitch away from falling and shattering into pieces. Then she had ducked through the window, softly touching down in Roma Montagov's bedroom. Juliet looked around. The room was empty. Where the hell is he? Roma, Juliet called softly like he might possibly be hiding. When there was no response, she cursed viciously. Think, think. Where could he have gone? 
Juliet hurried to the door and pulled it open quietly, eyeing the empty hallway. There was considerable noise coming from downstairs, like white flowers were still entertaining themselves despite the late hour. For a moment Juliet simply did not know what to do, short of slipping into the hallway and closing Roma's bedroom door behind her, her heart pounding a crescendo in her chest. Then she turned to her side and found a small face watching her from the crack of a shoe cupboard. Oh my God, Juliet whispered in Russian. Elisa Nikolaevna, are you trying to give me a heart attack? Elisa climbed out of the small cupboard, straightening to her full height. You're supposed to be dead. Juliet reared back. How did you know? How did I know that you were dead? Elisa asked. I heard Benedict bring the news in. Roma ran out as soon as he heard. Oh. Oh, no, no, no. Where did he go? Juliet breathed. Elisa, where did he go? Elisa shook her head. I don't know. I've just been thinking in the cupboard since then. I was about to mourn you too, you know. It was only ten minutes ago. Juliet pressed her fist to her mouth, thinking fast. Within the house, there came a chiming sound, and she was willing to bet that it was signaling the hour, one o'clock, the new morning. Listen to me. Juliet kneeled suddenly, so that she wasn't looming over Elisa. She clamped her hands on the girl's shoulders, her grip tight. Elisa, there's a purge coming. I need you to go downstairs and warn everyone, warn as many people as you can. Then I need you to pack whatever you cannot bear to live without and come with me. Elisa stared forward. Her eyes were as big as a doe's, amber brown and filled with concern. Come with you, she echoed. To where? To find your brother, Juliet answered. Because we're leaving the city. 39. Where could he be? Juliet kicked a shop front wall, scuffing her shoes with dust and mud. Patiently, Elisa waited for Juliet to kick three more times, chewing on her nails. There was a loud noise in the distance, and at once, Juliet and Elisa peered down the dark, silent road. No result came of the noise. All around them, the city simply sat waiting. Perhaps the Bund, Elisa suggested. Along the Huangpu. At two in the morning? Before vacating the house, Elisa had warned as many white flowers as possible to run and hide within the city while there was still the shield of night. Word had likely gotten out to the wider circles that something was soon to come. There was something in the air already. A high note, ringing beyond the human ear. An inaudible hum, operating on some different frequency. He thinks you're dead, who knows where he might go? No. He hates vast spaces. He wouldn't go near the water to mourn. Juliet paced along the street, smacking lightly at her own face as if physical sensation could draw forth some ideas. Elisa kept chewing on her nails. It didn't just seem like he was running out to get away from the news, Elisa said slowly. It seemed like he had something he needed to do. Juliet threw her hands in the air. We had little else to do except. Find Dimitri. Stop the madness. Did he say anything about going after Dimitri Voronin? Elisa shook his head. I thought you didn't know where Dimitri was. We don't. Juliet gave Elisa a sidelong glance. How did you know that? With a roll of her eyes, Elisa tapped her ear. It was hard to believe this was the same girl who had fallen comatose so many months ago, waking thin and frail on her hospital bed. She seemed to have grown a spine that was twice as thick in the time since then. I know everything. All right, miss I know everything, where is your brother? Elisa only sagged in reply, and Juliet immediately felt terrible for her attitude. How old was Elisa Montagova now? Twelve? Thirteen? Pain at that age was an eternal thing, a feeling that might never fade. It would, of course. Pain always faded, even if it refused to fully disappear. But that was a lesson that could only come with time too. I'm sorry, Juliet said. She slumped against the wall. I'm scared for him. 
If we can't find Roma before the nationalists release their men onto the streets, they will get to him first. They would not hesitate. The Kuomintang had held back for so long, had looked upon this city for years and years as it lived its glory age of jazz clubs and silent films, had broiled in anger to see Shanghai singing while the rest of the country starved. Perhaps their true target of anger were the imperialists hiding behind their chain-link fences in the concessions. But when one held guns and batons in their hands, did a true target of anger even matter? What else mattered except, at last, an excuse for release? Elisa suddenly perked up again, her head tilting to the side. Even if Roma doesn't know where Dimitri is, what if he is still trying to stop him? Juliet pushed off the wall. She started to frown. In what manner? This. Elisa grabbed Juliet's arm, then tapped her inner elbow, indicating to the blue veins running translucent under her skin. The vaccine. The answer struck. With a gasp, Juliet started to push at Elisa, steering them down the street. Lawrence, Juliet said. He's with Lawrence. It was the man who believed her first. The same one from that alley, whose head had been bleeding something fierce. He certainly looked healed now, if a little rough, standing behind the faces of the General Labor Union's leadership, faces that Kathleen was sure she should recognize, though she couldn't quite put a name to any of them. The most important communist powers were scattered about the city, doing whatever it was that revolution depended on. Those who were supposed to keep house below them, the ones who were camped out now at the stronghold that Kathleen rushed into, had only frowned when she tried to explain what was coming, when she insisted that those workers flocking onto the streets with labor union bands on their arms were not workers at all, but Scarlet's intent on slaughter. The man had to have been someone's son, someone's something important. It took a whisper from him, a whisper to another whisper to a throat being cleared, and then the man at the center of the room, taking his glasses off, said, if there is massacre coming and you have arrived to warn us, how can we possibly stop it? The nationalists hold an army. We are only the poor. We are the ordinary. Kathleen folded her arms. She considered the group seated before her, thinking how typical it was that they would say such things. These people here, seated around the table, were not the poor and the ordinary. They were the ones privileged enough to lead a movement. If she could, she would blast her voice up into the heavens and warn the people, the true poor and ordinary people, directly, because that was who she wanted to protect. Not the few thinkers, not the men who thought themselves revolutionaries. At the end of the day, movements survived, but the individual could be replaced. That was all she was. One girl, doing all she could for peace. They thought they had the element of surprise, Kathleen said evenly. So tell your leaders to flee before they can be imprisoned, regroup, wait for another day. Tell your people to rise up, become so mighty that the gangsters will struggle to bring their swords down upon innocents on the street. When she looked up, the whole room was watching. It is very simple, she finished. When they come, be ready. They started to move. They started to pass messages, write notes, prepare telegrams for different cities in case the attack spread farther. Kathleen merely watched, sitting primly on one of the tables. There was some bubble of emotion stirring in her chest. Some strange feeling in realizing that she was not here because she had to be, because the Scarlets had sent her. In this space, at this time, she was not a Scarlet at all. Perhaps she would never be a Scarlet again. She had spent all these years watching, mimicking, adapting. Making herself into the loyal inner circle member, someone willing to die for the family. But she wasn't willing, had never been willing. It had always been about maintaining whatever approach necessary to ensure order, but now order was gone. Kathleen peeled her gloves off, scrunching up the rich silk fabric until it was bald in her hands. The scarlet way of life was dead. The safety net was gone, but so too were the constraints. No more family members watching for the faintest sign of disloyalty. No more hierarchy and Lord Kai dictating their every move. All these years, Kathleen Lang breathed when the Scarlet Gang breathed. 
Kathleen Lang walked when the Scarlet Gang told her to walk. Kathleen Lang didn't exist except to be someone in line with the Scarlet Gang. Except to be the perfect image of someone who was worthy of protection and safety. And when the Scarlet Gang faded away, so too would Kathleen. When the Scarlet Gang removed itself, Kathleen Lang halted like a music box ballerina, a dead girl's name who spun for their eyes. The gloves fluttered to the floor. The Scarlet Way of Life was dead. Kathleen Lang was dead, had always been dead. But Celia Lang was not. Celia had always been here, biding her time, waiting for the moment she could feel safe. So how did you come across this information? The man suddenly came to sit down, his shoes stepping over the fallen gloves without noticing, eyes too focused on the frantic scene before them. Doesn't really matter, does it, she replied. You can see it is true. You only have to send people out to poke around the corners of the city, and you will see the gangsters dressed, pretending to be workers. Hmm, the man's gaze flickered to her now. Your face looks familiar. Aren't you Scarlet affiliated? Celia stood up, fetching her dirty gloves and dropping them into the trash can. No, she said. I am not. Benedict slammed up against the doors of the lab, blocking the exit with his body. Some paces away, a tired Lawrence who had been awoken from his sleep was blinking in trepidation, not knowing why Roma was acting this way. Listen to me, Benedict said lowly. You'll be shot on sight. Move aside. Roma's voice was lifeless. So too were his eyes, a mass of darkness swallowing up his stare. The strangest thing was that Benedict recognized himself in that expression recognized that same twisted sense of rage that showed itself in recklessness. Is that what I looked like? You said we were coming here to check on the vaccine. Benedict hissed. He made another grab for the jar in Roma's hands. Now, instead, you're running off with some concoction to blow up the Scarlet House a second time. That's not what Juliet would have wanted. Don't tell me what Juliet would have wanted. Roma snapped. Don't tell. Benedict took his chance to dive for the jar. Roma saw it coming and darted back two steps, but Benedict outright lunged, pushing his cousin to the linoleum floor and pinning his arm down. Lawrence made another concerned noise, but otherwise remained motionless by the tables, his eyes swiveling about the scene. At least wait, Benedict said, his knees on Roma's stomach. Wait to see why. Since when did Juliet have any reason to take a dagger to her own heart? So they killed her, Roma seethed. They killed her, and they're going to get away with it. Benedict pushed on Roma's attempt to sit up. This isn't some murder on the streets, this is the Scarlet Gang. You've always known the danger of gangsters. You live it every day. Roma stilled. He breathed in, then again, then again and suddenly Benedict realized it was because his cousin was struggling to fill his lungs. She would never, he managed. Never. Benedict swallowed hard. He couldn't allow this. It was for Roma's own good. There are scarlets everywhere in the city right now, he said slowly. They're plotting something. You cannot go make it worse. His words had the opposite effect. Benedict had intended to pacify and instead a vein started to throb at Roma's neck. Roma shoved Benedict off, fast, and got to his feet, but Benedict wouldn't give up so easily. He lunged for the jar again. When he only managed to catch Roma's wrist, he switched from trying to wrest away the explosive and simply grabbed a hold of his cousin with both hands, keeping him from opening the lab's doors, keeping him from running through the building and out into the night. Roma came to a halt. Slowly, he turned around. The deadness in his eyes had acquired a murderous glint. Tell me, he said. Were you not the one who sought revenge when you thought Marshall was dead? Benedict scoffed. That was a mistake. The fire in Roma's eyes only grew stronger. I never stormed into the Scarlet House. I never did anything rash. Maybe you should have. No, Benedict spat. He hardly wanted to think about Marshall right now, when he was trying to talk Roma out of a death wish. 
What good could it have done? What good? Roma hissed an echo. It doesn't matter, does it? He came back to life. Roma tried to pull away, Benedict would not relinquish. In a flash, Roma had his pistol in his free hand, but it was not to point at Benedict. He brought it to his own temple. Hey! Benedict froze, afraid that any sudden movement would nudge at the trigger. All he could hear through his ears was the sound of rushing blood. Roma, don't. Roma, do not be a fool, Lawrence urged from where he stood. So let go of me, Roma said. Let go of me, Benedict. Benedict let out a low breath. I will not. It was a standstill, then. It was a matter of Benedict believing that his cousin could not be this lost, and yet he was not certain. He could not know if in the next few seconds Roma would call him on his bluff and splatter his brains across the lab. Benedict let go. And at that very moment, the lab door flew open, illuminating the figures who stood at the threshold. Roma. What are you doing? Roma whirled around, releasing an audible gasp at the sound of the voice. Benedict, already facing the doors, could only blink. Once. Twice. It wasn't a hallucination. Juliet Kai was really standing there, wearing a ridiculous hat, with Elisa behind her, both of them panting for breath as if they had been on a long run. Look, Benedict said faintly, hardly hearing his own words as they slipped out. You got your resurrection too. Roma didn't seem to hear him. He was already dropping his pistol like it had burned him, dropping the jar in his other hand. Benedict doved to catch it, not daring to find out how explosive materials would react when thrown against the hard floor. By the time he had caught the jar, saving it from smashing upon the linoleum at their feet, Roma had already reached Juliet, kissing her hard on the mouth. The embrace was so fierce that Juliet immediately stretched one of her hands back, trying to cover Elisa's eyes. Elisa darted under Juliet's hand and mimed a gag to Benedict. Benedict was still in such shock that he couldn't laugh along. Are you okay? Roma and Juliet asked in unison the moment they broke apart. Benedict got to his feet. The jar remained intact. He passed it to Lawrence, and Lawrence took it quickly, shelving the explosive away. They were hurrying to put it out of Roma's sight, but with Juliet here now, Benedict doubted Roma even remembered why he wanted that jar. I thought you were dead, Roma was saying to Juliet. Don't ever do that to me. The better question is, Benedict cut in, why are you so fond of faking deaths? Juliet shook her head, her arm twining around Roma's as she hurried him back into the lab. She gestured for Elisa to come along too, letting the doors fall closed. Faking my death would have required actually producing a false corpse, as I did for Marshall, Juliet said evenly. All I did here was lie. I never meant for it to reach you. It shouldn't have leaked past the scarlet circles. She cited Lawrence, still warily hovering by the work tables. Hello. May I return to bed now? Lawrence asked wearily. No, Juliet answered before any of the Montagovs could. You need to hear this too. There's a purge coming. That's why I lied. To push it off. A what? Roma was still in a daze, blinking rapidly to clear the mist over his eyes. Juliet placed her hands on one of the tables. It looked like she was physically bracing herself, and when she lifted her head to speak, it was not Roma she was looking at, but Benedict. There's an execution order for your heads. White flowers are to be treated as communists, and just before dawn breaks, Scarlet's and Kuomintang soldiers alike are going to start shooting and arresting. The command has been given. Anyone opposing the nationalists is to be eliminated. We have to go. Wait, what? Roma's voice rose another octave, prompting Elisa to reach out and hug his arm. Benedict, meanwhile, simply exhaled a breath letting the information sink in. A full city purge. At last the nationalists had pushed themselves into full throttle, intent on taking Shanghai. We can't, Roma continued. 
Dimitri is still out there with his monsters. I will accept stepping out of politics. I will accept hightailing it out of the way if it's the nationalists and communists colliding against each other. But while we can stop Dimitri, we must. Was it even possible at this point? How could they stop him? How could they kill men who turned to monsters when the monsters seemed so indestructible? Juliet grimaced, her eyes flickering again to Benedict as if to ask for help. Before she could speak, it was Lawrence who cleared his throat, interrupting her. You may not need to. Lawrence gestured to the back of the lab. One of the machines had been humming away, lit from the inside. The vaccine stops the madness, no? It won't solve the physical monster problem, but it will take away a large portion of their power. Roma's eyes grew wide. The vaccine is ready? Not at this precise moment. But give it a few days, perhaps. I have the formula. I have the supplies. I can dump it in the whole city's water supply. No one even has to know that they're being inoculated. Which means, Juliet said quietly, we have done all that we can here, Roma. For the sake of your life, we have to leave. All of us. Right now, before dawn breaks. Benedict finally understood why Juliet's gaze kept drifting back to him. Okay, Roma said, defeated, in collision with Benedict's sudden no. The room fell quiet, nothing but the sound of machines humming. Then, when Benedict was sure he had summoned everyone's attention, not without Marshall, Juliet clicked her tongue. I was afraid you would say that. She finally glanced away. If Marshall is with his father, he is safer than he would be anywhere else. He may be safe, but he will be trapped there for however long. If we're getting out of the city, out of the country, we get out for good. We're not leaving him behind. Roma made a thoughtful noise. He wiped a smear of dust off Elise's cheek, who, to her credit, had remained quiet through all this. Benedict's right, he said. If there is indeed a purge coming, it doesn't stop with one event. Let's say Lawrence distributes the vaccine. Let's say the madness disappears and the city returns to relative normalcy. But with this violence on the communists and the white flowers, the city will never return to normal, Juliet finished heavily, like she didn't want to say it aloud. One purge was never one purge. The nationalists were not only forcing out all opposition, they also had to maintain their control. No communist could show their face on these streets again. No white flower could continue living within the city's borders, at least not without hiding their identity. The purge would never end. So, Benedict finished, we need to get Marshall. Juliet tossed her hat off, throwing it to the table. Her hair was a tangled mess. As much as I agree, how do you propose we do that? I go alone. All heads in the room snapped to Benedict. Even Lawrence looked flabbergasted. Are you trying to get yourself killed? Juliet asked. I just said that all white flowers seen on the streets upon daybreak will be slaughtered. I am not as recognizable as Roma is, Benedict replied easily. Especially not if I dress as your scarlets will be. I have already seen them. They are in workers' overalls, with a band over their arm. He gestured to his biceps. They seek white flowers to execute by looking for white flowers. Who is to say what I am if I look just like them? It's a good plan, Roma said. It's a horrible plan, Juliet said. Roma picked up Juliet's hat. But all the nationalists will be on the streets. Marshall will probably be unguarded. Juliet snatched the hat back. Why do you think they have allied with the Scarlets? They always send the smaller men to go do their dirty work, their bloody work. You cannot guarantee that General Shu himself won't have his eye on Marshall. At the very least, he will not have backup. Benedict pushed up his sleeves, heaving an exhale. We waste time by arguing. It is this or nothing. The two of you cannot even consider following me. Especially into a nationalist stronghold. You will be hauled off in a blink no matter how many ugly hats you wear. 
Juliet threw the hat at Benedict. He dodged easily, though even with Juliet's deathly aim, the soft article would have bounced off him anyway. The lab fell silent again. Elise's eyes darted back and forth, trying to follow the situation. Under one condition, Roma finally said. If you cannot get to him, you must give up. Marshall's own father will not put a call out for his head. But if caught, they will execute you. Benedict's mouth opened to argue, but then, just subtly enough that Roma didn't notice, Juliet raised her hand to her lips and pressed a finger there, shaking her head. I have a contact at the Bund who can smuggle us out, she said, closing her fist and appearing normal the moment Roma turned to look at her. Martial law cannot restrict him from sailing to catch fish, but the latest we can depart is noon. Any longer, and I suspect I will be found. Juliet's stare was harsh upon Benedict, communicating alongside her words. You must meet us at the Bund then. No matter what. Benedict knew what Juliet was trying to say even if she didn't say it aloud. If he was not there, they still needed to leave. She would knock Roma and Elisa out and drag them if she needed, but she would not risk their lives and let them remain behind for him. Benedict nodded, a smile, a true smile, coming to his lips. For perhaps the first time, he trusted Juliet wholeheartedly. At noon, he promised. 40. They had boarded up the lab, going as far as to smash one of the windows in advance, so Scarlet's passing by would think it already scouted and searched. Any moment now, the bugle call would sound across the city, summoning all those under nationalist command. Juliet wondered if any Scarlet's mourned. If, in hearing of her death, they had felt a genuine drop of sadness, or if she was merely a figurehead they had been forced to respect. By now her parents had surely poked through her scheme, had received condolences back from the nationalists about their dead daughter and searched through the house to find her missing. It would not take long to put two and two together and figure that Juliet was the one who had announced her own death. Miss Kai. Juliet lifted her head off Lawrence's kitchen table. His apartment was at the back of the labs, and after throwing a pile of shelves onto the floor to make the hallways look ransacked, they had deemed it unlikely any of the gangsters or soldiers would find their way here. Still, Juliet had shoved a knife across the door latch, and if anyone was to try barging through, they would have to snap the steel first. Yes. Lawrence passed her a thin blanket. Juliet had trouble reaching for it, only because she could not see where she was reaching. She had been awake for long enough that her vision was starting to blur, and there was only one candle for light, flickering in the adjoined living room. The sun would be up any second, but they had just finished taping the windows of Lawrence's apartment with layers upon layers of newspapers, blacking out the outside and preventing the outside from looking in. If all is settled, I am going back to sleep, Lawrence announced. Roma looked up suddenly, frowning from across the apartment. He was on the sofa with Elisa, a needle and thread in his hand as he fixed a rip in Elisa's sleeve, leaning the both of them so closely into the candlelight that there was a risk Elisa's blonde hair would catch a flame. Lawrence, Roma said, almost chidingly as he finished his stitching. How can you sleep? There's about to be mass slaughter outside. I highly suggest you children do the same, Lawrence chided back. He plucked an orange from his fruit bowl and set it down in front of Juliet. Take it from someone who ran once too, when you leave all that you know, you want to be well rested. Juliet picked up the orange. Thank you. Lawrence was already shuffling away, moving from the kitchen into the living room. Miss Montagova, you will take the spare room, yes? Miss Kai, you should find that the sofa will suffice, and, Roma, I will find a floor sheet for you. Juliet watched Roma frown, watched him look at the sofa and mentally measure its width, finding it would probably fit too. You don't have to. Thank you. Juliet repeated, cutting in. Lawrence disappeared down the hallway. Juliet, what? He's old, Roma. She pushed herself up from the kitchen table and took the orange with her, peeling the skin into neat strips. Are you trying to horrify him with your social impropriety? 
social impropriety while there is mass slaughter outside, Roma grumbled. Juliet pulled an orange segment free and plopped it in her mouth. She started to walk around the living room, inspecting the various vases that Lawrence owned. As she poked her nose here and there, she heard Elisa begin to mutter to Roma. Only Elisa's version of muttering was loud enough that each word was quite clearly enunciated. Roma. What is it? He prodded her sleeve. Another rip? No, Elisa whispered, frowning and drawing her arm away. So did you. Did you marry Juliet Kai? Juliet choked, the orange immediately lodging in her throat. I, even by the dim light, Roma looked faintly red. We are well acquainted. Half spluttering, half holding back the most inappropriately timed laugh, Juliet managed to cough the orange out of her windpipe. Roma, meanwhile, cleared his throat, getting to his feet and nudging his sister up too. Come on, Elisa. Go get some rest. He quickly pushed Elisa down the hallway, exchanging some words with Lawrence before Lawrence retired into his room. Juliet thought she heard vaccine, and are you certain? There was some more murmuring from the guest room before Roma emerged again, fumbling around in the dark with something that looked like a mat. Lawrence insisted I take this, Roma explained, setting it onto the floor. By now Juliet had finished her orange and calmed down, seated upon the sofa. The humor was an instinctive reaction, the city was collapsing outside, and blood was going to run so thickly that the roads would turn to an ocean of red. Laughing was the only way she wouldn't cry. And will you? Juliet asked. Roma's head jerked up. His eyes narrowed, trying to gauge if Juliet was asking a genuine question or teasing. She smiled. Roma exhaled in relief, kicking aside the mat. No one holds a straight face like you do, he said, joining her on the sofa. I'm still mad at you, Dorigea. Juliet reeled back, placing a hand to her heart. Mad at me? I thought we already got past that. I already forgave you for everything else, Roma said. I'm mad at you for having me think you were dead. Do you know how horrible that was? Juliet shifted her knee. It pressed up against Roma's leg. He didn't move away. She would take that as a forgiving sign. Benedict lived with the same feeling for months. Which is why I didn't think you would pull it twice, Roma said. Which is why I thought it to be true. Juliet reached out with her hand. Gently, she pressed her palm to his cheek, fingers skimming softly on skin, and Roma reached up to clasp his hand on hers. I should be mad at you too, she said quietly. How dare you take a gun to your head as if your life is something that can be thrown away. Roma leaned into her touch with a sigh, his eyes fluttering closed. He looked young. Vulnerable. This was the boy she had fallen in love with, underneath all the harsher layers he needed to wear to survive. But in her mind's eye, she was remembering the sight before her when she had pushed open the doors to the lab Roma, his pistol pressed to his temple. Roma, looking ready to shoot. I panicked, he said. I wouldn't have pulled the trigger. I only needed Benedict to believe I would so he could let me go. But the threat had to have come from somewhere. The very fact that Benedict had believed it meant Roma was capable of doing it. Of threatening his own life just to get to her. Juliet couldn't shake off her own ill ease. She didn't want to be a girl who incited harm. She didn't want it, but perhaps by mere virtue of being Juliet Kai, she was the embodiment of this city's violence. You can't ever do that. Juliet tightened her fingers. You can't choose me above everything else. I will not accept it. A beat passed. The candle was dancing vigorously atop the table, casting them both in moving shadows. I won't, Roma whispered. When he opened his eyes again, slowly to adjust to the dim light, he added, Don't leave me, Juliet. It sounded like a plea. A plea to the heavens, to the stars, to the forces that drew their fates. I would never, Juliet replied solemnly. Too many times had she done it already. I will never leave you. Roma loosed a soft breath. I know. 
he pressed a kiss to the inside of her wrist. I think I was more afraid that they took you from me. Oh. His admission stirred a tightness in her throat. This was their lives. Constantly operating in fear, even when they were supposed to have power. Wasn't power supposed to provide control? Wasn't power supposed to solve everything? Juliet pulled her hand away, only so she could extend her pinky finger instead. With my whole heart, she promised, if I have any say in the matter, you will never lose me. The candlelight flickered. Roma's eyes, too, flickered up and down, from her face to her hand. Is this, he said, a strange American custom? Juliet huffed a short laugh, grabbing Roma's hand and hooking her pinky with his. Yes, she answered. It means I cannot break my promise or you may chop my finger off. That's the Japanese interpretation. Yubikiri. Her eyes snapped up. So you do know what it means? Roma didn't give her the satisfaction of being caught out. His expression forcibly serious, he only lifted her hand and smoothed out her fist, so that all her fingers were separated, her palm held facing him. What if I don't want this one, he asked, tapping her pinky. He moved his touch to the one beside, her ring finger, and grazed the length of it. What if I want this one? Juliet's heart started to thud in her chest. So morbid, she remarked. Hmm, Roma continued to draw a circle about her finger, leaving no question for what he was implying. I'm not sure if morbidity was what I was going for. Then what? Juliet wanted to hear it. What were you going for? Roma breathed a laugh. I'm asking you to marry me. All the blood in Juliet's body rushed to her head. She could feel her cheeks blazing red, not out of embarrassment, but rather because there was such an uproar swirling inside her that the hot surge of emotion had nowhere else to go. My pinky promise isn't good enough for you? Juliet teased. Did Elisa put you up to this? This time it was Roma's turn to press both his palms on Juliet's cheeks. She had thought it would be too dark to notice her blush, yet Roma noticed, a smile twitching on his lips. She doesn't have the power to put me up to this, he said. Marry me, Juliet. Marry me so we can erase the blood feud between us and start utterly anew. Juliet inched forward. Roma's hands dropped to her neck, smoothing back the loose hair curling around her shoulders. He seemed to think that she was leaning in for a kiss, but she was in fact reaching behind him, and with a start, Roma blinked, citing one of Lawrence's many copies of the Bible in her hands. I wasn't aware that you were religious. I am not, Juliet replied. I thought you needed a Bible to get married in this city. Roma blinked. So you're saying yes? Shagwa. She raised the Bible, pretending to beat him with it. Do you think I'm holding it for a weapon? Of course I'm saying yes. Quick as a flash, Roma had his arms around her, pushing her upon the sofa. The Bible fell to the floor with a thump. A burst of laughter rose to Juliet's lips, muffled only by Roma's kiss. For a moment that was all that mattered, Roma, Roma, Roma. Then there was the faintest sound of gunfire, and both of them gasped, breaking apart to listen. The windows were blacked out. They were safe. Only that didn't change the reality, didn't mean the world outside was not brightening with light and running with red. It had started. Although faint, a bugle call could be heard reverberating through the whole city, trickling even into this apartment. The purging had started. Juliet sat up, reaching for the fallen Bible. She doubted Lorenz would be happy if they scuffed it up. I should have tried sending more help, she whispered. I should have sent more warning. Roma shook his head. It's your own people. What were you to do? Indeed, that was always the problem. Scarlet or white flower. Communist or nationalist. In the end, the only ones who seemed to benefit from so much infighting were the foreigners sitting pretty behind their concession borders. I despise it, she whispered. If my people can fire on the masses merely because they have communist sympathies, I despise them. Roma did not say anything. 
he only brushed her hair behind her ear, letting her tremble in her anger. I will be free of my name. Juliet looked up. I will take yours. There was a moment of stillness, a moment where Roma gazed upon her like he was trying to commit her features to memory. Then. Juliet, he breathed. It is not as though my name is any better. It is not as though there is less blood on mine. You can call a rose something else, but it remains yet a rose. Juliet flinched, hearing a shout outside. So we are never to change, she asked. We are forever blood-soaked roses? Roma took her hand. Pressed a kiss to her knuckles. A rose is a rose, even by another name, he whispered. But we choose whether we will offer beauty to the world, or if we will use our thorns to sting. They could choose. Love or blood. Hope or hate. I love you, Juliet whispered fiercely. I need you to know. I love you so much, it feels like it could consume me. Before Roma could even respond, Juliet lunged for a ball of yarn on the table. Roma watched her in confusion, his brow furrowed as she measured a length of string and pulled a knife from her pocket to slice. He grew less confused when Juliet took the string and started to wind it around his finger, his right hand, as was customary for Russians. She had remembered remembered from their whispered conversations five years ago about a future where they could run away and be together. I take you, Roma Montagov, she said, her voice soft, to be my lawfully wedded husband, to have and to hold, until death do us part. She tied a small, secure knot. I think I'm missing some vows in between. As well as an officiant and some witnesses, Roma reached for her knife, cutting his own bit of string, but at least we have a Bible. He took her left hand. Carefully, he wound the string around her fourth finger, making such a delicate effort that Juliet didn't want to breathe for fear it would distract his task. I take you, Juliet Kai, Roma whispered in concentration, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold, until, he looked up as he finished the knot. Paused. When he spoke again, he did not look away. No, scratch that to have and to hold, where even death cannot part us. In this life and the next, for however long our souls remain, mind will always find yours. Those are my vows to you. Juliet closed her fist. The string really did feel like a ring, as heavy on her finger as any band of metal. These vows were as substantial as any made in front of a priest or audience. They didn't need any of those things. They had always been two mirrored souls, the only ones who understood the other in a city that wanted to consume them whole, and now they were joined, mightier when together. Even death cannot part us, she echoed fiercely. It was a promise that felt colossal. In this life they had been born enemies. In this life they had blood for miles between them, wide enough to run a river, deep enough to forge a valley. In the next, maybe there would be peace. Outside, metal clashed against metal, an echo ringing all across the city, again, then again. Here, within these four walls, all they could do was hold each other, waiting for noon to come, waiting for the moment they could be free. 41. Celia seemed to have ended up a soldier, perusing the battleground from above. All she had ever wanted was a quietly revolving world. And she had slapped her hands over her ears, hoping that silence in her head meant silence outside too. That would work no longer. The world had grown too loud. The city had come to a crescendo. Three scarlets from the north, likely bringing more, Celia reported. Immediately, the girl who had been idling by the balcony, in wait for her observations, ran off to report. The message would travel from house to house, building to building. Your note has been handled. An incoming girl reported now, nodding to Celia. We reached day now. Celia nodded back, then turned her focus to the streets again. She never thought she would end up a soldier, and, she supposed she wasn't. She was not among those gathering below, holding bricks and batons and weapons in wait for the gangsters and nationalists. When the first of the fight broke out, the people only needed to resist until the city could awaken, 
until their numbers could pour outward and do what they had always done best, incite chaos, take to the streets, overwhelm all the higher hands trying to control them. Get ready, Celia called down. On cue, the Scarlets approached, startling upon sighting the workers already waiting outside their apartment blocks. They exchanged a glance, as if asking if they should still proceed. When their eyes lifted, sighting Celia from above, a flash of recognition seemed to register. Celia stepped inside from the balcony. Not a soldier, but the watching eyes. Not a soldier, but the beating heart of resistance. Benedict pulled at the band on his arm, shedding it as soon as he was off the main roads. The strip of white fabric soaked into a dirty rain puddle, and he shuddered, a brief chill skating down his back. They were all wearing it, the scarlets with their knives and guns. Faces smeared with a bit of dirt as if that disguised them as the masses, their armbands printed with the Chinese character for labor, as if this was the workers' cause firing back upon its leaders. He had wagered that he could blend among them unnoticed, and he had been right. It had only taken a quick change of clothes, and hardly any of the scarlets on the roads stopped to consider him, even if he was running in the opposite direction. Benedict paused now, crouching behind a telephone post when he heard a rumble of commotion in the distance. The concessions were open. He didn't know when that had happened, when all the foreign soldiers had been commanded to depart their posts. For whatever reason, Route Gaisai was unguarded, and the roads, formerly blocked with sandbags and makeshift chain fences, were now cleared. The commotion came nearer. Benedict ducked just in time to hide from the group of scarlets as they hurried out of the French concession. He shouldn't have been surprised. The scarlets and nationalists had come into an agreement with the foreigners, then. The foreigners had allowed this, had known about the purge and warned their people to stay indoors. No matter how much the nationalists proclaimed their need to retake the country, too much of this city was under the foreigners. Too many nationalist offices and nationalist headquarters sat on French land to risk upsetting them. Hurry up. Jessfield is low on reinforcements. Another group ran past the telephone post, and Benedict sank lower, though the post would surely cover him from view. Only when the voices faded again did he stand, poking his head around to watch the Kuomintang men disappear from sight. The French concession was empty. Benedict had never seen its early morning so vacant, not a single vendor in sight even while the sky slowly brightened into a hazy gray. But that didn't mean it was quiet. Sirens were shrieking all across the city, most of them coming from the south. If Benedict took a guess, he would say they were coming from the gunboats, those floating upon the parts of the Huangpu in Nanchur. He started to run. No use being subtle now. Each second wasted was a second closer to noon. Benedict knew where General Xu's house was located. His only concern was whether Marshall would be there or if the house would be inhabited at all. For all he knew, they were no longer in Shanghai. For all he knew, they were in any location across the city, outside of foreign land and far from the fighting. Hey! With a start, Benedict turned over his shoulder, finding a group of scarlets emerging from a narrow side street. They were dressed as he was, rifles in hand. Benedict's first instinct was to run, but the concession was too wide and vast, there would be no way to lose his pursuers, not unless he could disappear into thin air. What? Benedict shouted back, as if their call was nothing more than an annoyance. Where are you going? One scarlet within the group bellowed. Command said to congregate in Jabe. We've got protesters trying to march on 2nd Division headquarters. Oh. Benedict feigned ignorance. He tried to think if he even knew where the hell the Nationalists 2nd Division headquarters were. Baoshan wrote? I was not made aware. I'm running a message. Four. They were getting suspicious. Benedict steeled his expression. Lord Kai is having a direct note brought to Chiang Kai-shek. He's already mad enough about Juliet's stunt. Do you want to be the ones to go back and explain why his note is so late? The Scarlets all grimaced, some more severely than others. Go on, then, another in the group said. 
before Benedict even moved, they were already off in a different direction, muttering among themselves about Lord Kai. Benedict exhaled, continuing onward with his pulse beating a racket in his chest. That had been a risk. For all he knew, Lord Kai might not have publicly announced what Juliet had done. Fate was on his side this time. His target finally came into view. A tall wrought iron gate, painted black. It didn't seem like there was anyone standing guard. It didn't seem like there was anyone keeping watch within the compound either. All Benedict could hear were distant sirens, distant sirens and the whistling wind, whipping through his hair and obscuring his vision. Benedict palmed a gun and slunk around the gate. His boots came down hard on the shrubbery that surrounded the residence, rustling with every step. The ground inclined slightly uphill here, rising as the trees grew thicker, branches drooping low. In this part of the French concession, the houses were built far apart enough that each had a garden and a long, winding driveway. Some chose enclosures to block people from looking in, while others let their flowers and shrubs be gawped at freely. When Benedict finally found a lump of dirt tall enough to step on, he used the boost to launch himself up on the walled gate, peering over to discover not only one outer enclosure but a second fence erected just inside. Is this a house or a military compound, he muttered. There seemed to be no movement between the fences. With a grunt, Benedict swung his legs over the first wall, almost rolling right off and narrowly landing on his two feet. A twinge of pain shot up his ankle. Please don't be sprained. Please don't be sprained. He took a step forward. The pain worsened. Oh, for crying out loud. Half hobbling, Benedict grabbed a hold of the second fence, shoving his left foot through one of the notches. This one was chain-linked rather than a smooth wall, but as soon as he had hauled himself halfway up, he heard voices coming near. Cursing furiously under his breath, Benedict stuck his right foot into the fence, biting right past his screaming ankle, and scrambled over the sharp wire at the top. It was possible that he had torn a rip through the cuff of his trousers. It was possible he had scratched his arm and was leaving a trail of blood through the grass. None of it mattered enough to slow him down, afraid that he would be spotted at any moment now that he was in, hurrying along the edges of the garden. The house loomed into view, one prominent front door, then two wings to either side of it, the second-floor balconies hanging atop its first-floor garages. Gauging by the number of shiny black cars parked outside the house, there were plenty of visitors inside. Benedict paused, trying to figure out his best course of action. If he listened hard, he thought he heard the steady hum of conversation from inside, which meant they were possibly hosting an early morning function. He could hardly comprehend how. The nationalists had just set the command for slaughter on the city. How did any of these men find the stomach to congregate together and continue with their day when their soldiers were laying waste to the people outside? Marshal, where the hell are you? Benedict whispered to the empty gardens. Carefully, hunching close to the ground, he started to make his way around the gravel paths, sticking close to the cover of the trees too close to the house and he feared being spotted through the large windows, too close to the fence and he feared being sighted by the patrolling soldiers. It wasn't until he came around the back of the house that he dared straighten a little, hobbling close to the painted white walls. Somehow, he needed to find a way in. Perhaps if he stripped out of the overalls, he could pretend to be a nationalist's assistant and claim that. Benedict halted. He had passed a window, only now he doubled back, peering in more closely. There was a flag hanging over the desk inside, deep blue with a white sun. This was an office. This was General Shu's office. The two window panes were latched, but that was no problem. Benedict retrieved his pocket knife and triggered the thin blade, sliding it right between the two panes. All he had to do was push up, and then the latch was nudged out of the way the window hinges creaking softly when Benedict nudged at the glass. He almost couldn't believe it. With care not to bring the dirt of the gardens in with him, he climbed through, wincing when he landed on the carpet. The office stayed silent, no alarm going off, no secret guard waiting in the corner. 
only the flag fluttering with the slightest disturbance, dust settling over the papers on the desk and the early sunlight casting a slash across the wall. One door opposite the desk likely led out into the hallway. Another door near the flag was smaller, a storage unit. Benedict's gaze caught on the desk. He hardly had the time to dawdle, yet he paused all the same, trying not to put more pressure on his ankle as he walked over and picked up the two pieces of paper left at the center. The first was messily scribbled, its characters almost bleeding off the page in a hurry. Intercepted this. We've sent word ahead to Lord Kai. Benedict blinked, a bad feeling sinking into his stomach. The second piece of paper was far thinner, ink visible through the sunlight even before he unfolded it. This message was written in a much more careful hand, addressed to. Oh, no, he muttered. Dinau. Kai Junli and Roma Montagov seek safe passage with you to leave the city. You must take them on board. Both of them. For the good of the country, for the good of the people. Please do this favor. Lang Selin. The Nationalists knew. The Scarlets knew. They would be assembling their forces right this moment, intent on stopping Juliet from leaving. And if they caught them, then Roma would be hauled away for execution. Benedict set the papers down. He had to find Marshall. They had to get out, get to the Bund, deliver the warning. But then came the sound of footsteps down the hall. Then came the boom of voices, coming closer and closer. They were heading for the office. Panic set his pulse into breakneck speed. Benedict eyed the window, calculating the time he needed to climb back out. With no time to spare, he pivoted instead for the other door in the office and opened it to find a storage room for filing cabinets, barely wide enough to let one person walk through, but long enough to leave darkness on the other end. He squeezed right in, his back pressed against the cabinets lining the walls, shoulders almost colliding with the sharp metal edges. Click. Benedict pulled the door after himself just as the burst of voices entered the office. They settled into the room, chairs scraping back, heavy bodies sitting down, discussing the communists, discussing the massacre. And then, we have complaints from the Scarlet Gang about the Montagoff kill order. Said it was dishonorable. Benedict wasn't sure if he had heard correctly. He turned rigid with surprise, listening closer. So the Scarlet Gang hadn't been entirely on board. He didn't know whether to respect them for voicing their concern or hate them for going through with it anyway. With fear coating his skin like sweat, Benedict pushed at the door as carefully as he could, allowing it to open just the barest sliver. He didn't have a perfect idea what each high-ranking official in the Kuomintang looked like, but he recognized General Xu, if not by his resemblance to Marshall, then by the image permanently seared into his head when General Xu was taking Marshall away from him. Forget it, General Xu said. My command stands. We will never again have a chance like this for eradicating our enemies. We must take it. Benedict's fists curled by his sides, twisting at his sleeves for something to do, for some way to exert energy so he didn't move and make noise. Since when were the White Flowers enemies to the nationalists anyway? Dmitri had allied with the communists, but was that enough to condemn every white flower? If it were the Scarlets demanding the white flowers be pulled into the purge, that was one matter, but General Xu insisting on it instead. There were only four Montagovs left in the city. Unless the kill order wasn't a strike against the white flowers at all, but an effort to take everyone Marshall loved away from him. Benedict exhaled slowly. The nationalists continued with their discussion, the smell of cigarette smoke wafting into the closet space. All the while, trying not to move a single muscle, Benedict was trapped. 42. Rain had been falling in a light drizzle over the city, washing at the stains marring the sidewalks, turning the lines of blood into one long stream that ran through the city like a second river. When Juliet picked her way out of the lab building, emerging cautiously into the late morning, the street was empty. It had been quiet for some time now. The gunshots and shouting and clanging metal had not gone on for long. The Nationalists and the Scarlets had stormed the city with military-grade weapons, after all. 
those at the other end of their violence had submitted quickly. Something's not right, Dorigea. Juliet turned around, watching Roma emerge into the open, clutching Elise's hand. His eyes shifted nervously. It's too quiet. No, Juliet said. I think it is only that all reinforcements have been called elsewhere. Listen. She held up a finger, tilting her head into the wind. The rain started to fall harder, turning the drizzle into a proper downpour, but beneath the din, there came the sound of voices, like a screaming crowd. Roma's expression turned stricken. Let's move. The first cluster of people they came upon was a surprise. Roma panicked, Elisa froze, but Juliet pushed at both of their shoulders, forcing them to keep moving. These were protesters, university students, gauging by their simple fashion and plaited hair, but they were too caught up in their slogan shouting to even notice the three gangsters passing them. Keep moving, Juliet warned. Head down. What's happening? Elisa asked, raising her voice to be heard over the rain. I thought there was a purge. Why aren't they afraid? Her blonde hair was plastered to her neck and shoulders. Juliet was not faring much better, at least she hadn't bothered with finger waves, so it was only black locks stuck to her face, not pomade running in a sticky mess. Because you cannot kill everyone in one day, Juliet replied bitterly. They went for their most prominent targets using the element of surprise. After that, the workers still hold the numbers. As long as people at the top are putting out the call, there will be people at the bottom ready to answer. And answer they did. The farther Roma, Juliet, and Elisa walked, delving deeper into the city and closer to the Bund, the more the crowds thickened. It became startlingly clear that those on the streets were all congregating in one direction, north, away from the waterfront and in the direction of Jabay. It wasn't only students anymore. Textile workers were on strike, tram conductors had abandoned their posts. No matter how powerful the nationalists had grown, they could not hide the news of a purge. No matter how much fear the Scarlet Gang once incited, they had since lost their grip on the city. They could not threaten its people back into submission. The people would not stand for murder and intimidation. They would be heard. No one is going in our direction, Elisa noted as they turned onto a main road. Here, the numbers were almost paralyzing. If the bath gave one rough push, the crowd would gridlock. Won't we get caught leaving by sea? Roma hesitated, seeming to agree. That slight moment of pause had him almost colliding with a worker, though the worker hardly blinked, he merely resumed with his call, down with the imperialists, down with the gangsters, and continued onward. We have to take our chances, Roma said, his eyes still tracking the worker. When he turned away, he caught Juliet's gaze, and Juliet tried for a small smile. There is no alternative. What about the countryside? Elisa kept asking. Her pace faltered. It is chaos here. They were coming upon the Bund. The usual picturesque buildings rose into view, the art deco pillars and tall, glowing domes, but everything looked muted in today's light. The world was covered in a sheen of gray a cinema picture that had been filmed with a lens not wiped clean. Elisa, darling, Juliet said, her voice soft. We're already under martial law. The communist leadership is scrambling to run, and the nationalist leadership is scrambling to eliminate. By the time we skirt into the countryside and reach another treaty port for escape, the nationalists will have taken over there, too, and we will be stopped. At least here, we can take advantage of the chaos. So where are they? Elisa asked. As they arrived at the Bund, coming within sight of the Huangpu River's rocking waves, Elisa looked around, searching beyond the protesters, beyond their shouting and sign-waving. Where are the nationalists? Look at where everyone is going, Juliet said, inclining her head. North. With so much freshly spilled communist blood on the ground, the Kuomintang were focusing their attention on newly vacated police stations and military headquarters, ensuring they had their people behind the desks. The nationalists are off straightening all their bases of power. 
the workers will go there too, will flock to those bases in hopes of making some difference. Don't get too relaxed, Roma added. He turned his sister's face, nudging her chin until she looked upon a particular tense spot in the crowd. Though there are no nationalists, they have placed scarlets. Juliet gave a small intake of breath, mostly lost when a clap of thunder came over the city. She brushed Roma's elbow, and his hand came to grasp hers. The both of them were soaked to the bone, as was the string around their ring fingers, but Roma held on gently, like they were merely reaching for each other on a morning stroll. Come on, Juliet said. With all these people, let's find a good place to wait. In Jabe, the surviving leadership of the General Labor Union were shouting over one another and banging their fists against the tables. People in suits mingled with people in aprons. Celia sat back and looked on, her face utterly impassive. They were occupying a restaurant refashioned into a stronghold, tables and chairs pushed into clusters, with one large cluster in the middle leading the work. She couldn't comprehend how anybody was being heard over the uproar, but they were, they were communicating and acting as fast as they could. A petition was being drawn up. Return of seized arms, cessation of the punishment of union workers, protection for the general labor union, these were collated into demands and then rolled up, prepared to be brought to the Nationalists' second division headquarters. Even if it killed them, the communists did not accept defeat. Up and at it, girl, someone bellowed into her ear. They were bounding through the crowd and screaming at others before Celia could even turn and see who it was. The workers pumped their fists into the air and yelled at one another, chants ringing from their mouths before the demonstration through the city could even begin. No military government, they roared, laughing as they tackled one another, bursting onto the streets and into the pouring rain. No gangster rule. They joined the crowds already present in West Shanghai, merging into one, unearthly procession larger than life itself. Hands pushed at Celia to rise, and then she was up, her head still ringing. No military government, the old woman beside Celia yelled. No gangster rule, the child in front of Celia yelled. Celia stumbled out from the restaurant, onto the pavement, and into the rain. The streets had come alive. This wasn't the glittering, glimmering old money of Shanghai, bright lights and jazz music shining from the bars. This wasn't red lanterns and golden lace trim on the dresses of dancers in the burlesque clubs, one swish of fabric that pulled the crowds into exuberance. This was animation from the gutters of the city, rising amid the ash of low-ceilinged factories. Celia raised her fist. It was the new set of footsteps entering the office that finally forced Benedict to perk up, shaking himself out of the near trance he had put himself in to remain quiet. It was the way the sound came in, shoes dragging, deliberate. Benedict didn't have to see Marshall to know that it was him. Nor did he have to see him to guess that Marshall had his hands stuck in his pockets. The cars that Lord Kai sent are here, Marshall said. He was feigning casual, but his voice was tight. They're ready for everyone. Benedict listened hard, trying to gauge how many nationalists were pulling their coats off the backs of their chairs and filtering out of the room. The office hadn't been that full to begin with, yet he didn't hear enough footfalls exiting. Indeed he was right when another conversation started up between General Xu and someone else, debating their next move for the communists who had escaped. Ertzi, General Xu said suddenly, summoning Marshall to attention. Where are the letters for Central Command? You mean the nasty envelopes I personally licked to close? Marshall asked. I put them in there. Do we need them now? There had been a pause in his speech. With delay, Benedict realized the missed beat had been because Marshall was pointing. And the only place to point at was this filing closet. Fetch them, would you? We need to be off in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Footsteps, dragging his way now. Benedict looked around frantically. At the end of the closet space, there was a small cardboard box which he had to assume was what Marshall was coming in for. He walked toward the box, then faltered, freezing three steps away from it when Marshall opened the door, stepped in, and closed the door after himself. 
Marshall hit the light switch. He looked up. Widened his eyes. Ben. Benedict clamped a hand over Marshall's mouth, the effort so aggressive that they slammed into one of the filing cabinets, bodies locked. Benedict could smell the smoke clinging to Marshall's skin, count the lines crinkling his brow while he tried not to struggle. What the hell are you doing here? Marshall's eyes seemed to scream. What do you think? Benedict silently responded. What happened? General Shu called from outside. He had heard the loud thud. Carefully, Benedict eased his hand away from Marshall's mouth. The rest of him didn't move. Nothing. I stubbed my toe, Marshall called back evenly. In the same breath, he lowered his voice to the quietest whisper and hissed, How did you get in here? The Kuomintang have an execution order for Montagovs, and you deliver yourself right to the door? No thanks to your father, Benedict shot back, his volume just as low. When were you going to tell me? Bad time, bad time, Marshall interrupted. He heaved an inhale, their chests rose and fell in tandem. Marshall was dressed in uniform, each polished gold button on his jacket digging between them. It seemed the walls were closing in with how close they were, the space shrinking smaller and smaller. Then Marshall swerved away suddenly, squeezing through the narrow passage and retrieving the box. Benedict leaned back against the cabinets, his breath coming short. Stay here, Marshall whispered when he walked by again, holding the box. I'll come back. He turned off the lights and closed the door firmly. Benedict resisted the urge to kick one of the cabinets. He wanted to hear the thud of its metal echo, have it ring so loud and forcefully that the whole house was brought here to him. Of course, that would be incredibly, incredibly ill-advised. So he stayed unmoving. All that he allowed was his rapidly tapping fingers. How much time did Roma and Juliet have at the Bund? How close was it now to noon? After what seemed like Ian's, the door opened again. Benedict tensed, prepared to pull his weapon, but it was Marshall, his expression stricken. You can come out, he said. They've all departed for the Scarlet House. And left you behind? I feigned a headache. Benedict walked out, almost suspicious. His ankle stung, slowing his movements, but the hesitation was intentional too. He didn't know what had gotten into him, he had come here resolute to rescue Marshall and leave as quickly as they could, yet now he looked at Marshall and felt utter bewilderment. There was a hot stone in his stomach. He had imagined Marshall getting tortured, abused, or otherwise at the mercy of people he could not stand up against. Instead, Benedict had found him moving around this house as if he belonged here, as if this were his home. And maybe it was. I thought I was coming to break you out, Benedict said. But it looks like you could have broken yourself out at any point. Marshall shook his head. He stuck his hands back into his pockets, though the posture was incongruous with the ironed smoothness of his trousers. You clown, he said. I was trying to help you from the inside. My father was going to delay the execution order. A coldness blew into the room. At some point, while Benedict was hiding, a steady rain had started up outside, turning the sky a terrible, dark gray. The droplets came down on the windows, gliding along the edges and collecting in a miniature puddle on the carpet. Benedict blinked. Had he latched the windows after climbing in? He could have sworn he did. Did he? You would have been too late, Benedict reported. Execution started at dawn. It was Juliet who came to warn us. Or rather, warn Roma, and Benedict was roped in by virtue of proximity. Marshall jerked back. What? No. No, my father said. Your father lied. As Marshall had. As Marshall seemed to be doing with increasing frequency. I, Marshall broke off. His attention turned to the window too looking irritated by the water dripping in. He walked toward it. Then why would you come here, Ben? Why venture right into enemy territory? To save you. Benedict couldn't believe what he was hearing. 
with Marshall's whole past crumbling as a lie, perhaps his entire persona, too, was an untruth. Is Marshall Seo even his real name? Of course it is. Benedict had muttered that last part aloud. Seo was my mother's family name, Marshall went on, pushing the window closed. I figured everyone would ask fewer questions if they thought I ran from Korea after Japanese annexation, an orphan with no ties. Less complicated than running from the Chinese countryside because I couldn't bear to live with my nationalist father. You should have told me, Benedict said quietly. You should have trusted me. Marshall turned around, arms crossed, leaning up against the glass. I do trust you, he muttered, uncharacteristically quiet. I merely would have preferred to maintain a different past, one of my choosing. Is that so wrong? Yes. Benedict snapped. It is if we had no idea that you were going to be in danger when nationalists marched into this city. Look around. Do I appear in danger? Benedict could not respond immediately, he feared that his words would come out too sharp, too far from what he really meant. This never used to be a worry not with Marshall, not with his best friend. Of all the people in the world that he trusted would understand him no matter how unfiltered his thoughts ran, it was Marshall. But something was different now. It was fear that had settled into his bones. We have to go. Roma and Juliet await at the Bund with a root out, but the nationalists have already sent people after them. If we wait any longer, Either martial law will shut the city down with no means of escape or Juliet is going to get hauled away. I can't. Marshall tugged at his sleeves, trying to straighten out the imaginary crinkles. I have their trust, Ben. I am more help to you as a docile nationalist prodigy than anything else. Somewhere in the house, a grandfather clock started to chime. Whether or not my father lied about the timing of the purge is irrelevant, he went on. What is relevant is that droves of white flowers will be hauled into imprisonment to await execution alongside the communists, regardless of whether we were truly working with them. I can stop it. We won't have to run. Roma won't have to run, so long as I stay. If I can steer my father into protecting us, the white flowers survive. When Marshall paused for breath, his chest was rising and falling, appearing exhilarated by the weight of his role. And without hesitation, Benedict said, in all my years knowing you, I've never imagined you could make such a daft decision. Marshall's expression fell. I beg your pardon? They're lying. Benedict exclaimed, the sound harsh. Why would they ever allow the white flowers to continue onward when the nationalists have an alliance with the Scarlet Gang? We're finished, Marshall. The gang is in shambles. There's no going back. No, Marshall insisted. He stood firm. No. Do you know how much violence I witnessed as a phantom in this city, Ben? The view from the rooftops is utterly, utterly different from the view on the street, and I saw everything. No matter the bloodshed, I saw how damn much every white flower cared for us, for you, for the Montagovs. I can save them. Is that what this is? Benedict resisted the urge to march over and shake his friend. He knew, he knew that physical force was not the right method of persuasion here, that if anything, it would merely rile Marshall into further stubbornness. Some display of loyalty for the gang that took you in? It was never about the white flowers, Mars. It was about what we believed in, who we believed in. It's Roma, it's a city where we belong, a future. And when that topples, then it is up to us to flee too. Marshall swallowed hard. I have power here by mere virtue of my birth. You would ask me to abandon it, abandon the possibility of helping people? What real help can you be? This wasn't what he meant. This was what was coming out anyway. Will you march upon the front lines and massacre the workers to win your father's trust? Rough up a few communists for the freedom of white flowers? Why are you being like this? Because it's not worth it. Power is never worth it. You keep making trades upon trades, and you get nothing in return. Roma is running from it. Juliet is running from it. 
What makes you think you can handle it? A flicker of hurt, real hurt, flashed across Marshall's face. Is that what it is? he asked. You think I am too weak? Benedict bit back a curse, swallowed his anger until it slid down his throat. How had this happened? He knew he shouldn't have spoken so fast. He knew he shouldn't have run loose with his words. There was never any good to come from it. And yet he could barely think. It was the oppressive air of this room and the steady trickle of rain from outside and that clock still chiming from someplace in the house. I never said you were weak. Yet you would have me walk away. I'm trying to help us. I'm trying to have us survive. What use is the gang's survival if you do not survive? Benedict cut in. Listen to me, Mars. No matter how much they trust you, this is civil war. This city will overflow with casualties. Marshall threw his hands up. You and Roma may run. You are Montagovs. I understand. Why should I follow? Marshall. No. Marshall exclaimed, his eyes ablaze, not finished with his rebuke. I mean it. Why should I? With all that I am promised here, with all the protection I have, why would I run unless I was a coward? Why would I abandon such prime opportunities? Because I love you. Benedict shouted. At once, it was like a dam in his heart had broken, smashing past every barricade he had built up. I love you, Mars. And if you are gunned down because you want to fight a war that doesn't belong to you, I will never forgive this city. I will tear it to pieces, and you will be to blame. Absolute silence descended upon the room. If Benedict had thought it oppressive before, it was nothing in comparison to the weight of Marshall's wide-eyed stare upon him. There was no taking it back. His words were out in the world. Perhaps those were the only words he had ever said that he didn't want to take back. Good grief, Marshall finally managed, his voice hoarse. You had ten years to say something, and you choose now? And for whatever absurd reason, Benedict managed a weak laugh. Bad timing? Horrific timing. Marshall closed in with three strides coming to a halt right in front of him. Not only that, but you choose to blame me in a declaration of love. Didn't anyone teach you manners? God. Marshall clasped his hands around Benedict's neck and kissed him. The moment their lips pressed together, Benedict was hit with the same rush of a gunfight, of a high-octane chase, of the thrill that came with hiding in an alleyway when the pursuit came to an end. He hadn't ever thought much about the act of kissing hadn't much cared no matter who was on the other end of it. He had never craved it, had only thought about it like an abstract concept, but then Marshall leaned into him and his veins lit on fire, and he realized it wasn't that he did not care. It was only that it had to be Marshall. It had always been Marshall. When Benedict reached up and sank his fingers into Marshall's hair and Marshall made a noise at the base of his throat, all that Benedict could think was this was what it meant to be holy. Please, Benedict whispered. He pulled back for the briefest of moments. Come with me. Leave with me. A breath jumped between them, an exhale into an inhale. Marshall's hands trailed over Benedict's shoulders, down his chest, to his waist, gripping the loose fabric of his shirt. Okay. His answer came shakily, the single word heavy like a sacrifice. It was a choosing. It was turning away from the commitment of family and following Benedict wherever he was to go. On one condition. Benedict's gaze snapped up. Marshall was looking at him with his eyes wholly black, pupils blown large, his expression pensive and serious. Anything. A grin slipped out. Say it again. I didn't pine all these years to only hear it once. Benedict gave Marshall a shove, a force of habit really, and Marshall stumbled back laughing. Idiot, Benedict chided. In all these years, why didn't you say anything? Because, Marshall said simply, you weren't ready. Idiot, Benedict thought again, but it was with such fondness that his chest burned with it, a red-hot iron of affection that branded every inch of his skin. I'll say it however many times you want. 
I'll romance you until you get sick of me. I am horrendously, horrendously in love with your dreadful face, and we need to go, now. The smile that Marshall made was something glorious, so big that it felt uncontainable by the room, uncontainable within the house. I love you just as horrendously, he replied simply. We can go, but I have an idea. How certain are you that my father is lying? Benedict wasn't sure if this was a trick question. He hardly had the time to reel from the quick switch in topic. Entirely certain. I heard him say the execution order was his command. Marshall pulled at the cuffs of his sleeves, rolling them up to his elbows as he wandered about his father's desk, eyes searching through its contents. If the order is still in effect, we're dead if we get caught, Marshall said. He withdrew a piece of blank paper, then a pen, and started to write. But not if we overturn the order on an emergency command. With what? Benedict asked, flabbergasted. He squinted at what Marshall was writing. A permission slip for any officer who catches us? A permission slip, Marshall finished writing with a flourish, approved by General Shu. His stamp should be in his meeting room. Let's go. Marshall was out of the room before Benedict could even register the plan, digesting what they were trying to do. Benedict's ankle protested as he picked up speed too, catching up to Marshall in the long hall, winding around the house to come to the foyer. Benedict came to a dead stop. Mars. It's just up there, Marshall said. He pointed to the stairs, not noticing Benedict's terrified expression. We. Mars. Marshall jumped, then turned around and followed Benedict's gaze. Through the delicate archway of the foyer, the living room unfolded in front of them, the unlit fireplace, the floral vases, and General Shu, reading a newspaper on the leather couch. Oh, Marshall said quietly. General Shu laid his newspaper down. In one hand, he was holding a pistol, pointed in their direction. The other hand was gloved matching the thick fabric of his outer coat, like he had come back inside the house without bothering to get comfortable. Did you think, he said slowly, that I wouldn't notice my window wide open? Well, you caught us. Marshall might have been taken aback upon first sighting his father, but he recovered fast, his voice injected with grace. He walked right up to him, not faltering when his father rose, not faltering even as he walked right up to the pistol. You promised that you would help me, help the Montagovs. So here we are. General Shu was watching Benedict. Studying him. Your place for helping them is through official channels, General Shu said evenly. This right here is an official channel. Unless, of course, Marshall's voice turned cold, you lied to me. Silence. The ticking of the grandfather clock its pendulum swinging left and right inside the glass casing. Slowly, General Shu set his pistol down on the table beside them. There is an order to the way things must work, he said. His eyes darted to Benedict again, some flare of irritation in the momentary glance. We cannot make things happen just because we want it. That is tyranny. How fast could Benedict reach for a weapon if he needed to? The pistol on the table mocked him, close enough for General Shu's immediate retrieval, but just far enough to give hope that it was not a threat. Baba, it is just one question, Marshall said. If I asked for help to save my friends, are you with me or against me? General Shu made a dismissive noise. There exactly is your problem. You think everything can only be good or bad, heroic or evil. I have taken you in to teach you to be a leader, and you cannot stay true to your word. My word. General Shu pushed on. We follow the rules that come down from command. We eradicate those who want to threaten a peaceful way of life. You are my son. You will do the same. There is no other respectable option. Rain clattered down around the house, the droplets seeming far away because of the hollow sound. Benedict was almost afraid that Marshall was listening that this pull of family and legacy was too strong to resist. Then Marshall said, you forget. I was not raised respectably. I was raised as a gangster. And before General Shu could stop him, 
Marshall picked up the pistol his father had set down and hit him hard across the temple. Benedict hurried forward, his eyes wide as Marshall caught his father and eased him back onto the couch. General Shu's eyes were closed. His chest looked still. Please tell me you didn't just commit patricide. Marshall rolled his eyes. He put his finger under his father's nose, confirming that General Shu was still breathing. You don't think I've perfected how to knock someone out by now? I'm just saying the pistol looks a little sharp. Oh my god, you are impossible. Marshall mimed a zip across his lips, forbidding Benedict from arguing further. Time is ticking. Let's find that stamp. 43. Do you see them? No, Roma answered, his jaw tightening. It is our misfortune that the waterfront is so damn crowded. If we had known, I would have decided on a less vague meeting point, Juliet muttered. With a sigh, she shifted, trying to hold her arms over more of Elisa's head, blocking off the rain. She might as well be a helpful umbrella while Roma trekked up and down the boardwalk, running reconnaissance. This wouldn't do. The rain was messing with their visibility, Juliet could see the protesters and strikers moving, but she couldn't make out faces past a few feet in front of her. Roma and Juliet were in plain clothes, which let them blend in with the rest of the city, but it would be impossible for Benedict and Marshall to sight them even if the two were already present at the waterfront. They were used to searching for Roma's clean pressed white shirts and Juliet's beaded dresses. Neither of those items was present today. Roma, it's almost noon. They'll come, Roma insisted. I know they will. Juliet looked out onto the river, biting her lip. Along every ramp, there were boats jammed in tight capacity, making space for foreign warship after foreign warship, flags of red, white, and blue marking the sides. The foreigners had summoned them here as a threat. A reminder that they had won a war on this land once before, so they could do it again. A reminder that Shanghai could jostle up in civil unrest however much it liked, but it better settle down in due time before the foreigners got too annoyed and started using these war vessels. How about this? Juliet said. She tried to wipe the rain off her brow. It was pointless when the downpour fell so fast. I'm going to find my contact. I'll have him at the ready and try to stall beyond noon. Soon as your cousin shows, we run. Soon as he shows with Marshall, Roma corrected. Then, seeing Juliet's frown, he leaned in and pressed a kiss to her cheek. Go on. We'll be here. Juliet was still worrying her teeth against her lower lip when she turned and started to pick her way along the boardwalk. The wharf she wanted was within sight, to the left of the one that Roma and Elisa were standing nearest. So long as the Montagovs didn't move, she had them in the corner of her eye as she walked, careful not to slip on the wet surfaces. These wharves were usually bustling with activity. Today, Juliet couldn't tell if it was merely the ruckus on the streets that overshadowed everything or if the fishermen were too afraid to venture out. Dinau. Juliet had spotted her contact, a big-bellied man chewing on his toothpick. He stood under the awning of his tiny boat, a vessel that looked pocket-sized in comparison with the warship docked on its right. Hearing Juliet's call, Dinau looked up, his whole body freezing before he could finish untying his boat from the wharf. Kai Junli, he said. I thought your cousin's note was a prank. This is no prank. Are you willing to take us away? Slowly, he stood to his height, his eyes darting left and right. Where are you hoping to go? Whichever coast you reach first, Juliet answered easily. I. I cannot stay any longer. Not with the scarlets turning like this. For the longest moment, Danau said nothing. He bent down again and continued gathering the rope at his feet. Then. Yes. I can take you away. I can sail south. Juliet breathed out in relief. Thank you, she said quickly. I'll pay you however much you need. Who else are you bringing? His question came abruptly, choked out like he couldn't speak the words fast enough. A pinprick of suspicion registered in Juliet's mind, 
but she brushed it aside, hoping it was only the stress of the situation currently unfolding in the city. Roma Montagov, Juliet answered, praying that her voice would not shake. Danau was a communist sympathizer, Kathleen had said. Even with his double life as a scarlet fisherman, he cared little for the blood feud. Along with his sister and two of his men, Danau had finished gathering the excess rope. There remained only one thin line keeping his boat docked. You're traveling with Montagovs now? The seas are still being watched, Miss Kai. We may have trouble leaving the territory. I'll pay you however much to hide us. Just get us out. Though Danau had finished tidying everything in his vicinity, he continued scanning the floor of his boat. Are they forcing you to help them, Miss Kai? You can tell me if they are. Juliet blinked. The rain was stinging her eyes badly. She had not even considered that the fisherman might think she was acting against her will. Why was that his first thought, and not the easier conclusion that Juliet had simply betrayed the Scarlets? No one is forcing me to do anything, she said. Her fists curled. Roma Montagov is my husband. Now, can I come aboard and get out of this rain? The toothpick in Danau's mouth bobbed up and down. If he was surprised to hear her admission, he did not show it. Certainly. Only then did he finally look at her, taking the toothpick out of his mouth. You will have to shed your weapons before you come on board. I mean no offense, Miss Kai, but I know you gangster types. All in the water first. Juliet stiffened, her gaze darting back along the boardwalk. Even at a distance, she could sense that Roma was watching her and had noted her unease. She raised a hand, signaling that she was fine, and with a sigh, pulled out the blades tucked against her thighs. Short of the cash in the bag hanging from her shoulders, she had thought the weapons on her skin could be traded as valuables. Okay, Juliet said, her blades hitting the water with a slap. They floated for a second, then sank into the dark waves. Danau threw his toothpick to the floor. All weapons, Miss Kai. With a sigh, Juliet snapped off the garrote wire around her wrist and hurled it into the water. Happy? No, not really. There was a sudden motion from behind Danau. A man stepped out, a pistol held to Danau's head, his expression tight. Juliet recognized him. He was a scarlet, he had once run a message for her. Please understand, Danau said, his voice barely audible as the river rolled beneath him, that as much as I want to help you, Miss Kai, your scarlets have always been watching. The scarlet fired, and Danau fell with a spray of red, the bullet in his head killing him instantly. With a horrified gasp, Juliet lunged forward, preparing for a fight, but the scarlet did not turn his pistol to her next. He turned it upward and fired once, twice, three times, each bullet piercing through the awning of the fishing boat and stunning into the sky, it's bang. 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 Loud enough to be heard over the storm. It was a signal. No. Juliet turned fast on her heel. She sighted Roma and Elisa's blurry forms immediately, but by then there was counter-movement in the crowd, and the Scarlets who had been playing guard were on their way to the waterfront, merging into a task force. Roma. Elisa. Run, run now. Someone tackled Juliet from the side. Stop, she shrieked. Get off of me. Sheer instinct kicked in. She threw her head back as hard as she could, colliding with her attacker. There was a sickening crunch that sounded like a nose breaking, and when her attacker momentarily loosened his grip around her arms, she pulled free and ran. They had intercepted her cousin's note. They had been one step ahead of her this whole time, waiting with Danau. Juliet should have known there would be eyes everywhere in the city after her little scheme. She should have known that her father and mother would pull out every stop to figure out what game she was playing at after disrupting Scarlet business and disappearing into the night. Juliet skidded off the wharf, frantically wiping at the rain on her face to clear her vision. There, she spotted Roma and Elisa again, circled in by a group of Scarlets with firearms. Roma still had his weapons. With a pistol in hand, 
he managed to take down two scarlets. But he was outnumbered. Before Juliet could reach them, the scarlets had him disarmed. Don't touch him. The moment Juliet ran close, the nearest scarlets dove at her. She tried her best to dispatch them, ducking fast and sliding under outstretched arms, but she was one girl without weapons and they were loyal to her no longer. Just as Juliet stood again, one of the scarlets pressed the barrel of his gun to Roma's head. And Juliet came to a complete stop. Two of the scarlets grabbed her by the shoulders. All the faces here were familiar, all of them names that she was sure she could recall if she thought a little harder. Under the pour of vicious rainfall, they could only look upon her in hatred. Don't, Juliet managed. Don't you dare hurt him. It is your own fault for delivering him right to us. The scarlet who had spoken looked even more familiar than the rest, undoubtedly a leader among them, undoubtedly one of Tyler's former men. He had a hint of glee in his eyes, that same old bloodlust Juliet was so tired of seeing. Thankfully for you, you don't have to watch. Take her to Lord Kai. No. It didn't matter how much she kicked. With a scarlet on either side of her, the men lifted her easily by her arms and started to lead her away. How dare you? Of course they dared. She was no longer Juliet Kai, the heir of the Scarlet Gang, to be feared and revered. She was a girl who had run away with the enemy. Don't touch them. Juliet screamed, throwing her head over her shoulder. The Scarlets didn't listen. They started to lead Roma and Elisa in the other direction, pulling at Elisa so roughly that she cried out. Even as the distance between them grew and grew, Roma had his eyes latched on Juliet, his face so pale under the shadow of the sky it was as if he were dead and executed already. Perhaps Juliet had an ill-divining soul. Perhaps she was seeing his future, perhaps by the day's end he would be lying at the bottom of a tomb as the last of the Montagov line. Roma, hold on. Hold on. Roma shook his head. He was shouting something again and again, the sound lost to the rain, and he did not stop until Juliet was out of sight, dragged away from the bund and onto another main road. It was only then that Juliet realized what he had been saying, his eyes stricken like he had already lost hope of seeing her again. I love you. The rain came down like a tidal wave, but it did not discourage the crowds moving through the city. Even if Celia had suddenly decided to abandon the procession, she had no route out. She was boxed in on all sides, surrounded by workers and students and ordinary people who looked no more like revolutionaries than she did. Yet nonetheless, they were here and screaming, screaming at the top of their lungs, long banners in their best penmanship unfurled into the air. Protect the Union. They were coming into Baoshan Road, approaching their destination. Celia did not shout with them, but she took it all in. Among so much chaos, she became bigger than herself, bigger than any physical body, any physical form. No surrender. Not a soul in the procession carried firearms, only signs running with ink. They were here to make a point clear. They could achieve their goals with nothing except might. They were the people. A city was nothing without its people, a city could not thrive without its people. The government should fear them. Down with the military government. They turned around a bend in the street, and Celia was flooded with immediate horror, citing lines and lines of nationalist troops in their way. On sheer instinct, her steps ground to a halt, but the procession did not appear to be stopping, and so she could not stop either, jostled back into movement. No, Celia murmured. The soldiers stood to attention. Those on the ground were armed with bayonets. Those on higher platforms had their eye glued to the telescopic sights of their machine guns. A barricade of wooden stakes cut the street off abruptly, and a hundred paces behind it, all the soldiers' barrels were pointed at the crowd, ready to fire. They looked somber. They crouched at attention behind stacks and stacks of sandbags, using them for shields against retaliation. But there wouldn't be retaliation. The protest was unarmed. They won't shoot, Celia thought. The crowd was getting nearer and nearer. Surely they won't. 
the procession collided with the barricade. Workers pushed from their side, gangsters and troops pushed from the other. Celia couldn't breathe, she felt out of body, only soul, floating above the crowd and overseeing it all. She was already a ghoul floating above the mayhem, swirling in the rain. Down with gangster rule. The workers finally pushed over the barricade, making for the troops. Chaos on both sides, bodies and sound and noise, clashing at once. It was then that a flash of light registered in Celia's peripheral vision, prickling up some sixth sense that told her something was awry. She twisted, her eyes making a sweep of the scene, breath coming fast. She saw two things at once, first, movement in an alley near the fallen barricade, something glistening and then slinking back into the shadows, second, the glint of metal held in the hands of a man some few paces away. Stop. Celia yelled, diving forward, but it was already too late. Mr. Ping, the same Mr. Ping of the scarlet inner circle, had his pistol pointed to the skies, and when she collided with him, his bullet had already burst into the air its sound resonating tenfold into the crowd. All around him, the workers stared, unable to comprehend the sound. This is a peaceful demonstration. Who is that? Why would he do that? Get down. Get down. Celia staggered back, pressing her rain-soaked hands to her mouth. Mr. Ping stood there now, unmoving against the crowd that demanded an explanation. He had no need to explain himself. He had been planted here to do exactly this, forfeiting his life for the sake of the Scarlets. If the Scarlets asked for blood, the inner circle would offer their own. Within the armed line of nationalists, a voice screamed, Return fire. Let me go, Juliet hissed. Let go. They had been walking for so long in the rain that Juliet was thoroughly soaked. Each time she attempted to shake herself free, her drenched hair flung left and right to disperse water. On any other occasion, the distance between the Bund and the Kai house would have required a car. Today, it was impossible to get any vehicle through the city. Better to walk it on foot, lest they were stalled behind a crowd and a rescue attempt came for Juliet. At least, that was what she had gathered from the two Scarlets holding her hostage, who found no problem with discussing such matters over her head. The one on her left was named by Tassa, she recalled. The one on her right remained stubbornly nameless. They have blocked off Baoshan Road, by Tassa was saying, making an effort to ignore Juliet's writhing. The streets here were emptied. They had entered nationalist guarded defense lines, needing only a single nod from by Tassa before the soldiers were ushering them through, pushing the other protesters back. Of course, even before they came into the guarded parts of the city, no one had offered Juliet a second glance no matter how loudly she yelled. Everyone else was yelling just as loudly. Do we care? The scarlet on the right snapped. We are cutting behind the barricade anyway. It is only an extra ten minutes if we go around. Ten minutes that I do not have. These people are driving me up the wall. Juliet tried to dig her heels into the pavement. All it did was grate at her shoes, rubbing at the soles. Hold on a minute, she interrupted. What are we cutting behind? Are we passing the end of the protest? Though the Scarlets did not respond to her, it was a valid guess, what with the noise that was coming from the rapidly approaching intersection. The houses around her seemed to shake, their empty terraces and imposing exteriors slick with the gray day. She hadn't paid attention before, but now she saw nationalist military vehicles parked all along the road. Only, they were empty, as if the men inside had been moved elsewhere. What's happening? Juliet demanded again, though she knew the Scarlets wouldn't answer her. They passed the intersection, and when Juliet turned to look down the other road, she saw the backs of hundreds of nationalists. The sheer number struck panic into her bones and that was before she realized they were braced behind sandbags and makeshift barriers with whole machine guns pointed down the street as the noise grew and grew. Juliet summoned the last of her energy to throw herself to the ground. The Scarlets hadn't expected it, by Tassa stumbled, almost tripping over his own feet when Juliet sprawled before him. The other Scarlet grumbled, 
pulling at her arms while she struggled to stay down. Her focus was locked on the scene before her, on the strikers coming into view, surging against the wooden barricade. There were so many of them. Far, far more than the nationalists hiding behind their makeshift shields, but the nationalists had them surrounded at so many angles, firearms pointed forward. How was this supposed to end? How could this possibly end well? Juliet scrambled up suddenly, deciding she had seen enough. Before Baitasa could grab a hold of her again, she affixed her fingers on to his wrist like an iron vice. Call the order to stop. Find someone to draw them back. Baitasa, to his credit, did not wince. The other Scarlet pulled Juliet off of him quickly, snapping, I told you we shouldn't have gone this way. My apologies, Miss Kai, Baitasa said, ignoring his companion. He turned to the scene before them, to the nationalists in uniform and the workers pushing ever closer. It might have been Juliet's imagination, but he truly looked sorrowful. He put a hand on her lower back as if to offer comfort, as if any of that mattered here. You're not in charge anymore. A gunshot sounded from within the workers. I don't think I was ever in charge, Juliet thought numbly. And the nationalists, too, let loose their gunfire. No. The Scarlets lunged for her again, before she could scarcely take two steps. Juliet had no energy to fight. She merely sagged in their hold, her voice growing softer and softer with each repetition, no, no, no. A legion of lead fired onto the workers, the students, the ordinary people. One after the other, they collapsed atop each other as if someone were snipping at the strings that held them up, struck in the chest, in the stomach, in the legs. Massacre. That was what this was. The nationalists kept firing, empty shells stacking up behind their safe line of defense. It was clear that the protesters would not, could not really fight back, and yet the bullets continued anyway. The rear half of the crowd had reversed in a panic and was trying to run, but still, the bullets followed, burying in their backs until their knees gave way, until they lay unmoving upon wet cement and tram tracks. Even from here, the smell of blood was pungent. We have to move, Baitasa said suddenly, as if snapping out of a daze. The gunfire had lessened, but it had not stopped. Kathleen, Juliet muttered to herself. Had her cousin been in that crowd? Would she sense it like she sensed the city's death heaving beneath her feet, some wild animal on its last lap of freedom before the cage came down? What did you say? the scarlet to her right asked. This was the first time he had spoken directly to Juliet. Perhaps it was the shock of what they had just witnessed. Perhaps he had forgotten why he was hauling her off in the first place, forgotten exactly who he had placed his loyalty with. Much of those workers lying dead in the streets had likely been scarlet-aligned not some weeks ago. Allegiance was supposed to keep them safe. Blood feuds and civil wars built themselves on the idea of allegiance. What good was it? Things died and changed in the blink of an eye. Nothing, Juliet rasped, her eyes stinging. Nothing. She sighted movement in the alley by the nationalists' line of defense. As the Scarlets pushed for Juliet to start walking, she could only stare aghast at the scene, at the insects that were slowly crawling across the ground, rushing for the nationalists. Juliet could not have called a warning even if she tried, her voice had gone hoarse. As the last of the bullets stopped, the insects rushed upon the soldiers' shoes, crawling into their pant legs. The men behind the sandbags jumped to their feet and exclaimed in horror, but it was too late, they were infected. It would not set in immediately, not when the insect numbers were so low. The infection would build, and build, and build. Lawrence's vaccine would not be ready so soon. These soldiers were dead men. The nationalists, each and every one of them still stained with the blood of the workers, knew what was coming. Baitasa blinked in bewilderment, hurrying to push Juliet away before the insects could crawl over, and Juliet obliged, at last walking without resistance. She wondered if the infected men would wait for madness to come, or if they would take their rifles to their own heads first. 44. Keep up. Keep up. Benedict winced, 
almost slipping right off the roof tiles. The rain was pelting down. On the plus side, it meant that the scarlets they were tracking were unlikely to look up and see Marshall and Benedict following from the rooftops, drawing near when they were bypassing the narrower commercial streets and keeping at a distance when the roads got wider with fewer buildings to use for cover. On the downside, Benedict was very close to taking a tumble and landing with a splat on the sidewalks below. How the hell did you do this so often? Benedict asked, brushing his sopping wet hair off his forehead. In seconds, the rain had pushed it back. I am simply more light than you are, Marshall replied. He turned back for a second, sparing a glance as the scarlets below moved forward, at no risk of disappearing any time soon. Come on. Marshall extended a hand. Benedict hurried forward and took it, their fingers laced together, half to be near each other and half because he truly did need to be dragged to prevent his ankle from giving out entirely. Soon, the scarlets seemed to be slowing, and Marshall halted, his lips pinched in thought as he watched them. Benedict peered over Marshall's shoulder. As he squinted through the rain, he couldn't stop the hiss that escaped when he tried to set even weight on both his feet. Marshall's attention pivoted to him immediately, looking him up and down. What's wrong? Nothing, Benedict said. How are we to approach them? The Scarlets had stopped outside a building, what looked like police headquarters, though it was hard to read the faded French along the front. Marshall and Benedict had arrived at the bun too late. With horror, they had halted to a stop by the roadside just in time to witness Roma being dragged away, separated from Juliet and torn in the other direction. Marshall had almost hurried forward, intent on stopping them in their tracks with General Shu's new order, but it was risky, almost too suspicious for such timing. There was a better chance of success if they waited until the Scarlets reached their destination, instead of mysteriously appearing en route. So Benedict and Marshall decided to trail after Roma. He had not tried to escape through the entire walk, he remained wooden between the Scarlets who had a hold of him, saying nothing save for the occasional assurance to Elisa. Elisa, on the other hand, had bucked and kicked as hard as she could, going as far as to try biting one of the Scarlets. None of it worked. They did their best to ignore her, and the march onward only continued. Now, at their destination, one of the Scarlets was arguing with a nationalist standing guard by the doors. Roma and Elisa stood in the rain with their scarlet captors, every single one of them looking out of place on these empty streets. There would have been more civilians walking about if the nationalists hadn't cleared the roads with their military vehicles. There would be more civilians witnessing this bizarre scene, Montagovs under scarlet control, if the nationalists had not laid waste to everyone outside with bullets and gunfire. I think we may have to do it now, Marshall said, hesitating. I don't know if they have a jail cell waiting inside or a firing squad. Then let's go. Benedict made to shuffle off the roof tiles. He had barely gotten a step forward when Marshall's arm shot out. With your ankle like that? Stay here, Ben. It makes more sense when it is only me who arrives with the command anyway. You're still dressed like a worker. Before Benedict could protest, Marshall was already sliding off the roof hanging along the gutters by his fingertips, then jumping down and landing cleanly. Keep an eye out, Marshall hissed from below. He disappeared quickly, ducking through the nearest alley and then emerging between two of the buildings, coming onto the main road. Benedict didn't like getting left behind, but he had to admit it would have looked strange for him to accompany Marshall. From his vantage point, he watched Marshall approach the group, his posture stick straight, acting the nationalist soldier. He started to speak with one of the Scarlets, pulling the forged note out of his jacket. All the while, the other Scarlet, who had stepped out of the rain and under the awning of the police station, was still arguing with the soldier standing guard. The Scarlet, as Benedict eyed him, lashed out, whacking the soldier's hat and flipping it right off his head. Benedict wondered what could possibly be a point of contention at this precarious time. Was it not the Nationalists' mission to capture the Montagovs? Why would they keep Roma lurking outside for so long? Did they not worry about a rescue attempt? Hey! 
Roma's voice rang loud. The Scarlets, the two soldiers outside the station, Marshal, they all turned to look at him, taken aback, but Roma's attention was fixed on the soldier picking his hat back up. Why is your hat so big? It doesn't fit you in the slightest. The rain suddenly eased into a light drizzle. Its raucous noise grew faint, and it was like Benedict's ears had come unplugged, like he could think clearly again. He realized what Roma was implying. The man outside was not a nationalist soldier. He had been planted there to stall. The doors of the station burst open, and out poured a cascade of workers, armed with rifles. Oh, no, no, no. From the street side, Marshall's gaze snapped to Benedict, his arm miming a slash across his throat. Don't. Stay there, Marshall was warning, just as Dimitri appeared behind the workers, coming to a stop at the top step of the station. The workers fanned out. I'll take it from here, Dimitri said. Shoot the Scarlets. The Scarlets didn't have a chance to fight back. Some managed to retrieve weapons, some managed one shot. But the workers had them surrounded, rifles already aimed, and with a pop pop pop. Reverberating along the whole street, the Scarlets all dropped, eyes blank and glazed, fleshy wounds studded into their chests. The blood splashed generously. When Marshall raised his arms high, signaling his surrender, the left side of his neck was entirely splattered. This is bad. This is so, so bad. The last of the scarlet groans faded into silence. May as well shoot us too while you're at it, Roma said into the deathly quiet. Loudest now were the clinking of bullet casings, dropping from the rifles and littering the ground. Or do we receive the honor of being torn apart by your monsters? Dimitri smiled. You get the honor of a public execution at nightfall for your crimes against the workers of this city, he said evenly. Lead them there. Marshall didn't resist, letting himself be nudged by the sharp end of a rifle. He fell into step beside Roma, arms still held up, and didn't glance up, though he had to know Benedict was watching. It was to avoid Benedict being caught too, he knew, but still he cursed Marshall for it, because if this was Marshall's death, if this was an inescapable fate, then he needed one last look. Benedict scrambled up, his teeth gritted hard. He knew how to save them. He would save them. Before any of Dimitri's men could see him, Benedict hurried off the roof and started to run in the other direction. 45. Do you care to explain yourself? Juliet touched the quilt over her shoulders, pulling at its loose threads. Her gaze remained unfocused, turned in the direction of her balcony, gazing out at the gray afternoon. The rain had stopped. As the ground grew quiet, so too did the skies. Kai Juanli. Juliet closed her eyes. The use of her birth name had the opposite effect that her mother had likely intended. Lady Kai wanted her to realize the severity of the situation. Instead, Juliet felt as if her mother were addressing someone else some false manifestation of the girl she was supposed to be. All this time, her parents had let her be Juliet, let her be wild, impulsive. Now they wanted the unknown daughter again, but Juliet only knew how to be Juliet. Do you even know what happened out there? She whispered in answer to her mother's question. This was the first time she had ever seen both her parents in her bedroom at once. The first time that they had closed the door on a party going on in the house their attention fixated on her instead. Your precious nationalists mingling downstairs with champagne, they opened fire on a peaceful protest. Hundreds of people, dead in an instant. Never mind the infections. Never mind that the madness would soon break out among the soldiers. The nationalists would put them in quarantine to prevent the spread of the insects, but Juliet doubted it mattered. The monsters would be working this very moment, quietly infecting as many as they could. Violence on both sides, that was how a city shrouded in blood would always be. You are hardly in a place to be lecturing right now, Lady Kai said evenly. Juliet tightened her hold on the quilt. The Scarlets had deposited her in her bedroom when they hauled her back to the Kai house, had sat her upon her bed and demanded she wait while her parents came to her. 
she was to remain idle, some prisoner under confinement in her own home. This was her place. This was the only place she had. It was massacre, Mama, Juliet snapped, rocketing to her feet. It goes against everything we stand for. What happened to loyalty? What happened to order? Her parents remained unbothered. The two of them could have been replaced by marble statues for all that it mattered to Juliet. We value order, family, loyalty, Lady Kai confirmed, but at the end of the day, we choose to value whatever ensures our survival. An image of Rosalind flashed in Juliet's head. Then Kathleen. And what about the survival of those on the streets? Juliet asked. Each time she blinked, she saw them fall. She saw the bullets pierce their chests and cut through the crowds. Communists who threaten the fabric of society, her mother replied, her tone grave. White flowers who have been trying to snuff us out for generations. You wish for their lives to be saved? When Juliet turned away, unable to speak past the sour twist in her throat, her mother's gaze followed. There was little Lady Kai ever missed. Little that went past her appraisal and emerged untouched. Juliet knew this, and yet still she was surprised as her mother snagged her wrist. Juliet's fingers splayed out against the overhead light. The yarn on her finger glowed white. They say you were found with Roma Montagov. Her mother's grip tightened. Again, I ask, do you care to explain yourself? Juliet's eyes went to her father, who had yet to say anything. His composure was placid, Juliet felt turned inside out. While he stood there, occupying a space in her room, Juliet could sense everything, her own inhale-exhale of breath, the electricity droning overhead, the static murmur of conversation outside the door. Her heart, thrumming just beneath her rib cage. I have loved him so long that I do not remember him as a stranger, Juliet answered. I loved him long before we were told to work together in spite of the hate between our families. I will love him long after you tear us apart merely because you pick and choose when it is convenient to partake in the blood feud. Her mother released her wrist. Lady Kai thinned her lips, but there was otherwise no surprise. Why would there be? It was not difficult to guess why else Juliet would be running away with him. We listen to the modern age and never thought to control what you do, Lord Kai said then, finally choosing to speak. His words were a low rumble that gave everything in the room a telltale tremor. I see that it was our mistake. Juliet choked out a laugh. Do you think any of this could have turned out better if you had kept me trapped in the house? Do you think I would have never learned defiance if you had kept me in Shanghai all these years, educated only by Chinese scholars and their ancient teachings? Juliet slammed her hand against her vanity table, swiping all her brushes and her powders to the floor but it wasn't enough, nothing was enough. Her words were so bitter in her mouth that she could taste them. I would have ended up the same. We are all held up on the city's strings, and perhaps you should first ask why we have a blood feud before asking why I defied it. Enough, Lord Kai boomed. No. Juliet screamed back. Her heart was pounding. If she had been in hyper-awareness of the room before, now she could hear nothing except her raging, violent pulse. Do you hear what the people are saying? This execution of communists and white flowers, they are calling it the white terror, a terror, as if it is merely another madness that cannot be helped. It can be helped. We could stop it. Juliet took a deep breath, forcing herself to lower her volume. The more she yelled, the more her parents narrowed their eyes and she feared that one more outburst from her would have them choose to stop listening. This wasn't over. She still had a chance to convince them otherwise. Both of you have always said that power lies with the people, Juliet tried, keeping her tone steady. That the Scarlet Gang would have fallen apart if Baba had not made membership a badge of pride with ordinary civilians. Now we let them die? Now we let the nationalists slaughter whoever is suspected of unionizing? The blood feud was about fairness. About power and loyalty splitting the city. We were equals. You wish to say, Lord Kai interrupted coldly, 
that you would rather we return to a time when the white flowers blew up our household? Juliet staggered back. Her chest squeezed and squeezed until she was sure there was no oxygen left in her lungs. That is not what I mean. She hardly knew what she meant. All she knew was that none of this was right. But we are above massacre. We are above a kill order. Her father had turned away, but her mother's gaze remained. What have I tried to teach you? Lady Kai whispered. Do you remember not? Power lies with the people, but loyalty is a fickle, ever-changing thing. Juliet swallowed hard. So this was the Scarlet Gang. They had said yes when the foreigners demanded an alliance, choosing capital over pride. They had said yes when the politicians demanded an alliance, choosing survival over all else. Who cared about values when the history books were being written? What did it matter if the history books rewrote everything in the end? I beg you. Juliet dropped to her knees. Call an end to the white terror, demand the nationalists cease, demand the white flowers be held separate from the communists. We have no right to eradicate a populace. It is not fair. What do you know about fair? Juliet lost her balance, folding sideways and sprawling upon her carpet. She could count on one hand the number of times her father had raised his voice at her. He had shouted so loudly just then that it hardly seemed real. She was half convinced the sound had come from elsewhere. Even Lady Kai was blinking rapidly, her hand pressed to the neck of her chipaw. Juliet recovered faster than her mother did. Everything you taught me, she said. She pulled herself upright, the loose fabric of her dress gathering around her knees. Everything about our unity, about our pride. I will not hear it. Juliet straightened to her full height. If you won't do anything, I will. Lord Kai looked to her again. It was either the electricity flickering at that very moment or a light in her father's eyes dimming. His expression turned blank, as it did when he encountered an enemy, as it did when he was readying to torture for information. Her father, however, did not resort to violence. He only put his hands behind his back and let his volume sink into a steady quiet once more. You will not, he said. Give up this malarkey and remain heir to the Scarlet Gang, remain heir to an empire that will soon be backing the country's rulers, or leave us now and live in exile. Lady Kai swiveled toward him. Juliet's fists grew tighter and tighter, letting out all her dread so that it did not show in her face. Are you mad? Lady Kai hissed to her husband. Do not give such a choice. Ask her. Ask Juliet what she did to Tyler. Utter silence descended on the room. For a second, Juliet was experiencing that weightlessness right before free fall, her breath cold in her throat and her stomach upended. Then the significance of her father's words registered like a shock of ice water, and she was rooted once more in the thick threads of her carpeting. Suddenly his refusal to bring her in on scarlet planning made sense. Shutting her out of the nationalist meetings made sense. How long had her father known? How long had he known she was a traitor and kept her here anyway, let her pretend that everything was normal? I killed him. Lady Kai reared back, her lips parting in shock. I shot him and his men, Juliet went on. I live with his blood on my hands. I made the choice to put Roma's life over his. Juliet watched her mother, the line of her brow furrowed and carved from stone. Juliet watched her father, his gaze as blank as ever. I suspected, when they said he was found with only one bullet wound, Lord Kai said. I suspected, when all of his men went down with no struggle, which seemed odd given the workers of the uprising were ruthless in their artillery spray. It was only after I received reports about Tyler challenging Roma Montagov to a duel that my suspicions seemed to have motive. Juliet slumped against the frame of her bed, her whole body collapsing against the footboard slat. She had nothing to say. No defense to give, because she was guilty to the very core. Oh, Juliet, Lady Kai said softly. It was hard to tell whether her mother was admonishing her or pitying her. Pity that came not out of sympathy, but out of abhorrence that she could be so thoughtless. 
I had no intention of punishing her. No intention of asking for an explanation when this was the daughter I raised. Lord Kai brushed at his long sleeves, smoothing out the wrinkles in the fabric. I wished to observe her. To see whether I could write her course, wherever she had strayed. Juliet is my heir, my blood. I wished to protect her above all else, even against Tyler, even against the scarlets below us. Her father walked close then, and when Juliet continued staring at her feet, he grasped her jaw, bringing her gaze up firmly. But we punish traitors, he finished. His fingers were like steel. And if Juliet wishes to defect to the White Flower's cause, then she may leave and die along with them. Lord Kai let go. His hands dropped to his sides, and without another word, he swept out of her bedroom. The door closed behind him with a subdued click that seemed incongruous with the promise he had made. He would not break it. Her father had never broken a promise in his life. Mama. The word came out as a sob. Like that ragged screech for help in childhood when she had scraped her knee playing outside, summoning her mother to come comfort her. Why? Juliet demanded. Why do we hate them so much? Lady Kai turned away, shifting her attention to the mess on the floor. With her back to Juliet, picking up the brushes and powders, she remained quiet, as if she did not know what or who Juliet was talking about. There must have been a reason, Juliet continued, angrily swiping at the prickle in her eyes. The blood feud has raged on since the last century. What are we fighting for? Why do we kill one another in a never-ending cycle if we do not know what the original slight was? Why must we remain enemies with the Montagovs when nobody remembers why? And yet wasn't that the root of all hatred? Wasn't that what made it so vicious? There was never a reason. Never a good one. Never a fair one. Sometimes, Lady Kai said, setting the brushes back onto the vanity, hatred has no memory to feed off. It has grown strong enough to feed itself, and so long as we do not fight it, it will not bother us. It will not weaken us. Do you understand me? Of course Juliet understood. To fight hatred was to upset their way of living. To fight hatred was to deny their name and deny their legacy. Lady Kai dusted her hands, looking at Juliet's sullied carpet with little more than vague unsettlement in her eyes. When her gaze flickered over to Juliet herself, the expression turned to a deep, deep sadness. You know what you did, Kai Junli, her mother said. Do not try to convince me, for I am finished here until you remember yourself. Then Lady Kai exited the room too, each click of her heels reverberating tenfold in Juliet's ears. Juliet stood there in her lonesome, listening as the door was locked from the outside, unable to stop the sob that rose again to her throat. I regret nothing. Juliet screamed, making no move to follow the receding footsteps. She did not bother banging on her door, did not attempt to tire herself out. The only thing that followed her mother out was her voice. I refuse to remember a falsehood. I defy you. The footsteps faded entirely. Only then did Juliet crumple into a ball, squeezing herself as small as she could upon the carpet, and let herself cry, let herself rage and scream into her hands. For the city, for the dead, for the blood that ran in rivers on the streets. For this cursed family, for her cousins. For Roma. Juliet choked on her next sob. She thought she had killed the monster of Shanghai. She thought she was hunting new monsters, born of deviant science and greed. She was wrong. There was another monstrous entity in this city, worse than all the others, feeding all the others, rotting this whole place from the inside out, and it would never die until it was starved. Would no one starve hatred? Would no one take it upon themselves to cut off its every source of nourishment? Enough. Juliet took in a deep, shaky breath, forcing her tears to come to a staggering stop. When she wiped her eyes clear again, she looked around her room carefully, taking inventory of every item that had not been removed. Enough, she whispered aloud. That's enough. No matter how thoroughly her heart lay shattered, she would reassemble the parts, 
even only temporarily, even only to get through the next hour. Before she was the heir of the Scarlet Gang, she was Juliet Kai. And Juliet Kai was not going to accept this. She was not going to lie down and let other people tell her what to do. Get up. Get up. Okay, get up. She rose to her feet, her fists tight. Upon her finger, the piece of string sat heavy, soaked with rain and dirt, and who knew what else, yet still it clung to her skin with admirable strength. They had cleared her bedroom, taken the pistol from under her pillow, the revolvers hiding with her clothes, the knives slotted in her bookshelves. The door was indeed locked, but she was not locked in. After all, there was still a balcony adjoined to her room. She could slide the glass aside and jump. She couldn't circle the house and disrupt the party downstairs, not without weapons, but she could run. Her father had meant it. Exile was an option. But what was the point? What was the point of running if she had no one to run with? If she had no one to go to? Roma was either already dead or soon to be placed in front of a scarlet bullet. Juliet was one girl, no power, no army, no means of enacting rescue. Juliet reached into her wardrobe, retrieving the shoebox sitting under her dresses. Her arms brushed the beads dangling from the fabric, and as the room chimed with a light, musical tinkling, Juliet rocked back and sat down hard on the floor, her fingers braced on either side of the box. She pulled the lid open. It was as she had remembered. The items remained the same. A poster, an old train ticket, and a grenade. The box had sat untouched for so long, a keepsake of knickknacks Juliet had once pulled from the attic because the items looked too glamorous to rot among the broken lampshades and discarded bullet casings. She wondered if the Scarlets had not removed this from her room because they had not thought to open the box, or if it was so absurd to think that she would use a grenade to do damage that they did not bother. Juliet closed her palm around it. To her left, the reflection in the vanity mimicked her movements, the glass capturing her fretful expression when she glanced up. How would the war proceed if I killed them right now? Juliet asked, speaking to herself, to the mirror, to the city itself as it ground to a halt in this cold, hollow room. They mingle beneath me, prominent nationalists and war generals. Maybe Chiang Kai-shek himself has stepped in. I would be a hero. I would save lives. A burst of laughter echoed up from the floorboards. Glasses clinked together, toasts given to celebrate mass slaughter. The blood feud had been bad enough, but it was something Juliet believed she could change. Now it had grown to unrecognizable proportions, split bigger than it ever needed to be. Scarlet against white flower, nationalist against communist. Dissolving a blood feud was one thing, but a civil war? She was too small, far too small, to meddle with a war that spanned across the country, that spanned across their whole forsaken history as a nation. Another burst of laughter, louder this time. Let her drop an explosive to her bedroom floor, and it would send down a direct blast, strike all the people in the living room. Juliet felt the rush of loathing take root in her. She condemned the city for its hate. She condemned her parents, her gang. But she was equally terrible. One final act of violence to end it all. She was angry enough to do it. No more Scarlet Legacy. No more Scarlet Gang. If she was dead too, she didn't need to live with the pain of her terrible act, herself and her parents, in exchange for bringing down everyone else in the house. Let the city weep, she hissed. We are past hope, past cure, past help. She pulled the pin. Juliet. Juliet whirled around, her hand tight around the grenade. For a fleeting second, she thought it was Roma on her balcony, perching on the railing once again. Then her vision sharpened, and she realized her ears were playing tricks on her, for it was not Roma sliding open her glass doors but Benedict. What are you doing? Benedict hissed, striding in. Juliet, on instinct, took a step back. What are you doing here? she demanded. You have to go. Why? So you can blow yourself up? Benedict asked. Roma is still alive. 
I need your help. The rush of relief almost caused Juliet to drop the grenade, but she tightened her hold just in time, keeping the lever pressed down. When she closed her eyes, overwhelmed by the sheer knowledge of this one little thing that the universe had granted her, she was so grateful that tears sprang up immediately. I'm glad you evaded capture, Juliet said, her voice quiet. Of all people, you will be able to get him out. Oh, please. Juliet's eyes snapped open, so shocked by Benedict's tone that her tears receded. He pointed at the grenade in her hand. Do you think that's worth it? What will it do to blow up a few nationalists? They will build their ranks again. They will pick a new leader from Beijing, from Wuhan, from wherever else there are people. The war will still be fought. The conflict will go on. I have a duty here, Juliet managed shakily. If I can do one thing. You want to do one thing? Benedict asked. Let's go blow up the monsters. Let's stop Dimitri. But this? He jammed a thumb in the direction of her door. The sounds of the party outside continued to filter through. This is inevitable, Juliet. This is civil war, and you cannot disrupt it. Juliet did not know what to say. She closed both hands around the grenade and stared at it. Benedict let her stand like that for a long moment, let her roil in her conflicting emotions, before turning on his heel and cursing under his breath, muttering, first Marshal, then you. Everyone is just dying to self-sacrifice themselves. Marshal? Benedict grimaced. As if remembering that he had broken onto enemy ground, he wandered out to the balcony again and peered around, watching for movement. Dimitri intercepted the Scarlets and took Roma and Elisa. Marshall got looped in too when he was trying to rescue them. Now it's just me and you. We really do not have long, Juliet. Has Dimitri recruited the workers? Juliet asked, her heart pounding in her ears. Yes, Benedict confirmed. At this point I don't even know if Dimitri is still intent on taking the white flowers. With just about every gangster either dead or imprisoned or having fled the city, he's far more concerned with building a base of power among the communists. Then why did he take Roma? If not to end the Montagov line. It's symbolic, I suspect. Kill the gangsters. Kill the imperialists. Kill foreign influence in the city. A public execution as a last-ditch war cry for the workers in the city before nationalists stomp them out. And then Dimitri and his monsters will flee south with the rest of the communists, and the war will rage on. Juliet sucked in a ragged inhale. Was that how this would end? Lawrence could sneak a vaccine into the city's water supply, but the whole country? The whole world? If Dimitri fled with the communists, high off the power that his acquired arms and money and monsters gave him, what was the limit? Where would it stop? Look, Benedict said, cutting into Juliet's panic, his voice floating in from the balcony. Either way, I think we can rescue them. Roma, Marshall, and Elisa, we can get them away from Dimitri and leave the city for good. But you need to help me. The immediate agreement was on her tongue and yet Juliet was having such trouble making the move to go. We punish traitors. And if Juliet wishes to defect to the White Flower's cause, then she may die along with them. It wasn't a new development. She had turned traitor five years ago, that windy day on the Bund when she befriended Roma Montagov. She had turned traitor all those times refusing to push her knife into him. She had turned traitor long before she put her bullet in her own cousin, because if loyalty meant being cruel to a fault, then she could not do it. Her parents would mourn. They would be mourning a version of her that did not exist. I love you both so much, she murmured, but you are killing me. Benedict's head popped back into the room. What was that? Nothing, Juliet said, snapping into action. I'll come. Oh. Benedict almost seemed surprised by Juliet's turn in attitude. He eyed her as she eyed her room, allowing herself one last look around. You're still holding, um. Juliet reached for the pin and slid it back into the grenade. Gently, 
she returned the weapon to her shoebox and tucked it into her wardrobe once more. Before she closed the doors again, she pulled out one of her flapper dresses. Let me change first. I'll be fast. Benedict frowned as if to advise against such a flashy choice, but then Juliet pulled out a coat too, her brow raised in challenge, and Benedict nodded. I'll wait on the balcony. Enough time had passed for Juliet's hair to dry, but it had been a downpour outside, and her clothes were still sticking to her. In her effort to yank off her dress, it seemed she might have yanked a bit too hard, because as she shed it, there came a plink of something hitting the carpet. Had she broken off a button? A sequin? She squinted at the floor. No, it was something blue. It was the small pill, its color as shiny as a gem. Beside it lay a slip of paper, slightly damp as it fluttered to a stop. Oh my God, Juliet muttered, unfolding the note. By Toss's hand on her back. The quick swipe against her when he removed it. He had put these items into her dress pocket. Use wisely. Lauren's. By Tossa was an undercover white flower. A disbelieving laugh burst through her throat, but Juliet choked it down fast, not wanting to concern Benedict, who already seemed to think she was a moment away from leaping off the deep end. Juliet picked up the pill, examining it carefully. When she slipped on her new dress, she put it snugly into her new pocket, dry and clean, then transferred over the rest of what had not fallen out, her little lighter, a single hairpin. That was all. She had no weapons, no valuables, nothing save the clothes on her back and a warm coat, tightened around her waist with a sash. She hurried to the balcony. When Benedict turned around, his hair was ruffling in the wind, expression earnest and in such resemblance to Roma that it hurt her chest to look at him. Let's go. 46. Dimitri announced the execution to be at nightfall, so I gather we do not have much time left. Juliet looked up at the gray clouds, clutching her fists tight. Yes, but for your plan to work, we must know exactly how the monsters transform. We cannot just pin our chances of success on sheer hope. Now. Juliet darted fast across the road moving from the mouth of one alley to another before the soldiers at the tram light could sight her. Benedict was fast behind her, though he winced when he slowed to a walk, the two of them picking their way through the narrow passageway. Are you injured? Twisted my ankle, but it's fine. I thought we already knew the monsters transformed with water. Juliet crouched when they came to the end of the alley, listening for sound. Soldiers patrolling along the left, but the right turned into a narrower walkway. It would take them farther from the safe house, but it was a better option than getting caught. She waved for Benedict to hurry. Do we? she questioned. I saw one man splash something into his face on the train. We know that these monsters are different from the first, and even at the end, Paul managed to make alterations with how much water was necessary for Chi Ren's transformation. The new ones are transforming at will. We can't bet on it. Which was why they were going to the safe house to free Rosalind and demand the information she held. They hadn't asked the right questions the first time, and then they had been interrupted by General Shu's appearance. Now Juliet knew better, now Juliet was setting aside her own feelings of betrayal, single-minded in getting one answer. If it is not water, Benedict said, then what? Juliet sighed. I haven't a clue but there's more to it, I can feel it. Benedict's plan was so strange that it seemed like it might just work. If Roma, Elisa, and Marshall were being hauled to public execution, it had to be outdoors to allow a crowd to gather. But now, after full-scale revolution, there were so few parts of the city where any gathering could be made that the only likely place was Jabay, with armed workers standing guard. The communist effort, and their workers, were following Dimitri because he was supplying monetary funds and ammunition. But they did not know how he had acquired them. They did not know he had used monsters to blackmail the gangs in Shanghai, and they did not know that he controlled such monsters. The people of Shanghai, though they had bravely fought a revolution, were still afraid of his monsters. So we incite chaos, 
Benedict had explained. The monsters must be standing guard as men. Dimitri wouldn't miss an opportunity to bring them. He needs the extra protection if nationalists catch wind of what is happening, but they must blend in too. Force them all to transform, and the civilians on scene will panic. They run, they collide with the armed workers, and they distract everyone long enough that no one can stop us as we swoop in, grab the prisoners, and leave. But what if it doesn't work? We're here. Juliet paused. When there didn't seem to be activity on the street, she stepped out and approached the safe house building. It was strange, it looked so different since the last time she had seen it, but nothing had changed. It was only the city that kept changing. Go on, Benedict said. Juliet shook herself out of her daze. There was no use standing here, staring at the door. She reached for the knob and pushed through. Inside, as light flooded into the apartment, Rosalind straightened up immediately, blinking hard. She looked weary, having been deprived of food and water for two days. Juliet couldn't stand the sight of this, and yet she thought she had it in her to force something out of her cousin? She approached Rosalind's chair. Without a word, she started to untie the bindings. What has happened? Rosalind croaked. I heard gunfire. So much gunfire. Juliet couldn't get her fingers around one of the knots. Her hands were shaking, and when Benedict touched her shoulder, she stepped away, letting him take on the task instead. The safe house was too dark. Juliet tugged hard on one of the panels nailed over the window, and when it chipped off, a triangular stream of fading gray light poured into the space. The sun would be setting soon. Nightfall was coming. The purge started, Juliet said, her voice hoarse. The workers managed to gather their forces and march in protest. Nationalists fired on them. The bodies still haven't been cleared. Rosalind didn't speak. When Juliet turned around, her cousin's expression was gaunt. And Celia? Juliet started, not expecting the switch in names. She supposed it was apartment Kathleen would never have joined the workers' efforts. That was all Celia, through and through. I don't know. I don't know where she is. The first knot came undone. Rosalind could move her left shoulder. Juliet, Benedict prompted. Get to the task at hand, he seemed to be saying. Juliet paced the length of the room, digging her hands into her hair. She pulled at the strands, so unused to the straight cut that brushed her neck as she moved. We're letting you go, she said. But we want to know everything you know about the monsters. Rosalind pulled her right arm out as the bindings there came loose too. She had lost all her energy, finding no need to rush or agitate while the rope fell from her body. If I had information to give, do you not think I would have offered it by now? Rosalind asked. I have nothing more to gain by holding on to anything. Dimitri was only using me as a source into the Scarlets. He was using me long before he decided to blackmail us. You must have picked some things up, no matter how little attention you paid his business, Benedict said, refusing to take her answer. He pulled hard on her ankle rope. Rosalind winced. How did this begin? Were the monsters already active before he obtained control? No, Rosalind replied. He found the host insects in that apartment. Five of them, gargantuan and floating in liquid. I recruited the Frenchman for him to infect. She squeezed her eyes shut. He said it was a war effort. No mass killings, no chaos. Only a tactic to garner power. In all fairness, Juliet said quietly, that part was not a lie. She blamed Rosalind for falling prey. She pitted Rosalind for falling prey. The Scarlet Gang dealt in violence day by day too. When you were raised in such a climate, loved ones telling you that blood could spill so long as it was in loyalty, how were you to know when to draw the line once you loved someone outside family? And the insects, Benedict continued. They burrowed into the hosts? Juliet leaned forward, her hands braced hard on the table. It had been the same with Chi Run. One host insect, occupying his body. 
giving him the ability to transform into a monster. Latched onto their necks and dug right in, Rosalind whispered. How did they turn afterward? The question they needed answered the most. How did they trigger the transformation? All of Rosalind's bindings fell to the floor. Her arms and legs were now free to move, yet she remained on the chair, her elbows resting on her knees, her head dropped in her hands. For several seconds, she remained like that, as still as a statue. Then Rosalind looked up suddenly. Ethanol. Juliet blinked. Ethanol? Is that alcohol? Rosalind nodded gingerly. It's what the insects were first found floating in, so it's what brings them out. Alcohol was what the Frenchman used the most. A few drops was enough, it didn't have to be concentrated. Benedict spun around, seeking Juliet's gaze. How are we supposed to find enough alcohol? How are we supposed to find alcohol at all? Restaurants were closed. Cabarets were closed. The places that weren't locked by iron and chain were already ransacked and robbed. We don't need to, Juliet said. She looked out the window, to that one section she had freed, letting in the street outside. A car's gasoline has the same effect. A sudden shriek came from afar and Juliet jumped, her hand coming to her heart. Rosalind, too, leaped to her feet, but then the sound faded just as quickly as it came, and Rosalind looked unsure what to do, hovering by the chair. She was too proud to give voice to the pain in her eyes. She was not quite cold enough to avoid Juliet's eyes completely and let her believe otherwise. Go, Rosalind, Juliet said quietly. There will be more chaos on the streets in a few hours. Rosalind thinned her lips. Slowly, she reached around her neck and unclasped the necklace she had been wearing, setting it upon the table. It looked dull in the weak light. Nothing more than a slab of metal. Did you tell the Scarlets? Rosalind asked. Her voice was feather soft. Did you tell them that I am responsible for the new monsters? Juliet should have. She had had the time and the opportunity. If she had offered Dimitri's name as Rosalind's lover, then revealed Dimitri as the blackmailer, Rosalind's crimes against the Scarlet Gang would be far more severe than mere blood feud spying. No. Rosalind's face was unreadable. Why not? Because she didn't want to. Because she didn't want to accept it. Because she had made such a habit out of lying and withholding, what was one more? Out of the corner of her eye, Juliet knew that Benedict was watching her. Go, Rosalind, she said again. At last, Rosalind took the cue and walked to the door. Her hand was already upon it when she faltered, when she looked over her shoulder and swallowed hard. Is this the last time I'll see you? There was too much in that one, quiet question. Would Rosalind go home? After everything she had done, after everything they had done to her, could she return? And if she did, would Juliet ever return home? I don't know, Juliet replied honestly. Rosalind watched her for a moment longer. Her eyes might have filled up. Or perhaps that was wishful thinking on Juliet's part. Perhaps it was just Juliet's own eyes that had grown slick with moisture. Rosalind walked out without another word. The rain slowed, then stopped, its last few droplets coming down on the bodies with a dull finality. Hands with the pallor of death were collapsed atop one another, the rotten stink of their shriveling skin shrouding the air. Celia wasn't sure if she was dead or alive. She was buried beneath so much suffering, cloistered under unmoving corpses. Pain throbbed down her torso, but her thoughts were so fragmented that she almost wasn't sure if it was from a bullet wound or merely a physical manifestation of her internal agony. Deep down, she had foolishly thought she was safe from slaughter that violence only came for the masses. At last, it seemed she had succeeded in becoming one of them. A scarlet would never be suffering like this. A scarlet would have made it quick, like Mr. Ping taking one of the first bullets, or stayed far away from such tumult. What is there now? Celia wondered. Then someone was grabbing at her. I've got you. I've got you. Celia turned her head 
opening her eyes from the darkness of her burial to a sudden flash of light, a street lamp, burning above her. Before her vision cleared, she guessed the silhouette pulling at her to be an angel, some hazy being come to ease the horrors of war. Then a fresh wave of pain erupted down her side, and her mind snapped back in place, her chin jerking up. It was no angel come to save her. It was her sister. How are you here? Celia gasped. Rosalind already had wet streaks down her cheeks, glinting under the light, but when she paused, having freed Celia from the bodies, she burst into fresh tears, hands tapping around Celia's shoulders, checking for immediate wounds. There was only one, the growing stain at her side. How can you ask that, she said, sniffling. I ran for the street that everyone said had suffered a massacre. I came looking for you. Celia bit down on her gasp of pain, complying when Rosalind tried to pull her to her feet. She swayed, unable to set any weight down, but Rosalind's arms were accommodating, taking the brunt of her balance. Though Celia's head spun, she still sighted red marks along Rosalind's wrists, vivid and angry. Can you walk? Rosalind asked. Come on. Any longer and you'll bleed out. Celia put one foot in front of the other. It was a staggering, exhausting effort, but it was an effort, nonetheless. Thank you, Jie Jie. When the breeze blew into her face, Celia wasn't sure if she felt coldness because there was blood smeared on her cheeks or if she had started crying too. Thank you for coming back for me. Rosalind tightened her grip. She kept pushing them forward even while Celia swayed, phasing in and out of consciousness. I want you to think of Paris, Rosalind ordered. It was an attempt to keep Celia awake, to keep her focused even as her senses grew weak. Think of the speakeasies, the lights in the distance. Think about seeing them once more, when the world is no longer so dark. Will there ever come a day? Celia whispered. Her vision blurred. Her surroundings tunneled, colors bleeding into monochrome. A stifled noise came from Rosalind. Up ahead, the silver of a building flashed, and Rosalind stumbled them forward, step by step by step. This was Rosalind's silent promise into the world. She would have her sister see another day. She would have her sister see all the days and more, each and every one of them rising from the horizon. I ruined us all for a love not true, Rosalind whispered. At the very least, I can still save you. 47. The sun was setting. In Jabay, the streets were starting to fill with people again, so Juliet and Benedict found no trouble hurrying through, passing soldiers without a second glance. The nationalists could try as they wanted to keep this city under lock and key, but it was always too full, brimming with activity, and at the slightest whisper of a commotion, the people came out to seek it. Whispers were flying about the public execution. Word traveled fast among the workers, among the civilians who wanted a show, never mind where the political tide in the city turned. The only question was whether the Kuomintang had caught wind too. As nice as it would be if Dmitri Voronin was arrested and hauled in, Juliet had to hope that the nationalists didn't show up. Because then the Montagovs would be arrested alongside Dmitri, or simply shot. He gave you just one? Benedict asked now his breath coming fast. In sync, they swerved around a fallen rickshaw, Juliet circling left and Benedict circling right, before meeting again and continuing onward on the street. There was a glow of light up ahead. The intersection of a street with a crowd gathered in thick. Only one, Juliet replied, her hand patting her pocket to confirm. I suspect he couldn't produce more fast enough. Damn Lawrence for giving us something, but not giving us enough, Benedict muttered begrudgingly. He sighted the scene up ahead too. It does beg the question of us. We make use of the monsters for chaos, but what if they release their insects? In such proximity, it will be immediate death. That was the question Juliet had been mulling on since leaving the safe house, but slowly, something was beginning to formulate into shape. She looked up at the clouds once more and found them hazed with purple, dark, and bruised. The deeper they walked into Jabay, the more the storefronts around them changed, 
looking shabbier, less well-kept. The foreign influence faded, the glamour receded. I have an idea, Juliet said. But can we hurry first? The fire station is some few streets away. They moved fast. When the station came into sight, its red-tiled roof muted under the setting darkness and its smooth entrance lined with four gate-like arches, it was almost a surprise that the building was abandoned, given the supplies that sat awaiting inside. Perhaps the soldiers who had been asked to stand guard around the public facilities had all been redirected elsewhere, tending to the chaos around the city like a dozen little fires. They were in civil war. Communists popping up like moles from their hiding places and nationalists desperately trying to thwack them back down so they could hold on to governance. Juliet skidded into the station, immediately searching for what they needed. Her footsteps echoed loudly on the linoleum floor. Benedict was making slower work, eyeing the labeled shelves while Juliet climbed atop one of the smaller firefighting cars to peruse the second floor. It didn't seem like there was much up there gauging by what she could see past the banisters. I can't find a single damn weapon, Juliet spat. Not even an axe. In a fire station. If this goes well, pray you don't need a weapon. Benedict came around, showing her what he had found. A hose, looped around his arm, and two jugs of what Juliet had to guess was gasoline. How are we supposed to carry this back there? Juliet jumped off the hood of the car. Then she looked at it again. Can you drive? No, Benedict answered immediately. I'm not. Juliet was already opening the door into the passenger seat, reaching over and pressing the start button on the dashboard. The ignition came to life. As the night grew darker outside, the headlights flared a high beam, cutting a path ahead of them. Put the gasoline in the back, Juliet said. And drive. Your idea is risky. It's a good idea. You cannot protest it merely because you have to stay behind. Benedict shot her a glare from the driver's seat, his foot on the pedal as the car inched down the road. They were almost at the intersection where the crowd had gathered. Now it was proper nightfall, the sky dark and the streets lit by gas lamps and torches, hot orange embers dotted among the people. It will guarantee their safety, Juliet maintained. You said it yourself, this whole execution business is symbolic. Dimitri is after Roma. He gains no extra points with Elisa. No extra points with Marshall. Second to Roma, there's stop here, stop here. We cannot go any closer. Benedict pressed down on the brake, halting the car. A few steps forward, and they would be within view of the crowd. Second to Roma, Juliet resumed quietly there's only me. Gangster royalty, dead by his hands. The two empires of Shanghai's underground, the heirs of families that had kept this city rumbling on capital and foreign trade, on hierarchy and nepotism, both fallen and executed under his bullet. It was too good to pass up. Too good for Dimitri to decline. Juliet was counting on it. He will sense a trick. He will, Juliet said but by then it will be too late. She would offer to trade herself for Marshall and Elisa. Once Marshall and Elisa were away from the scene, Benedict would activate the monsters, Juliet would give Roma the vaccine from Lawrence, and even if all the insects came out, they would be safe, and they would leave, and that was that. Easy as pie. Juliet pulled off her coat, tossing it to the floor of the vehicle. When she reached for the door, Benedict's arm shot out suddenly, closing around her wrist. He'll be safe, Juliet promised before Benedict could say anything. Marshall and Elisa are the first order of priority. Benedict shook his head. I was only going to say be careful. He let go, casting a look into the back of the car, where the hose sat awaiting. Juliet took a deep breath and got out. The street was on a decline. When she started forward, the angle immediately gave Juliet a perfect view of the small crowd and a perfect view of what they were clustered around, Roma, being tied to a wooden pole, his hands behind his back, rope secured around his waist. All she could do was put one foot in front of the other and keep walking, 
eyes pinned to the scene, to the armed workers under Dimitri's command who were moving to finish up their final knot on Elisa next. Juliet wondered where the wooden poles had come from. It was that which her mind wandered to, of all places, whether the poles were nailed into the ground or wedged into the tram lines running down the middle of the road. Her eyes scanned the waiting crowd. There weren't many here, there couldn't be, or the noise would stir trouble with the soldiers nearby. Twenty, maybe more, but twenty was all you needed for word to spread about Dimitri's good deed. They appeared curious, unbothered as the armed workers walked their outer edges, rifles at the ready in case soldiers approached. At the periphery of the crowd, Juliet sighted the man who had followed them onto the train. The French white flower. Her blood started to run hot, pumping adrenaline into her body, keeping her warm even as the cold breeze blew on her sleeveless dress. Juliet had shed her coat intentionally. She wanted immediate recognition in her bright and beaded getup the moment she approached the crowd. And she got it. Benedict needed to work fast, but it was hard when his palms were slick with sweat. He pulled the end of the hose taut, then adjusted it on the roof edge, aimed at the scene beneath him. They had stolen dozens of gallons of gasoline. They could afford to be liberal. But it had to work. It had to flow properly through a very, very long tube, and he couldn't screw this up. Too much was riding on it. Okay, Benedict muttered. It looked set. On the street below, Juliet had reached the crowd, her arms held up, ignoring the whispers as her name echoed through like a chant. I come unarmed, she called. Benedict stepped away from the rooftop, hurrying through the building and back to the gasoline in the car. He hadn't prayed to God in years, but today he was going to start. Is that? Slowly, Juliet put up her hands, showing herself to be weaponless. I come unarmed, she called. The crowd had fallen silent. Whatever Dimitri might have been in the midst of saying was cut off as he stared at her, eyes steely with consideration. To his side, Roma looked aghast. He did not speak, did not yell her name in horror. He knew that Juliet was up to something. Somehow, I find that hard to believe, Dimitri said. He waved his hand. The nearest armed worker leveled his rifle at her. Pat me down, and you'll see I bring nothing. Only my life. In trade. Dimitri hooted with laughter. He threw his head back with the sound, drowning out the gasp that Roma made and the muttered confusion coming from Marshall. Miss Kai. What makes you think you have any trading power? Dimitri demanded when he turned his attention back to her. I can have you shot. And then what? Juliet asked. Juliet Kai, Princess of Shanghai, killed by random worker. The textbooks on the revolution will be sure to mention it. I come to you, offering you my life side by side with my husband, and you throw it away? Dimitri tilted his head now. Her words registered. You mean to say? I'm not trading my life for Roma's, she confirmed. For Marshal Sio and Elisa Montagova. Let them go. They didn't need to be dragged into this fight. What? Marshal exclaimed. Juliet, you're out of your mind. The nearest worker pressed his rifle into Marshal's neck, shutting him up. Dimitri's gaze, meanwhile, swiveled to his captured subjects, a notch appearing in his brow as he tried to consider the matter. He didn't look like he was entirely buying it. Perhaps Juliet was not acting this right. She met Roma's gaze. He didn't believe her either. Perhaps the only way to convince Dimitri was to convince Roma first. I made a vow to you, Roma. She took a step forward. No one stopped her. Where you go, I go. I will not bear a day parted. I will take a dagger to my own heart if I must. Her shoes clicked down on the ground, on gravel, on tramline metal, on a drain covering. With every step, the crowd continued to part and shuffle. There was confusion, hearing her words spoken to Roma, to her enemy. There was panic, not wanting to be caught in her path, fearful of her even when her hands were in the air even with rifles pointed at her head from three different directions. 
it was as if she were partaking in the most bizarre wedding march, if the groom waiting on the other end of the aisle was Roma tied and bound for death. No, Roma whispered. This city has been taken, Juliet went on. The hitch in her voice was not feigned. The tears that rose to her eyes were not feigned. All that is good is gone, or perhaps it never existed. The blood feud kept us apart, forced us onto different sides. I will not allow death to do the same. By then Juliet had come to a stop right before Roma. She could have tried to break him out in that moment, snatch a rifle and slash the sharp part over his rope bindings. Instead, she leaned in and kissed him. And from under her tongue, she pushed the vaccine into his mouth. Bite down, she whispered, just before two of the armed workers yanked her away. The crowd around them murmured in utter bewilderment. This had been a public execution, and now it was appearing more like a ground for scandal. Juliet whipped her hand out, closing her fingers around one of the rifle ends and pointing it straight at Dimitri. The workers scrambled to stop her, but Juliet wasn't doing anything except keeping her hand near the barrel. She was nowhere near the trigger. The rest of the rifle remained strapped to the poor worker, who had frozen in confusion. You don't know what I am capable of, she said, her voice ringing loud in the night. But I am honorable. Let them go. And I will not resist. The scene was still for a long moment. Then. I tire of these dramatics, Dimitri announced. Just tie her up. Let go of the other two. Elisa cried out softly in protest, her eyes drawn wide. Marshall, meanwhile, leaned forward with a vicious curse. His face would have been red with exertion if the light were better, wanting to fight Dimitri himself and put a stop to this. You cannot be serious. Juliet, you cannot trade your life. What's wrong with you? Juliet said nothing. She said nothing as they untied Elisa and let her stumble away. She said nothing as Marshall was released from his bindings too, his expression utterly rattled, looking up at Juliet as they dragged her to the pole and looped her tightly to it. He was bouncing on his toes, a second away from lunging at Dimitri, all the armed workers be damned. You cannot be serious, he said again. You absolutely cannot. Go, Marshall, Roma said roughly. He didn't know what he had swallowed but he had to know now that it meant there was a plan. Don't make this all for nothing. Take Elisa and go. Go, Juliet wanted to add. Go, and Benedict can explain everything. Marshall visibly hesitated. Then he took Elisa's hand and hurried away with her, charging through the crowd as if afraid that they would shoot him in the back as soon as he turned around. Juliet let out a breath when they disappeared from view. She had almost been afraid they would shoot. And so this is how it ends. A click of a pistol. Dimitri was loading in his bullets. It shall truly be a new era. Marshall. Marshall jolted, stopping dead in his tracks. He was breathing hard, the sound audible even before Benedict tumbled out from the car. Marshall had never looked so horrified in his life. His expression flashed with surprise then relief in sighting Benedict, but it didn't last long. Ben, Marshall gasped. He hurried to him, clasping onto his hand. Ben, Ben, we have to go help them. Roma and Juliet. It's okay, it's okay, Benedict reassured him, smoothing his other hand against Marshall's neck. I'll explain. Elisa, get in the car. We need to be ready. Freed from Scarlet's. Freed from white flowers, Dimitri continued. Juliet started to count, wondering when Benedict would make his move. Surely, soon. Surely, very soon. Instead, Roma said, it is a city ruled by monsters. One of the workers nudged his rifle hard into Roma's head, shutting him up. Dimitri maintained a neutral stare. He was still pretending. What convenience that you bring it up, Dimitri said. He looked the picture of innocence. Then I shall reveal to the city that I present to it two gifts. The end of gangster tyranny, and, he gestured to several bags on the ground by his feet. 
Juliet hadn't noticed them before, but they looked like the sort used to store flour or rice, found in multitudes at the food markets. These were tied up at the ends with string, the cotton fabric looking like it would fray at any second to give way for whatever was bulging inside. A vaccine, distributed to all who are loyal to me. A murmur spread through the crowd, and Juliet's gaze flickered up with surprise. So that was how he was going to play it. Exactly as the Larkspur had done, set ruin on the people with one hand and offer salvation with the other. The wind blew cold against Juliet's cheek, and she let it, she let the seconds draw long, squirming against the rope around her waist. They hadn't bothered securing it very tightly because she was supposed to be dead in seconds. Her hands were still freed. Within reaching distance of the worker to her right, his rifle in line with her face. Dimitri raised his gun. The history books will mark today momentously. Yes, Juliet said. They will. A gurgling noise came from above. That was the only warning that rang into the night. In the next second, a rain of gasoline was showering down, covering the crowd, the workers, the entire street side. It stung her eyes dreadfully, but Juliet had the advantage of knowing what was coming. The worker keeping guard next to her screamed out and covered his eyes with his hands, leaving his rifle free for the snatching. Juliet spared no time in yanking it from him and turning the point down, slashing the sharp end on the rope around her waist. Her hip stung, it had caught a cut, running fresh blood, but Juliet didn't pay it any mind. She coughed hard against what had trickled into her mouth and turned to Roma. Open your eyes, my love. You'll need to see if we're going to escape. Roma's eyes flew open just as Juliet sawed through the rope on his arms. What is this? he demanded, shaking the slickness off his arms. Juliet nodded out into the crowd. She cut through his waist bindings too. Look. Before their very eyes, five monsters burst into shape. The screaming was immediate, the chaos that Juliet had expected. The civilians scattered in all directions, the workers abandoned their posts as monsters roared up into the night. With a brutal curse, Dimitri finally forced his eyes open just as the gasoline came to a stop, screaming, release. It was too late. Dimitri was too late. Even as the insects poured out, Juliet dropped the rifle and reached for Roma's hand, tugging him forward, searching for a good pathway. Just as she started to move, there was a click from behind them, and faster than Juliet could react, Roma yanked her down, narrowly avoiding a bullet that skimmed the concrete ground. They turned around. Dimitri was holding his pistol out. You should be dead, he seethed at Roma. A clump of black ran over his shoe. The insects should be killing you. It would take more than that to kill me, Roma replied. Dimitri tightened his grip on the pistol. Destruction tore through the scene before he could shoot, a bloodbath, infecting those who hadn't run fast enough. Juliet's eyes swiveled to the side. A woman, dropping to her knees, fingers sinking into her neck and pulling without any hesitation. A scream, a figure, running to her. Her husband, cradled over her corpse and keening a loud, desolate noise. Then he too gouged at his own throat and fell to the ground. It was utter confusion and pandemonium. Dimitri kept swiveling around, trying to push away the workers who came to dive in front of him. They were all begging, using their last gasp of control to entreat Dimitri to save them, before he shoved them out of the way and they gouged themselves to death. Roma, Juliet whispered. I thought I was rescuing you, but I don't know if we can walk away from this. Chaos. Complete chaos. Save for Dimitri, only Roma and Juliet stood immune, the three of them like combatant gods in the midst of primordial chaos, and wasn't this exactly what was wrong with this place? Deciding who deserved to be saved and who deserved to be abandoned. Letting the whole place rot and fester so long as the top was not touched, so long as there was no inconvenience within sight. Juliet glanced at Roma. He was already watching her. They could walk away in the physical sense. Could bolt while Dimitri was distracted, take a bullet or two in carelessness and still live to tell the tale. 
but for as long as Dimitri was alive and these monsters moved under his thumb, how could they ever be free? She would always be thinking about this city, these people, her people, suffering from something she could have stopped. Together or not at all, Dorigea, Roma whispered back. I'm with you if we run. I'm with you if we fight. Dimitri gave a vicious shout and fired on a worker with his pistol, killing the woman before she could prostrate herself at his feet a moment longer. The screams around them were fading. This was one small crowd, infected with madness. In days, weeks, months, there could be more crowds in other cities, across the whole country, across the whole world. In the end, the only ones who would ever pay for such destruction, in blood and in guts, were the people. Keep fighting for love. Juliet had wanted to be selfish, had wanted to run. But this was their love, violent and bloody. This city was their love. They couldn't deny their upbringing as the heirs of Shanghai, as two pieces of a throne. What was left of their love if they rejected that? How could they live with themselves, look at each other, knowing they had been presented a choice and gone against who they were at their core? They couldn't. And Juliet knew, the Roma she loved wouldn't let her leave like this. We must move fast. Juliet brought out her lighter from her pocket. Do you understand me? It wasn't just Dimitri who needed to die. That was the easy part. That only required picking up one of the fallen rifles. It was the monsters that needed to be destroyed. A split second passed. Roma looked to the scene around them. The workers in front of Dimitri had at last all collapsed. Always, Juliet. In a flash, Roma lunged at Dimitri. Before Dimitri could gather his bearings and recover from the pleas of the workers, Roma was distracting him again by turning his pistol skyward, the trigger squeezing and shooting a bullet right up into the air. Juliet, taking the chance, raced forward and tore open one of the bags near Dimitri's feet. She turned it upside down, scattering the clumps of blue all across the other bags, spread evenly upon every single one of them. A heavy grunt. Dimitri, writhing out of Roma's hold. In the tussle, the pistol flew three feet away, clattering into a pool of blood, but instead of chasing after it, Dimitri only spun around, heaving with his hatred. He pushed Roma hard, almost slamming him to the ground. Then, before Juliet could get out of the way, he sighted her with the bags, and his boot collided with her stomach. Juliet landed sharply on the gravel, wincing when it tore scratches into her elbows. The gasoline on the ground soaked into the wounds. Roma hurried to her aid and hauled her upright again, but it was no matter. The scene was set. Behind Dimitri, the monsters started to lumber near. They needed to come closer. Just a little closer. Roma reached for Juliet's hand. Something about it felt entirely natural even as the world stuttered to a halt around them. It would always be that same feeling as when they were fifteen, invincible, untouchable, as long as they were together. His fingers, solid and steady while they were entwined with hers. With her other hand, Juliet flipped open the lighter. She met Roma's eyes, asked him in silence one last time if they were truly to do this. He showed no fear. He was gazing at her as one would gaze out into the sea, like she was this vast, momentous wonder that he was glad simply to bear witness upon. To have and to hold, where even death cannot part us, Juliet whispered. The monsters howled into the night. Loomed closer. In this life and the next, Roma returned, for however long our souls remain, mine will always find yours. Juliet squeezed his hand. In that action, she tried to communicate everything she couldn't put into words, everything that didn't have a spoken form other than I love you. I love you. I love you. When Dimitri stepped forward, when the monsters finally approached within good range, Juliet turned the spark wheel on her lighter. Don't miss, Roma said. I never do, Juliet replied. And with Roma's nod, she threw the burning flame onto the bags of highly flammable vaccine. What could be taking so long? Benedict demanded. He had his foot on the pedal. 
they needed to be ready to go the very second Roma and Juliet appeared. Elisa whimpered from the back seat. Marshall strained against the rear window, waiting to see if anyone was coming up the street and within sight. The ground beneath them seemed to shudder. One thump. Another. Then Marshall turned around, swearing so loudly his voice cracked. Go, Benedict, go. What? But. Drive. Benedict pressed down on the accelerator, the car tearing through the street so suddenly that its wheels shrieked into the night. Behind them, with gasoline drenched into every square inch of the pavement, the explosion rang so loud and hot that all of Shanghai rocked with the blow. Epilogue April 1928 There is scarcely any movement around this part of Zhejiang, scarcely any sound at all to disturb Elisa Montagova as she kneels by the canal, folding Yuenbo out of silver paper. She doesn't think that they much resemble the ingots they are supposed to look like, but she is trying her best. Today is the Qingming Festival, Tomb Sweeping Day. A day of veneration for ancestors who have passed away, for gravesite cleaning and praying and burning false money into the afterlife for the dead to use. Elisa has no ancestor to pray for in Shanghai. In Shanghai, there are only gravestones, laid side by side over empty graves. Nobody had argued against it. With the explosion twelve months ago, the papers the next day had gotten a hold of a marriage certificate that sent the city into an uproar. A certificate that showed Roma Montagov and Juliet Kai married, bound together this whole time while the blood feud tore the streets apart. Elisa adds another Yuenbo to her pile. In truth, the certificate never existed. But Elisa heard their vows that night, eavesdropping instead of going to sleep. She had forged the document and sent it to the press. The blood feud may not have fallen apart immediately, but that was the first moment it started to fragment. If their heirs did not believe in the feud, why should the common people? If the heirs had died for each other, what was the basis for their people to keep fighting? They had buried them together. There were no ashes, no bones. Kept apart in life, allowed together in death. At the thought, Elisa sniffles suddenly, finding her nose to be running. She didn't believe it. The first time she saw their gravesite, she had dived at the headstones, trying to carve the engravings right out. They're not dead, she screamed. If you can't find their bodies, they're not dead. They said the explosion had been too hot. That they found the monsters because of how tough their skins were, that they found Dmitri Voron in body because of his distance from the blast. But no Roma and no Juliet. Benedict had to pull her off. He had to throw her over his shoulder so she wouldn't dig the grave up, but even as he walked her away, her eyes remained pinned on the stones. They're gone, Elisa, Benedict whispered. I'm sorry. They're gone. How can they be gone? She clutched her cousin, burying her face in his shoulder. They were once the mightiest people in this city. How can they just be gone? I'm sorry. That was all Benedict could say. Marshall crouched down beside them, offering his presence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those aren't even their names, Elisa wanted to scream. Those headstones have the wrong names. Now, she finishes her little pile of false money and gathers them into a tight circle. Twilight creeps deeper against the horizon, bathing the sky in orange. Elisa is here because she cannot stand the insincere gestures in Shanghai, cannot bear to join the crowds at the cemeteries, all the sobbing faces who didn't even know her brother. Benedict and Marshall had fled the city a month after the explosion. They wanted to take her with them to Moscow, where no one knew who they were, where no one had heard of the Montagovs and their legacy, where Kuomintang generals wouldn't be on the hunt for them. Elisa refused. She wanted to know what happened to her father. She wanted to see what would happen to her city. She hasn't gotten any good answers. Her father remains missing, and the city slowly returns to normal. War rages through the country with no sign of ceasing, but Shanghai has always been a city in a bubble. War rages on, 
and the city tells the tale of Roma and Juliet like some folk song passed between rickshaw runners on their breaks. They speak of Roma Montagoff and Juliet Kai as the ones who had dared to dream. And for that, in a city consumed by nightmares, they were cut down without mercy. Elisa Montagova, it is starting to get cold. Elisa turns around, squinting into the dark. I'm almost done. I would have been faster if you had helped me fold. A grumble. I will stay here. Don't fall into the water. Elisa strikes a match, bringing it to the false money. She cups the flame so that the soft wind does not blow it away, her hand steady until an ember catches and flares to life. Today, of all days, there will be crowds upon crowds tending to Roma and Juliet's gravesite. Which is why Elisa has come here instead, to Zhou Zhuang, where Roma once said he wanted to go. If the human soul has an afterlife, has a will, then his would be here for rest, and Elisa has no doubt that Juliet's would follow. It had been absolute hell trying to find a way out to this little township. Elisa no longer lives at White Flower Headquarters. Headquarters doesn't exist anymore, taken over by nationalists and soldiers once the White Flowers were run out. Benedict was immensely worried when he was leaving with Marshall, wondering what Elisa was going to do, where Elisa was going to go. She already had an answer for him. He hadn't liked it, but he couldn't stop her. She became a communist spy. It isn't that she cares all that much for the cause. It isn't even that she likes the people very much, short of her superiors who decide her tasks, and on the occasion, drive her out into the countryside when she pouts for long enough. But she sees the city trying to revert to its old ways. She sees the lines and cracks growing and growing, and she wonders what it was all for, why her brother made such a sacrifice if nothing is going to change. The white flowers are fractured beyond repair, the scarlets have disintegrated. Lord Kai joined the ranks of the Kuomintang, the government sits steady. And yet this city hums with injustice. No true law, no true rule. Foreigners, lurking at the seams, waiting for the moment the Kuomintang missteps. Imperialists in other parts of the country, their armies at the ready, simply biding their time. Elisa is no expert in politics, but she is quick and nimble. She crawls in and out of hiding spaces before anyone can see her. She hears the reports of the Japanese taking land in the north. She hears the British and French plotting to consume what they can. For as long as the country is kept in chaos, the people fear the fates that they mourn in Roma and Juliet. For as long as hatred lurks in the waters, the story of Roma and Juliet starts anew. And Elisa just wants them to have peace. The sun sets over the horizon at last. Elisa watches the papers burn, letting the darkness fall around her. Soon it is only the burning fire that illuminates the canal. The flames reflect back in her dark eyes, warms the breeze that swirls about. I wish you could see it, Elisa whispers into the night. They find hope in your union. They wish not to fight any more. The canal trembles with the wind. Its water sloshes, the only sound in the clearing. Most people in this small township have already retired for the evening, shuttering their windows and laying their heads to sleep. Elisa. I am growing wrinkles. Don't be dramatic, Celia. The fire has finally finished burning so Elisa nudges at the ashes with her foot and turns to leave. Her superior is a few steps away, looking as if she is guarding the canal, but there is no one nearby to guard from, and besides, there is nothing in Zhou Zhuang to worry about. She uses the term superior lightly, the others are far older, but Celia can't be any more than nineteen, the only one who will put up with Elisa's annoying requests. There has always been something familiar about Celia, as if Elisa has met her briefly before. But she can't quite put her finger on how or when, at least in a way that makes sense. Elisa bounds over. Even when she comes to a stop, Celia is watching the canal, her eyes scanning the darkness. You come into Zhouzhuang all the time on solo mission runs, Elisa says, trying to cite what has taken up so much of Celia's attention. Are you afraid your contacts will spot me? Maybe they'll want to work with me instead. 
Celia jerks her eyes to Elisa, taken aback. How did you know that I come here? You bring back buns with shop labels on them. Stop feeding me if you don't want me to know where you're going. A long exhale. Celia points a warning finger at Elisa. Don't tell. It's off the record. Elisa mocks a salute. She doesn't protest as Celia turns her around by the shoulders and pushes her to start walking. Their car is parked outside the township. It's not a contact, then? Should we worry about being sighted? Don't even get me started on being sighted. Remember what I told you last month? My own sister started working for the top command within the Nationalists. We could get. She imitates a pistol with her hands and makes a shooting noise, sniped at any moment. Elisa giggles, but it trails off quickly, feeling out of place. Celia is trying to amuse her, but there was pain in that joke, still raw, still baffled. Celia has said nothing about who her sister is, she barely even shares any information about herself. All the same, Elisa feels her heart twist. Thanks for bringing me out here, she says quietly. I needed to do this. The canal makes a splash from behind them. He's proud of you, you know. Elisa casts Celia a sidelong glance. You didn't even know Roma. I just have a feeling. Come on. It's going to take us forever to get back into the city. Without waiting, Celia rushes ahead, ducking under the waving branches of the trees and sidestepping the various herbs laid out to dry on the sidewalk. Elisa doesn't know what it is in that moment, perhaps the moonlight as it grows brighter overhead, perhaps some movement sensed by the hairs at the back of her neck, but she turns around, glancing at the canal again. There is just enough illumination to catch a fishing boat as it passes by, lighting the profiles of two people. Elisa catches a glimpse. A glimpse of a girl in a dress too nice, leaning over to kiss a boy with a face familiar. Then laughter, a light, airy laughter that echoes across the clearing. In seconds, the boat has drifted away, under the cover of a willow tree that sweeps over the canal, deeper into the maze of waterways that make up this quiet township. Elisa turns back around. For a second she only stands in stillness, staring into the night, not knowing what to do. Then she is crying, tears running down her cheeks too fast to bother catching. It is not sadness that strikes her but hope, hope that overwhelms her with such ferocity she remains rooted to the spot, unable to move a muscle in fear that this feeling will pass. She could run after them. She could chase along the canal, keep going and going until she finds the fishing boat. See them with her own two eyes and know. Elisa doesn't move. The wind dances around her, blows her hair into her eyes, making the strands stick to her wet cheeks. She would chase politicians until she understood their every move, she would chase top officials until she knew every last piece of their classified plan, but she would not chase this. She would rather hold this hope so close to her chest that it feels like a fire on its own, flickering against the darkness, flickering even where other embers burn out. There will be hatred. There will be war. The country will fight itself to pieces. It will starve its people, ravage its land, poison its breath. Shanghai will fall and break and cry. But alongside everything, there has to be love, eternal, undying, enduring. Burn through vengeance and terror and warfare. Burn through everything that fuels the human heart and sears it red, burn through everything that covers the outside with hard muscle and tough sinew. Cut down deep and grab what beats beneath, and it is love that will survive after everything else has perished. Elisa wipes her face with her sleeve. She takes a steadying breath. Don't worry, Elisa whispers. We will be okay. And she hurries forward, away from the canal, returning to Shanghai once more.